The story begins with a boy seated in a restaurant who introduces himself as Yuil Shin, a web novel author. He attempts to write something, but he struggles, mentioning that nothing is coming to mind and tomorrow is the deadline. As his phone rings, he takes it out, expressing the need to organize unused apps. While doing so, he notices an app and wonders what this is. He contemplates whether he installed such apps, and upon clicking on them, the app opens like a monster's mouth. He questions if it's a game, and its name is revealed as Godmaker. He observes an ant as the game starts, and a notification appears in another language. Unable to understand it, he remarks that he can't even read what it says and questions the nature of the game, calling it a shit game. Meanwhile, he considers that he should attempt to press something. He surmises that, while touching the ant, he enters the game and receives an announcement addressed to his readers. Though it might be challenging to comprehend, this is the story of how he finds himself on a break. He encounters numerous monsters and utilizes the power of God's index finger to crush them all. When giant monsters appear, he employs the condemning power of the middle finger of God to incinerate them. During these battles, he sustains a small injury on his face and uses the third finger of God to heal the wound. Subsequently, the monster king emerges and he draws his sword, introducing himself as Yuil Shin, a web novel author. He charges towards the monster. Meanwhile, an announcement is made to his readers, acknowledging the difficulty in understanding the situation. And this is the story of how he unwillingly ended up on a break. He declares that he is taking a break for personal reasons, intending to commence serialization. Xiong Miri reflects that one day, gates and dungeons opened, and monsters began pouring out, causing a calamity to strike humanity. However, the appearance of hunters, who had awakened abilities, transformed the calamity into an opportunity. She contemplates that the existence of God's energy and God's artifacts, obtained by hunters through hunting, became a new hope for humanity. Hunters are categorized into ranks, ranging from SSS rank to G rank, based on their skills. She notes that those among G ranks are not significantly different from regular people, emphasizing that hunters who save the world are waiting for them. Furthermore, she mentions that the possibility of hunters changing ranks after the examination is nearly zero as she stands near a poster of hunters. She comes for the re-examination application of the hunter ranking evaluation. Meanwhile, she examines her resume and notices that her rank is B+. She reflects that this is already the tenth time, and she wonders if there's no way to improve, no matter how hard she trains. At that moment, Yuil Shin calls to her from behind, asking if she's feeling exhilarated right now for scouting again. Startled, she turns to look at him, and he reassures her that this is not his usual behavior. Feeling angered, she wonders if he is a pervert. However, his phone rings, and he quickly takes it out, apologizing and mentioning it's a call he has to take, then promptly runs away. She continues to think about him as the receptionist announces her name, number 49, Ms. Xiong Miri. She walks towards the receptionist, who instructs her to enter the examination room. She replies with a simple yes. After a while, the receptionist informs Ms. Xiong Miri that the examination results are out. Upon receiving her result, she becomes disheartened to see that she has once again attained a B plus rank. She reflects on how she couldn't achieve a rank higher than B, crushing the result document in frustration. She wonders if it's impossible to overcome class limits. As she contemplates this, she receives an emergency warning text indicating that a gate has appeared in Seoul, and in a class thorn rhino has emerged. The message requests the assistance of all hunters of a class and above in the vicinity. Upon reading about the A-Class Thorn Rhino, she thinks about the situation. The news reporter announces from a park in Singdungu, which is currently in turmoil due to the sudden outbreak of monsters. Hunters have yet to arrive, leaving the citizens badly injured and unable to avoid the monsters. The reporter states that, from what is known at the moment, the monster has been identified as a Thorn Rhino. If accurate, they are facing a monster capable of destroying an entire city by itself. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin is present. He holds the hand of Sun Yeon, who falls to the floor and cries. Quickly picking her up, he asks if she is alright. As the monster approaches them, nearly attacking, Sun Yeon shouts, and lightning storms occur. Seong Miri arrives, launching an attack on the monster, but her efforts prove ineffective. She observes the monster growling again. She contemplates that her previous attack caused no damage and wonders if they will find out if he'll be fine after this. Gathering all her power, she throws another lightning storm at the monster. Falling to the floor, she inquires if it worked, amidst the lingering smoke. As the smoke dissipates, she observes the monster laughing and launching another attack towards her. Despite her attempts to stop the attack, she is unable to and falls down. Getting up again, she expresses frustration, remarking that her ranks are on another level. 
She notices Yuil Shin and Sung Yeon and realizes there's still a civilian in danger. As the monster prepares to attack her once more, she urges him to run, emphasizing that she doesn't know how much longer she can hold it back, and urges him to hurry. Determined, she tries to defeat the monster again, acknowledging the need to buy time as her power has weakened. She recalls a memory of shouting at her mom and dad, vowing never to forgive them, determined to eliminate them all. As she contemplates this, she hears her sister Seong Mina calling her name, warning her not to dream about revenge. Dismissing the warning, she shouts not to joke with her and performs some magic, successfully crushing the monster. In the midst of this, she hears the voice of someone who says the index finger of God and does some magic. Suddenly, a shout rings out inside her mind, prompting her to use her lightning storm again at full power. An explosion ensues, resulting in the monster's demise. The news broadcast announces that a B-rank hunter, Thunder Empress, defeated the A-rank monster, expressing gratitude to her. They thank Thunder Empress profusely for her actions. The people urge her to look over, expressing their love for her and requesting her signature. They commend her as the Thunder Empress, wondering how a B-rank managed to defeat an A-rank. The news reporter announces that the B-rank hunter, Thunder Empress, has indeed defeated the Thorn Rhino with an incredible attack. Examining her hand, she acknowledges that she killed the thorn rhino and questions the nature of the power she just exhibited. She feels as though she has surpassed her limits. Yuil Shin approaches her, expressing gratitude and asking how he should repay the debt. She insists that it's nothing and expresses relief that he's safe. After thanking her again, he departs. She wonders how he knew her name when no one is aware that she's the Thunder Empress. Recalling the voice in her head from the index finger of God, she realized it was that man. Yuil Shin suggests to Sung Yeon that they should hurry and go back home. Sung Yeon agrees, and Seong Miri watches them, pondering who he is. Yuil Shin arrives at a bridge, remarking that he guesses it's one of those suicide spots. However, he clarifies that he didn't come there to die, quite the opposite, as both his nephew and he almost died. While looking at his phone, he attributes all the recent events to it, finding it annoying. In frustration, he tries to throw it into the water. The scene shifts to a few days earlier when he sits in a restaurant, working on his laptop. He acknowledges his struggle, stating that he really isn't good at this, especially with the deadline approaching. His phone vibrates, and he picks it up, expressing his lack of concentration. He considers organizing the apps he doesn't use and notices a strange app. Wondering if he has this kind of app on his phone, he describes it as resembling a monster's mouth opening. He questions whether it's a game called God Maker. He initiates the game and observes an ant receiving a notification. Frustrated, he remarks that he can't even read it and deems the game useless. Wondering if he should just press something, he touches the ant, exclaiming that it's dead. A coin emerges from the phone, hitting his head before dropping onto his laptop. A notification informs him that number one has been squashed to death, and a god coin dark one has been dropped as a reward. He holds the coin in his hand, receiving another notification congratulating him for taking one step closer to the almighty evil god, who strives for conquest and power. He questions whether he now possesses the abilities of a hunter. He reflects that if this had happened 20 years ago, he would have had to go to a psychiatric hospital or consult a shaman. However, the world has changed. He decides to undergo a hunter examination, where he is referred to as number 369, Mr. Yuil Shin. Two boys sitting nearby discuss him, with one asking if the other has heard that guy's name. The other responds, finding it sad, and they laugh about it. Approaching the receptionist, he requests her to leave out his last name and use only his first name. She happily congratulates him, addressing him as Mr. Yuil Shin, mentioning that the test has shown that he indeed has an ability. Shocked by this revelation, he thinks he doesn't even want to be in a rank, just a D rank. He even contemplates quitting being a writer if he's assigned an E rank. She informs him that he has been classified as a G rank. He becomes upset, and all his excitement dissipates upon hearing that he's been given a G rank. She hands him a document, pointing out that it states his only God-given ability is to produce materials, that's his sole ability. Realizing he's a G rank with no significant difference from ordinary people, he expresses his disappointment. Confirming that he is indeed a G rank, she inquires if he would like to register for his license. Asking about the cost, he learns that the fee is 280,000 won. Considering his situation, he declines, thinking that a G rank can't even enter a dungeon, and he doesn't have money lying around. Recognizing the limitations of his position, he contemplates going home and meeting the deadline before the manager reprimands him again. The scene shifts to one day when, suddenly, at midnight, he works on his laptop 
questioning what he has accomplished in the past five hours as he continuously writes and then deletes. He decides to clear his head, turning on the TV. The news broadcasts that BQ Hyun, an S-rank hunter, has conquered the Darkness Dragon's dungeon, a disaster-grade dungeon, successfully closing it. This achievement is highlighted as a significant step closer to mankind's salvation and a seductive, fatal temptation. The news reporter mentions that S-rank hunter Seong Mina always wears a specific item before entering a dungeon, emphasizing it as the only choice for protecting her skin, known as Amandra Perfect. After a while, he becomes annoyed and turns off the TV, expressing frustration at the prevalence of arrogant hunters. He lies down on the bed, declaring that they are all annoying. Deciding to sleep and write with a clear mind, he attempts to rest. However, his phone starts ringing, and he reacts with frustration, exclaiming about the annoying alarm that lacks a function to turn it off. Instead of going back to sleep, he starts playing a game, accumulating many gold coins. He remarks on the frustrating ants in the game, stating let's see who wins. The scene shifts to the morning, and he wakes up, noticing there are only a few coins in his room. Perplexed, he wonders where all the coins went, mentioning that there were more than hundreds of them. As he picks up a coin, he is surprised to see that the small coins have one written on them, but this one has 100 on it. His phone gives him a notification, congratulating the nameless god, stating that he has met the conditions for opening his god store. Intrigued, he questions the concept of a god store, contemplating whether to open it or not. Uncertain, he expresses his lack of knowledge on the matter and presses the yes button acknowledging that curiosity kills the writer. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to a South Korean official's meeting where a bespectacled individual expresses gratitude to those in the political and business circles, the president, and the head of the Hunter Association for gathering despite their busy schedules. He announces the arrival of a hunter who has opened a hunter shop in Korea. The members of the meeting become excited, exclaiming that a hunter shop has finally opened and is now available in Korea. A member inquires if it's a rare ability that only a few creative hunters can awaken, while another member adds that now everyone can purchase different items and skills of varying grades. The bespectacled individual applauds and says well then, please come in, as the door opens, revealing Kang Wu, the S-rank hunter who has finally opened the hunter shop, and S-rank psychosensory hunter Seong Mina. They are present to help everyone understand the situation. The individual introduces them to the President of the Republic of South Korea, Jeong Hee H1. One of the members exclaims that the hunter shop opens, while another member adds it's finally in Korea, too. They applaud, welcoming Kang Woo and encouraging him to activate the hunter shop. He invites Kang Woo to open it. Everyone looks at him surprisingly as he performs some magic, producing a strong sound. He commands open. The president's manager comes over, expressing concern, but the president reassures him that he's fine. However, besides the loud sounds, neither he nor his manager sees anything. They discuss the situation, both noting that they don't see anything. The bespectacled individual addresses everyone, urging them not to be shocked, explaining that it's normal for the shop to be visible only to the person who activated it. He informs them that Miss Seong Mina will enable everyone to see what is otherwise only visible to the activator using psychomancy. Seong Mina performs some magic, and as a result, everyone can now see the hunter shop. A member excitedly exclaims that it's the hunter shop. The president remarks on the items, stating that they have only heard about them in myths and legends. Another member adds so, this is the hunter shop. Yet another member considers a 300 million gold item a blessing of the thunder god, asking if it's about 30 trillion one. Another member comments that it's quite cheap considering the skill level. After a while, the president emphasizes the importance of keeping the project strictly confidential, as the national fortune depends on it until the project is underway. He suggests assigning at least two S-class hunters to guard Mr. Kang Wu. The scene shifts to Yu Il Shin, who activates the god shop and receives a notification that 100 coins are needed to activate it. He is asked if he would like to use them, and he excitedly responds of course, yes. He watches as the coins disappear from his bed, noting their absence. He reflects on the strange phenomenon of coins appearing and disappearing until now, wondering if he is a creation-type hunter like Kang Wu. Despite the vast gap between the S-class Kang Wu and the G-class him, he considers the possibility of still being able to make some money. He opens his god shop and observes that he has a total of 372 gold. He notices some skills with descriptions written in another language, which he can't understand, and wonders about the content. Expressing frustration, he comments on the numerical values listed, 10, 
Hundred, thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand. Feeling disheartened, he reflects on only gathering 300 coins after working all night and questions why the prices are so high. While scrolling, he encounters an item priced at 100 G. He notes that it seems to move on its own and stops there, prompting him to wonder if it's suggesting he buy it. He decides to make the purchase and receives a notification confirming that he has acquired the Eye of the Blind God's unique authority. He inquires about the Eye of the Blind God, questioning its unique authority and wondering if it implies blindness. Expressing skepticism, he questions the usefulness of the eyes of a blind person. Suddenly, he experiences blindness, exclaiming in shock and dropping his phone. Upon getting up from his bed, he expresses concern, unable to see anything, and wonders if he has truly become blind. In a panic, he decides to call 119, searching for his phone. Confronting an obstacle, he accidentally hits a table, causing pain and prompting a scream. To his surprise, he realizes that he can see again. Picking up his phone, he expresses amazement at being able to see the writing. As he checks various items with their descriptions, he comments on the grandiose names and expresses bewilderment. He checks the price and wonders how much it is, likening the experience to becoming the protagonist of a novel. While acknowledging that G-Class individuals are typically forever G-Class and S-Class individuals are forever S-Class, he recalls hearing about exceptions and wonders if this might be one of them. He scrolls through the options curiously to see if there is anything else he can buy. He comes across a category named Crushing Index Finger of the God and finds the name intriguing. Deciding that he can't buy anything else anyway, he opts to purchase it while looking at the coin. Upon the purchase, the coin also disappears, and he receives a notification that he has acquired the crushing index finger of the god shared authority. He examines his finger, questioning if it is indeed a skill called crushing the index finger of god and wondering about its nature. Suddenly, his air conditioner stops working. He utilizes his crushing index finger of the god, and it starts working again. He then points towards the TV, and it also begins functioning. The news broadcasts the morning weather forecast, indicating that the weather will remain clear for the time being with no news of rain. He reflects, stating that this ability must be a remote control akin to Dadun. Yuil Shin once again utilizes his crushing index finger of the god to activate his laptop, expressing that, as expected, it can't write a novel automatically. His phone rings, and he grabs it, contemplating why the person in charge is making a sudden call. He answers the call with a greeting, and the person in charge expresses enthusiasm, stating that what he sent before was enjoyable and surprising. Reflecting on his earlier writing about killing the small ants, he wonders which parts the person is referring to and asks. He genuinely finds it amusing and considers which aspects were enjoyable. In response, he affirms that the subject is unique in the real deal but mentions that there is one significant problem. He inquires about the issue, expressing his readiness to correct it immediately. He responds, mentioning the next chapter and humorously adding that there are no more chapters. He laughs and marvels at the situation, asking when the next chapter will be released, creating a momentary scare for the author. The author, considering this, suggests three days but concedes to an additional two days to complete it before sending it over. He addresses him as Mr. Author admits that initially, he wasn't eagerly anticipating it, but now he is and wishes him good luck. After hanging up the call, he reflects on the surprising interest in the story about killing the ants and decides to open the game, saying let's go. While playing, he comments that he has nothing against the virtual opponents. Subsequently, he receives notifications that number 301 has been crushed to death, followed by number 302, with one god coin dark drive opt as a reward. Meanwhile, he remarks that this is just his bloody effort for his next project. Observing numerous coins on the floor, he notices they gather and form a single coin of a hundred. He comments on the merging process, expressing satisfaction that he finally has 100 coins. However, he acknowledges that it seems like it will still take a while until he can buy something, given that even the cheapest items cost 1,000 coins. While examining the available options, he suggests that the blessing of the god of growth, being the lowest class god, would still be more useful than a useless authority that substitutes a remote control. Excited at the prospect, he states that his heart is pounding just looking at the word growth and decides to quickly gather 1,000 coins to make the purchase. As he reaches number 404, he encounters a red ant 
and wonders about its significance. He attempts to kill it, but he finds himself unable to do so. Frustrated, he questions why this particular ant isn't dying, as it repeatedly evades his attacks. Upon closer inspection, he realizes it looks different and contemplates if it could be a boss. Despite gaining more coins from encountering it, he struggles to defeat the ant, growing increasingly angry. He declares his determination to show the ant his skills honed in the rhythm game beat to DJ. Disappointed with his initial attempt, he reflects on the surprising speed of the ant. Undeterred, he makes another futile attempt to kill them, shouting for all of them to die. Finally, he succeeds in crushing number 801 to death. A notification follows, stating that the karma of the nameless god is now over 800, and there are 200 karma remaining until he obtains the title of the great evil god, who seeks defeat and power. The scene shifts after midnight and he receives a notification about obtaining a reward if he achieves the title. Feeling sleepy, he falls asleep and receives another notification stating that the unique authority of the blind god's eyes will be activated to track the offering that has been missed by the nameless god. Number 404. He enters a dream where he finds himself in a cinema hall, sitting alone. Confused, he looks around, asking aloud what this place is and if anyone is there. Responding to his query, someone explains that it is a cinema. As the video starts, he sees an injured ant who reveals the true power of the god of the black tribe. He explains that the god was willing to sacrifice its own following just to kill him, and despite being called a god, its wickedness was similar to that of a demon. Concluding the message, he emphasizes that there is no more time to waste and that he must inform his fellow brethren about this revelation. The injured ant enters the cave, coughing, and observes numerous ant monsters sitting and eating their food. He approaches them, tapping the floor with his sword. He announces that they have discovered where the fodder from the Black Tribe ran away. However, they were defeated by the Black Tribe's god, a fearsome monster, so their only option was to run away. He urges them to strike before that monster arrives, but the monsters respond with laughter, calling him a coward and the shame of the great Imperial Army. They mockingly suggest that the Black Tribe's god, if defeated by mere food, should have died on the spot. Just then, the Great Sage arrives, commanding everyone to be silent. The other ants stand up, become silent, and bow in front of him. Great Sage addresses the injured ant, acknowledging the presence of the wicked demon 404 mentioned, recognizing those words as the truth. The injured ant sadly confirms this to Great Sage. Then, he declares that this place is now the territory of his majesty, the Great Emperor, and the Black Tribe's wicked god has invaded this holy and sacred place. They vow to stop him immediately. He urges Sir Sage to believe his words. Great Sage places his hand on the injured ant's head, performing some magic, and states nature may be with him. The injured ant observes as his wounds miraculously disappear. Great Sage commends the valiant warrior, instructing him to lead the way, as he himself will subdue the demon. The injured ant pledges to help and passionately declares death to the demons. As he rises, he contemplates whether he experienced the ant's dream or if the ant saw his human dream, finding the experience incredibly realistic. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin receives notifications that number 404 is still present. He grabs his phone, expressing his determination to kill him this time. Another notification arrives, stating that nature shall deny evil. As he looks around, he sees an army of ants led by an old ant, the bearded ant he witnessed in his recent dream. Suddenly, something hits his face, causing a cut on his forehead. Great Sage once again employs nature shall to attack the evil god, prompting a shout from the injured ant. The ant praises Sir Sage for subjugating the evil god, noting that his majesty and everyone else will be overjoyed. Another ant suggests that Sir Sage might even receive and distribute Saintess meat, offering congratulations and instructing everyone to return. Enraged, Yuil Shin punches his phone and attempts to attack the ant monsters. Meanwhile, the Great Sage warns him to run away as more and more ants are approaching. Yuil Shin considers the Great Sage a cruel god. Suddenly, he receives a notification that number 404, number 808, and number 809 have exploded. Regaining his senses, he begins to cry, realizing that his phone screen is completely broken. Another notification follows, congratulating him on earning the title of Evil God. Yuil Shin's head bleeds profusely as he checks his phone and receives a notification. It informs him that he has earned the title of Cruel Slaughterer, granted when karma reaches 1000 or higher. The title enhances the battle luck of the nameless god. Yuil Shin ponders the implications of a title for 1000 or higher karma, musing about being a cruel slaughterer and an evil god. As he observes the coins merging, he notices a shining ring forming. Curious, he takes it and examines it, noting its woodsy scent. 
excited. He wonders if it's fight inside and decides to try wearing it on his finger. Meanwhile, he places the ring on his finger and senses a magical energy surging through his body. Amazed, he exclaims that his body feels rejuvenated and all his fatigue vanishes. As his phone rings again, he answers and checks the notifications, revealing that the unique authority of the Eye of the Blind God has been activated, and the ring is undergoing appraisal. Curious, he inquires about the activation of the Eye of the Blind God's unique authority. The appraisal is successful, providing details about the ring, which is a druid's ring, once held by number 808 throughout his entire life, infused with the essence of the forest. He wonders if this enchantment works on other objects, contemplating its potential effects on his laptop and reflecting on this unexpected turn of events. After a while, he becomes frustrated and commands a praise. He receives a notification that the unique authority of the Eye of the Blind God has been activated. He proceeds to examine his TV, notebooks, and bed details with the Eye of the Blind God. Feeling a bit overwhelmed, he questions why he doesn't put an end to it here and contemplates the reality of his situation. Suddenly, a realization strikes him, and he exclaims wait, this incredible ring and the newly acquired appraisal ability, and he, someone like him, is just a G-rank. Expressing disbelief, he asserts that by merely looking at the ring he created, it's inconceivable that he could be a G-rank. Determined, he decides to return to the Paranormal Phenomena Center. After a while, he arrives for a re-examination. The receptionist expresses surprise, stating that the probability of an error in the examination is below 1% and asks if he's genuinely planning on retaking the examination. Excitedly, he confirms his intention. She explains that, as he may know, only the first examination is covered by state aid, and the fee for this re-examination will be 1.58 million won, payable in card or cash. He reacts with astonishment, exclaiming that 1.58 million won. She points out that there are plenty of people on the waiting lists, urging him to decide quickly. Regretfully, he apologizes and states that he'll come back later. As he walks away, he reflects on how he should have checked if there was a cost for re-examination and how he got worked up all because of this ring. He reflects that he should have been using his time to write instead, realizing that he might have gone mad. In any case, with a lot of people around, he feels the need to pick himself up so he can quickly write something to send. He wonders if there are any subjects he could write about and receives a game notification that the unique authority of the Eye of the Blind God has been activated, with the targets being appraised. He expresses surprise, saying it even works on people, but is this even real? As he checks the details of a random person and then investigates a pregnant lady, he comments that he can't even ask people around about this and that he'll be treated like he's a madman. He suddenly notices Xiong Miri standing near a poster of a hunter, and he checks her details, wondering what's happening. He thinks it's the first time he's able to see the name, but there's a tingling sensation. Puzzled, he walks towards her, trying to stop her. In his thoughts, he reflects that curiosity can be dangerous for an author and politely asks if she feels a tingling sensation right now. Yu Il Shin wonders what he should ask her and if he will be rebuffed while attempting to converse with Xiong Miri. She looks at him surprisingly as he inquires whether she isn't feeling rather thrilled now. He believes he has succeeded in the end, realizing he's acting eccentric, and pleads with her not to consider him a strange person when she becomes angry. He thinks as if she wouldn't entertain such thoughts. He asserts that he's not some kind of weirdo, contemplating saying something more convincing, and wouldn't be surprised if he were to be taken away by the police at this rate as his phone begins to ring. He apologizes, stating that his phone is ringing, retrieves it from his bag, and expresses relief upon checking that the call is from his demon sister. Shocked, he hastily runs away, explaining that he needs to take this call while she looks on. He steps out of the building, answers the call, and inquires about where he should meet his beloved niece. His sister responds seriously, noting his evident joy at the mention of money and he requests her not to treat him like an unemployed loafer. He questions whether he is considered an unemployed loafer just because he likes money. She concedes, telling him to stop, and warns him not to be late before hanging up. He takes a deep breath, relieved that he wasn't dismissed despite wasting time on the reinspection. He wonders if he'll be able to endure one more round before writing. After a while, he approaches his niece, Sung Yeon, at a park, who sweetly calls him uncle. He marvels at how cute she is and wonders how his demon sister could have given birth to such an angel. When she asks what dark history means, he recalls Song Miri and mentions that there was something like that in what he updated today. Sung Yoon questions the term update and asks what it means. He contemplates how he can resist pinching her fluffy cheeks, proceeds to do so, 
and remarks on how cute she is. However, she pulls her face away, exclaims that she hates him, and tells him not to do that, asking how many times she has to say it. He apologizes, admitting he was wrong. Meanwhile, she becomes angry with him, and he reflects on how challenging it is for him to resist pinching those fluffy cheeks. However, he acknowledges that she despises it the most, and when she gets upset, she tends to stay in that mood for at least an hour. He ponders on what he should do now. He once again activates the Eye of the Blind God, scanning her details for assessment. After completing the scan, he obtains all her details and notes a remark that she wants to eat a chocolate ice cream cone. He wonders what she wants to eat, ice cream or a chocolate ice cream cone. He asks her if they should go get ice cream, specifically a sweet and delicious chocolate ice cream cone. She turns her face towards him and shows her approval to go for ice cream. After a while, they arrive at an ice cream shop where the salesgirl warmly welcomes them and expresses gratitude for their visit. Sung Yeon says uncle, she wants a chocolate ice cream cone, pointing towards it. He agrees, saying that he is right and that he will pay. He hands some coins to the salesgirl and requests two chocolate ice cream cones, please. Suddenly, he adds no, please give him one chocolate ice cream cone. She responds, asking him to wait for a little while, takes the coins, and begins preparing the cone. He looks at her and thinks she's giving so little. He wonders if this is discrimination because he paid with coins, even though it's for a child who will become part of their future. He looks at his index finger, realizing he has his remote control, and exclaims God's crushing for a finger, proceeding to perform his magic. He contemplates that it seems like he'll have to fight for his own rights as a consumer. The ice cream starts pouring onto the cone continuously, and he thinks to himself that he's sorry. The sales girl hands them the ice cream, and Sung Yeon enjoys it while they sit in the garden. He asks her if he can have one bite. She refuses and takes her cone away. He replies, all all right, and then eat up, and she resumes eating. He comments on what a peaceful day it is as he looks at the sky, but suddenly, he receives warning messages. He takes out his phone and asks what this is and discovers a notification that the title Cruel Slaughter has been activated. Due to this activation, the battle luck of the unknown god has been greatly increased. He contemplates the one who walks the path of great evil and acknowledges that he will devour even the truth he is experiencing to become the true demon god. Meanwhile, her ice cream falls down and they receive warning notifications repeatedly. Upon inspection, they see a monster in front of them. He recalls Seong Miri telling him that she doesn't know how long she can hold on, so he needs to go quickly. He checks the monster's details and learns that it's Thorn Bull, aiming to obtain divinity by devouring the unknown god. Seong Miri launches an attack on the monster. The scene shifts to the bridge where he stands, reflecting on Thorn Bull and contemplating the unknown god. He thinks about how unknown god is his nickname and god maker, and it was undoubtedly after him. It didn't happen by coincidence. He recalls Seong Miri advising him to run away and there was a message when Thorn Bull died, stating that he had overcome the trial and cruel slaughter has gone up by one rank. He looks at his phone, thinking that all of this is because of this phone, and attempts to throw it in the water. However, he gets a notification about the Saintess. Saintess pleads with the unnamed god, begging for mercy to save their tribe, the Holy Maiden of the Black Tribe, as the Empire's soldiers launch an attack on them. The leader of the soldiers questions if they believe they could escape from the Empire's soldiers. Yuil Shin receives a message from the Saintess asking him for help. He recalls the Thorn Bull incident and contemplates whether he looked just like this before. The Empire's soldiers resume their attack, declaring that the tribe should accept with gratitude that they will become a tribute to His Majesty the Emperor. Observing all the combatants, Yuil Shin focuses on the leader, remarking that this ant is kind of big. He attacks it, kills it, and obtains gold coins. Meanwhile, he receives a message from the Saintess, expressing a desire to know the true name of the unnamed god. He is sitting on the bridge and, in response, asks for his name. He states Yuil Shin. The Saintess then declares that they worship Yuil Shin. As he processes this, he receives a notification that he has obtained the title of a benevolent god, a merciful redeemer. Surprised, he gets another notification indicating that he currently possesses both good and evil god titles. Due to the influence of gaining the good god title, his tendency will now be switching from evil to neutral. As a first-time special bonus for obtaining a good god title, he will be given 100,000 G coins. He is delighted to see 100,000 coins and realizes that, in total, he now has 108,700 coins. Checking the god shop, he contemplates what to buy and opts for the blessing of the growing god, which costs 1,000 G coins. Excitedly, he purchases it, but to his shock, he receives a physical bottle. 
Confused, he reads the message evaluating the item, and as he examines the detailed description, he notices a reference to body fluids that makes him reluctant to buy more. Opening the bottle, he remarks that it doesn't smell like anything and decides to drink it. To his disappointment, he discovers it's just an energy drink, feeling deceived and questioning if it's a scam. However, he notices the last line of the description encouraging him to buy more, and in frustration, he decides to comply, drinking a considerable amount. After a while, he becomes frustrated and exclaims that nothing is happening, lying down. Suddenly, he receives a notification that Godmaker's assimilation rate has increased from 0% to 5% and his inherent ability is strengthened accordingly. After some time, he wakes up, feeling a headache, looks around, and wonders when he got home. Glancing at his phone, he is alarmed to see a swarm of ants crawling on him. Panicking, he questions the sudden influx of ants and receives a message stating that due to the increased assimilation rate, Godmaker's battlefield has been upgraded. Desperate to escape, he attempts to open the door but is perplexed when it doesn't budge. Meanwhile, countless ants approach him, and one bites his foot, causing him to scream in pain. He contemplates that this is only the third floor, implying that even if he were to fall, he wouldn't die, right? His face hits the window, and he plummets down. As he falls, he exclaims that he's trapped. Observing the ant leader, he notices it instructing all troops to attack him. Swiftly, he counterattacks. The ant leader acknowledges his strength, stating that he has enough power to kill General Stooge, then orders the firing troops to advance and open fire. Yuil Shin, writhing in pain, is targeted by the firing troops. The leader laughs and taunts him as an unnamed monster, boasting about the power of the Great Empire. He commands all troops to charge and kill the monster, ordering them to behead it as a trophy for presentation to his majesty, the emperor. Struggling with numerous injuries, he exclaims that he can't breathe. Suddenly, he notices Ant Killer spray, and in a fit of anger, he yells. The leader, proclaiming the joy of their empire's troops, observes as he employs the spray with his powers. In his incapacitated state, he contemplates the power of God, fearing that he might die like this as he coughs. To his surprise, he receives a notification that the high-class evil god, Soundless Nightmare, has sent him a gift. The message asks if he accepts the gift, and he presses yes, feeling a surge of energy in his index finger. Xiong Miri stands outside the city on a mountain, attempting to use her powers. She expresses disappointment, wishing she could reawaken the power she once used to defeat the Thorn Bull, contemplating the possibility of achieving vengeance. The scene shifts to Yu Il Shin, who coughs incessantly, expressing frustration that nothing is happening. He receives a notification that a portion of Soundless Creeping Nightmare's authority has permeated into his unique authority. Displeased, he remarks that it's not helping at all and uses God's crushing index finger to stop his cough. Falling down again, he questions if he's going to die like this. Simultaneously, the unique authority of the blind God's eyes activates. His body burns as he appraises the target, witnessing the wall of his room breaking. Curious, he tries to see who is there and is surprised to find Xiong Miri. Checking her ability, he discovers that she is a 19-year-old female human and a special note about her shocks him. He thinks, shocking. The scene shifts to the hospital, where Sung Yeon asks Yu Il Shin if he's really her uncle. He confirms, and she questions him about the password. Yu Il Shin replies with humor, saying mom is a farty, poopy, fat granny. Sung Yeon laughs, recognizing him, while her mother admonishes him not to hurt uncle and encourages her daughter to play. Yu Il Shin assures them he's fine and appreciates Sung Yeon's visit. After a while, Siang Miri stands outside the hospital, contemplating her experiences. She recalls defeating the Thorn Bull and carrying Yu Il Shin to the hospital, realizing that she exerted power beyond her limits around him. Watching him for four days, she hasn't figured out anything yet and questions if he possesses something that can push her beyond her limits. Reflecting on her actions, she wonders if she's being too much of a stalker. Deciding to go back before her unnai finds out she snuck out, she witnesses Yu Il Shin getting up and seeing something that makes him scream. An old aunt of the Black Tribe addresses the Saintess, expressing concern about her decision. He requests her to reconsider, emphasizing that the item in question is a treasure of their tribe. Despite the old aunt's plea, the Saintess remains firm, acknowledging that he might have saved their tribe. She explains that she can't forget the grace of their salvation from the Imperial Army. She adds that offering their most precious treasure is a small act of repentance for forgetting him for so long. Yu Il Shin angrily curses at the ants, and Xiong Miri observes his reaction, asking what's wrong with him. He responds, saying he's a patient, already in pain, and requests her to stop bothering him. 
he receives a notification that the Saintess and her 101 followers are praying to Lord Yuil Shin. He expresses frustration, calling the ants stupid. Another notification follows, stating that the followers want to offer a tribute to him, and he is asked if he would accept. Intrigued, he wonders what kind of gift they intend to give to someone high up. He muses on their perception of him and agrees to accept the tribute. A notification follows, indicating that the tribute transfer was successful, and a stone emerges from his phone. He examines it, discovering it to be the fruit of the world tree, Yggdrasil. He smells it and detects no unusual odor. Another message reveals that it's good for vitality. He consumes it, approving of its taste, which he describes as spicy. He starts shouting in response, with Xiang Miri still observing him. He exclaims that it's too salty, initiating a fit of coughing. Confused, he questions the peculiar taste, describing it as salty, spicy, and even bitter. In the midst of this, he removes all his bandages and marvels at his healed injuries while inspecting his body. Xiang Miri remarks that it hasn't been long since he suffered burns all over his body and ponders about the mysterious man's identity. He will Shin expresses feeling really good. Soon after, he receives a message indicating that the additional function of God's blessing in God Maker has been activated. He questions the concept of God's blessing and considers bestowing blessings using the offerings of his believers. With ants liking sugar in mind, he glances at his side table. The old ant informs the saintess that they have offered the treasure of their tribe, but there has been no response from God. Another ant notices something descending from the skies and questions if it's snow. She corrects them, suggesting it might be something edible. They taste it and are astonished by the heavenly flavor. To their surprise, it heals all their injuries. One ant can see again, another's injuries are completely healed, and even a severed arm has regenerated. The old ant wonders if it's a miracle. The saintess attributes it to God, claiming that the great and merciful Lord Yuil Shin has blessed them with a miracle. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin receives a notification congratulating him on gaining 101 true believers. The manifestation of 101 faith has occurred bringing his current amount of faith to 1,101, and he gains 10,100 god coins as a result of the faith. He remarks on how much the ants seem to enjoy the sugar, finding them kind of cute. Simultaneously, he receives a message indicating that faith has been converted into 100 G coins. Yuil Shin heads to a market where a punk, Boss Park, is negotiating the price for Gorgon's horn. Another punk invites him to check their items, mentioning they buy things at the highest prices, even allowing transactions with hermits. Tensions rise, with one punk asking Boss Park if he's looking for a fight. Assessing the situation, Yuil Shin deems the place dangerous and decides to find somewhere more suitable for selling items. Spotting a quiet place, he walks towards it, questioning if it's probably okay. Entering the shop, he calls out to see if anyone is present. Dahai emerges, welcoming him and identifying the establishment as the Hayaja shop. Confirming that he is indeed a hunter, he expresses his intention to sell items. He responds that his abilities have awakened, but he hasn't acquired his hunter license yet. She acknowledges this and asks him to wait a moment while she searches for something. She hands him a form, instructing him to fill it out. Expressing gratitude, he takes a seat and contemplates what to write on the form. He's hesitant to reveal the true source of the items, considering the absurdity of explaining that he obtained them by catching ants in a game. While contemplating, a group of punks enters the shop, and Boss greets Miss Dahai, inquiring about her well-being. While Yu Il Shin observes a particularly large punk, she acknowledges that she is well, expressing gratitude for their continued patronage of her shop. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin utilizes the power of his blind god's eye to assess the abilities and skills of the punks pondering on their seemingly weak muscles and wondering if the assessment is too harsh. Boss mentions hearing that her shop hasn't been doing well lately and has brought some decent items. She thanks him for his gesture, and Yu Il Shin, avoiding delving into what the blind god's eye thinks, starts filling out the form. As their eyes meet again, he receives a notification that the assessment is complete. Dahai excitedly opens the bag and exclaims that it's a set of mithril armor. She laughs and mentions that he must have gone through quite a bit of trouble to acquire it. Yuil Shin examines its details, revealing that it has been used for 29 years and is nothing more than scrap iron armor with a half-ass strengthening and bewilderment skill, active for 4 hours, 9 minutes, and 32 seconds. Dahai remarks on its total mana of 560, expressing that it must be quite valuable. Despite the punk's assurance of quality, Yuil Shin thinks it's a fake. 
The punk then states they will take just three big notes. Dahai, surprised, asks if he wants 300 million won in cash and assures him that she'll quickly retrieve it from her safe. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin interjects, stating that the item is fake and that she shouldn't buy it. Everyone turns towards him, and he wonders why he stepped in. A punk walks towards him, grabbing his collar and demanding an explanation. The boss questions if he can prove what he just said. In response, Yu Il Shin uses God's crushing forefinger on the armor, causing it to burn quickly. He receives a notification advising that it has been used for 29 years and would be best melted right away. The group looks on in surprise, and a punk attempts to punch him, but the boss stops him, apologizing to Yu Il Shin and acknowledging him as a high-ranking hunter. The boss expresses a desire to leave right away, and Yu Il Shin agrees. The boss instructs his group to leave, and they exit the shop. Yu Il Shin wonders if he was mistakenly thought of as a high-ranking hunter. Dahai expresses gratitude for his help and assumes he must be a hermit. Confused, he thinks about how to explain that hermits are recluses who lead normal lives without working as hunters. Dahai then recalls that he mentioned coming to sell some items. Confirming this, he presents her with the ring. As she examines it, he inquires about any issues. Dahai points out that it only has 12 mana, making it a D-class item even if she were to offer more money for it. He is puzzled, considering that the fake armor had 560 mana just moments ago. Apologizing, she informs him of the complete assessment, revealing it to be a druid's ring carried by number 80 for a long time, containing the life force of the forests. The assessment suggests giving it to Xiang Miri, who is nearby. Yu Il Shin reflects on Xiang Miri, the Lightning Empress. Xiang Miri follows him into the shop and questions how he managed to heal so quickly, suggesting it might be the effect of the highest level potion. She wonders how a Mirji class hunter like him acquired such a potion, considering that she initially thought he might be a higher level hunter. Intrigued to discover more about his identity and fast healing abilities, she contemplates the possibility of him helping her surpass her limits. Realizing she's essentially stalking him again, she hides behind a wall, thinking about the potential repercussions if her sister were to find out. Yu Il Shin approaches and addresses her by name, stating that he has something to give her. The scene shifts to the top of a building, where Xiang Miri utilizes her powers. A doctor assesses its capacity, noting it's high even among the A ranks, and Xiang Miri reflects on how the ring increased her power. She recalls the moment when Yu Il Shin gave her the ring, telling her it would definitely help, and then quickly ran away. She merely watches him, thinking about how he handed her an incredible item as if it were nothing. The president applauds her, praising her incredible performance. Xiang Mina warns her not to get ahead of herself, reminding her that she's still only a rank. Leek Yu Haiyan expresses anticipation for future collaborations and suggests running some raids together. Xiang Miri agrees, while Xiang Mina cautions her about seeking revenge and warns that she'll intervene if she gets involved. Xiang Miri thinks about her sister's warning but remains determined to pursue the help that can lead her beyond her limits, making revenge more than just a distant dream. After a while, Yu Il Shin falls asleep at his home and experiences a dream. In the dream, he receives a notification that the blind god's eye's inherent authority has been activated. He envisions General Kamakiri taking Jim's edict and commanding the five million troops Jim leads. In his dream, he witnesses the general taking down the monster held by the savage Black Tribe, the same tribe that massacred 100,000 troops of Hibiscus and Kim. Jim, addressing the fourth blade Kimikiri of the Ten Blades of the Emperor, pledges to follow his command. Yu Il Shin shouts in his dream, abruptly waking up. Relieved, he expresses gratitude that it was just a dream. Reflecting on recent events, he acknowledges that what he experienced in the dream wasn't merely a figment of his imagination. Realizing the imminent danger he narrowly escaped from 100,000 of those creatures, multiplied by 50. Meanwhile, he wonders who could be bothering him at this hour and what he should do about it. He receives a message from a soundless nightmare asking if he needs power. Curious, he responds, inquiring about the sender's identity. The person on the other end dismisses him as an immature and feeble god, instructing him to first sacrifice 100 humans of his kind, particularly those with the same blood as him. Irritated, he blocks the sender. His blind god's eye inherent authority activates, revealing a savage tribe's monster who identifies himself as General Kamakiri. The monster threatens to gouge out his eyes, sever his neck, and present his head to the great emperor to echo the ominous vision from his dream. He informs the saintess that there are around four days left, and their group is feeling uneasy. Simultaneously, he receives a notification indicating that the saint and the 101 followers are trembling in fear of the emperor's impending attack. Realizing the need for further preparation, he expresses frustration, 
questioning why self-analysis isn't functioning as effectively for him as it does for others. Eventually, he receives a successful analysis notification and learns that his specialties include being irrational and a loser. Disgruntled, he mutters about the drawbacks of such powers and begins scrolling through the items he purchased from the hunter store. He observes something and thinks that Jehanna's fire is so cool, only to realize it's just a lighter. He reflects on the deceptive advertising, mentioning the supposed effectiveness when used with God's condemning middle finger, feeling scammed once again. Recalling a moment when he contemplated discarding his phone, he regrets not doing so. A message arrives from a high and mighty supervising figure, pointing out that it has already been more than a week since he submitted the last manuscript. He acknowledges that he has his own situation but emphasizes the work-related challenges due to the delay, adding that an advance payment has already been received. He laughs at the situation. He apologizes, explaining that he has been experiencing numerous accidents lately. Nevertheless, he expresses his belief in the writer. Ewell Shin urgently calls for popkas, emphasizing the need for them in the deployment of 20 soldiers. He receives a notification indicating that Godmaker's assimilation rate has significantly increased from 5% to 10%, enhancing his inherent authority and activating the title of Merciful Redeemer. Consuming numerous potions, he successfully completes his novel and declares it done, ready to send it to his supervisor. Meanwhile, Xiang Miri expresses her satisfaction, stating that she also received some cake. However, she contemplates the potential awkwardness of knowing his address and the importance of making a good first impression before asking for a favor. Trying to calm herself, she decides to casually bump into him and arrives at the door of Yuil Shin's house. As he sleeps at the table, he declares it to be the end and mentions buying something for his supervisor just as she presses his doorbell. Xiang Miri inquires if Mr. Yuil Shin is not at home as the door opens. Upon entering, she addresses him and asks if he is present. Meanwhile, the high and mighty supervisor expresses frustration about his tardiness, sending a text questioning if he is going to miss the deadline again. Suddenly, Yuil Shin appears, placing the novel on his table, causing the supervisor to be startled. After reading the content, the supervisor becomes emotional and mentions that today's meeting is in Korean. In another scene, a group of punks kidnaps a sleeping Yuil Shin, who is tied to a chair. The boss remarks on his ability to sleep in such a situation and questions if he pulled an all-nighter. Yuil Shin, still in a dream state, places an order for Chuck to flap his tail for two, unaware that he has been kidnapped. Confused about his current situation, Yuil Shin wonders where he is and contemplates if he has truly been kidnapped. The boss remarks on his ability to sleep soundly in such circumstances. Activating his blind god's eye, Yuil Shin checks their details, discovering that the boss uses insignificant flames and two of his team members have feeble muscles. Shocked by this information, he thinks about the boss's insignificant flames and feeble muscles. The boss recognizes Yuil Shin as the swindler hunter from Hyaja's shop and greets him. Yuil Shin responds that it's not a pleasant meeting and questions the boss about his intentions. The boss claims it's compensation for the damages caused last time, stating that they disrupted his business. He casually mentions they accept bank transfers, leaving Yuil Shin uncertain about what to do as he realizes he doesn't have his phone with him. One of the punks questions if he means this and reveals they have his phone. His phone displays a notification indicating successful evaluation and the time remaining until the Imperial Army of 5 million soldiers led by General Kamakiri reaches Yuil Shin. Another punk sees the timer and asks what kind of timer it is. In the midst of this, Yuil Shin urgently shouts to untie him and throw the phone away while the boss berates him. The Imperial Army attacks the punk, who cries out for help and throws the phone down. The Imperial Army swiftly eliminates him. The boss questions the situation, expressing confusion about the bugs and asks Yuil Shin if his ability involves controlling bugs. Attempting to defend against the bugs with his flaming power, the boss realizes the bugs are numerous and remarks on Yuil Shin's unique ability. Yuil Shin, feeling the heat of the flames, screams and wonders if the flames are supposed to be insignificant. The boss glares at him and suggests calculating how much he owes them for killing his younger brother. He strides toward Yuil Shin, but suddenly, a blow to the head sends him falling blood streaming. The other punk, bewildered, notices a stone near the boss's head and looks behind to see the Imperial Army attacking with stones. General Kamakiri commands to ready the catapult. The punk, running away, pleads for help, and Yuil Shin asks about himself. The punk replies that the door won't open and struggles to open it. Yuil Shin contemplates if this is a situation similar to when he was trapped in his apartment. The general orders fire again 
and Yu Il Shin realizes that even the Colossal Flame couldn't obliterate this army. After a while, the Imperial Army attacks the Punk and the Boss, killing them. Yu Il Shin contemplates if he will be able to make it out of there alive and regrets not knowing how strong these guys were, blaming the goddamn game for his predicament. General Kamakiri, angered by the loss of his subordinates, vows to kill them and turn them into a snack for his majesty. Yu Il Shin, resigned to his fate, believes this is how he's going to die. Suddenly, he receives a notification that the small miracle's effect has been activated, and someone attacks the Imperial Army. General Kamakiri, outraged, demands the hidden subordinate of the evil god to reveal herself. Xiong Miri approaches him and asks if he's alright, and he joyfully exclaims Lightning Empress. General Kamakiri exclaims blasphemous. How dare she attack the Great Emperor's army without even using her own hands, as Xiong Miri unleashes a lightning storm upon them. Yuil Shin remarks, look at her go and recognizing the power to command such a formidable follower. General Kamakiri declares the evil god to be the epitome of all evils capable of laying waste to the empire and vying for the throne. Resigned to his fate, General Kamakiri asserts that he will die there today but vows to take at least one of his followers to the Grafkiak. Xiang Miri continues her assault, contemplating the swarm of insects before her. A soldier advises the general to seek shelter, recalling the emperor's words about the thousand blades that tear all asunder. General Kamakiri's servant implores him to pass down his incredible authority. The servant, desiring to stain his precious blade with blood, inquires if he has prepared a sacrifice. The general affirms that he will offer the heads of all his soldiers as tribute, and the servant says so be it. Meanwhile, the soldiers urgently advise General Kamakiri to retreat, calling out to him repeatedly. However, he pays no heed to their warnings and instead attacks his own soldiers. Yu Il Shin is horrified, wondering if General Kamakiri just killed his own men. He checks General Kamakiri's specialties and discovers that Kamakiri is the general of the empire, aiming for Xiong Miri's neck with the thousand blades. General Kamakiri, addressing Xiong Miri as a follower of the evil god, declares his intent to take her life. Shocked, Yu Il Shin questions who he claims to be aiming for, to which General Kamakiri responds with disdain for the great emperor. Walking towards Xiong Miri, he asserts that she will pay with her life. Xiong Miri, in response, expresses surprise at the swiftness of the attack and unleashes a lightning storm on General Kamakiri. However, he successfully deflects her attack and, to everyone's dismay, infiltrates her helmet to strike at her neck. Yu Il Shin screams no. She falls down with a lot of blood, and General Kamakiri declares that only her life can pay the price for disrespecting the Emperor. He then turns his attention to Yu Il Shin, addressing him as the evil god of the Black Tribe, and asserts that he will also have to pay with his measly life. Yu Il Shin receives a notification about the S Authority with a soundless nightmare present, foreseeing the mortal's fate. Frustrated, he exclaims damn it and receives another notification indicating that this is a nightmare that has yet to pass. Angered, he shouts at the insect and gets another notification stating that it is also a fate that will soon occur. General Kamakiri declares that he will now send Yu Il Shin to his followers, and another notification arrives, revealing that Yu Il Shin is a being that can change mortal fate, acknowledging those thankful people who saved him three times. After a while, he receives a notification asking if he will change his mortal fate with God's authority, and he replies affirmatively. Another notification follows, indicating that traversing time with God's authority is altering fate. Meanwhile, General Kamakiri goes inside Xiong Miri's helmet, and she senses that the insect feels different and is dangerous. He attacks her, commanding her to die, and she shouts that she might die. On the other side, Yu Il Shin consumes 100,000 god coins to change Xiong Miri's fate. He breaks his chains, grabs her from behind, and pulls her away. She looks at him and thinks she knows it, this man is special. He asks her if she's alright, addressing her as the Lightning Empress, and she agrees. Meanwhile, General Kamakiri declare to die. He puny evil god, to which he responds with annoyance towards the insects. He employs God's condemning middle finger and blasts everything. General Kamakiri exclaims praises the Great Emperor while burning. She starts coughing due to the smoke and remarks this guy really is amazing, while he notices a small knife, takes it, and asks what's this. She thinks it's the one who will be his master and he shouts it's hot. Yu Il Shin and Xiang Miri return to his home, and she insists on handling the construction of the wall, claiming it's the duty of her master. Despite his attempts to stop her, she doesn't listen. He still has the knife and wonders where he would use it. Curious, she asks if he's a hermit, and he tries to clarify the situation, but she bows in front of him, 
urging him to make her stronger. She expresses her willingness to do anything and acknowledges that it won't be easy, but pleads for him to accept her. Feeling the need to wrap things up quickly, he starts working on his laptop. She stands nearby, looking at him, and he addresses her as Lightning Empress. She replies yes, master, and please call her Miri. He retorts that he never said he'd be her master and asks how long she plans to stay. She cutely replies that he should teach her. Annoyed, he asserts that he's really an average person and is only G-Class anyway. She responds by saying that he gave her the ring that made her much stronger, pointing towards the druid ring. He expresses happiness that it helped her but mentions that he just picked it up. She understands his intentions but pleads for a chance to make up for her mistake. She starts working on the wall and, after completing it, exclaims there they go, now it looks like a living space. He expresses amazement, saying wow, damn then he hears some sounds and remarks that sound like thunder and asks if it is going to rain as he looks outside. She clarifies that it's not raining, she's just hungry. He suggests ordering something since she worked hard. She agrees, saying, of course, black bean noodles. She receives a message and declares it an emergency alert. She informs her master that the black bean noodles will have to be saved for next time. He stops her as she gets ready to leave, purchases the blessing of the growing god potion, and hands it to her, saying she should take it with her. Surprised, she asks how he managed it, comparing it to something Hunter Kang Wu would do. He responds that he doesn't know who that is but assures her it will help if she drinks it. Grateful, she thanks him and vows to treasure every sip as she heads out through the window. He mentions it's just a single shot and not even that much. She agrees, saying she'll see him later, and then flies away. He reflects on this later while watching her and remarks that he supposes he'll have to eat alone. He goes to a restaurant where the waiter informs him that his food has arrived and places the dish in front of him. Meanwhile, breaking news broadcasts that an S-Class Drake monster has emerged from the gate rift at the Congress Parliament. One individual inquires of Congress, while another expresses the hope that it destroys the whole thing while present. The news reports again, stating that, thankfully, there's a hunter who arrived quickly on the scene. However, buying time for citizens to flee appears to be the most she can do. The hunter currently facing off against the drake alone is the B-class hunter Lightning Empress. Upon hearing this, his food comes out of his mouth. He hears the news reporting that, while most would think she'd be no match for an S-class monster, he shockingly asks what? The news broadcasts that the Hunter Association has been asked to quickly send reinforcements, and they will be showing the scene live on camera. He asks if it isn't dangerous and if it's an S-Class, as he watches her on TV defeating the Drake monster and helping people to escape. She instructs a lady to run away as far as she can, assuring her that she will stop it. The lady expresses gratitude while Seong Miri contemplates whether it's really an S-Class monster and wonders if she can face it alone. He thinks that if she acts on her own, danger might come her way, and even more so if her sister finds out. She tells herself to focus, not to get sidetracked, and attacks the monster with full force, ultimately killing it. The news reporter announces that Hunter Lightning Empress has taken down the Drake, and their hero is back once again to save the citizens following the Horned Bull incident. An individual cheers let's go, Lightning Empress, while another person remarks, she's so cool. Seong Miri becomes ecstatic and exclaims that she did it. After a while, the drake monster gets up again and attacks her. She falls down and questions if she really doesn't have enough power. She recalls her sister, reminding herself not to act like a B-class. The news reporter broadcasts again, stating that the drake appears fine, and the whereabouts of Lightning Empress are unknown. The cameraman reports that it's coming their way, and the reporter expresses hope that Lightning Empress is safe as they observe the Drake monster. She notices a potion bottle, drinks the blessing of the glowing god potion, and regains her energy. The reporter announces that Lightning Empress is back at it. She once again launches an attack on the Drake monster with her lightning storm, capturing the attention of onlookers. Yuil Shin observes her on TV while enjoying his meal and an individual exclaims wow, amazing, so that's the Lightning Empress, while another person remarks he knows that she still looks like a student. The news broadcast announces that in a class hunter, Lightning Empress, is currently overcoming the S-class monster Drake. Ewil Shin reflects on the dynamic of who is teaching whom. The news continues to broadcast, indicating that there will be an interview with Hunter Lightning Empress, featuring a live report from the scene. It highlights her swift victory over the S-Class giant monster shortly after her promotion, and inquires about her feelings. The news is broadcasting, and she inquires if it is live. She asks her master if he's watching and expresses gratitude, saying that she accomplished it all thanks to the potion he provided, declaring him the best. Upon returning home, he watches the news and notes that the views have already reached 200,000. 
puzzled. He wonders why an influencer like her would be eating Jay Jajinion at his house as he looks at her on the screen. She exclaims wow, this place is so good and thanks for buying her dinner. He suggests that she should be heading home soon, as her family might be worried. She responds, saying there's no one to worry about her. He expresses disbelief, stating that there must be parents who would worry about such a pretty daughter. Sadly, she reveals that both her parents are deceased due to the Nether Dragon incident. He asks about the Nether Dragon, and she explains that the entire world had come together to barely defeat it. She mentions that it was a formidable terror that took millions of lives. He turns his face, mutters about his stupid mouth, and quickly suggests that she has used too much energy. He asks if she wants to eat another bowl, attempting to lighten the mood. She becomes happy and agrees, saying, of course, she'll have that bowl as well. He receives a notification stating that he has satisfied the target's favorability and trust value. If the target says the next key phrase, he can activate faith. Wondering if this is some kind of visual novel game, he considers the potential benefits of faith activation, recalling the time with the saintess when he gained a ton of god coins. He contemplates the unpredictability of future ant army ambushes and concludes that the more god coins, the better. Meanwhile, he tells her that he has a favor to ask. She responds by saying yes, ask her anything, and she'll do anything. He requests her to repeat what he says. She agrees, asking what it is. He proceeds to ask if she can simply state that she trusts Yu Il Shin. Puzzled, she looks at him, and he suddenly kneels down, acknowledging that it might be too difficult for her and apologizing for saying something strange. She reassures him, saying that she trusts Yu Il Shin. Surprised, he looks at her, and she reaffirms that she indeed trusts him. He receives a notification indicating that he has succeeded in forming faith. He is congratulated for having Xiong Miri as his first follower on Earth, and the current count of his followers is 1102. Curious, he asks about the coins. After a while, he receives another notification stating that a skill sharing menu has been created. He contemplates the concept of skill sharing and realizes he can't borrow the skills of her followers. He checks the details of that skill, expressing frustration with the game and stating that he should just delete it. She observes him and wonders why he's acting that way and if there's something he's worrying about. Meanwhile, a magical circle appears behind her. The leader of the ant army remarks that the person is the evil god of the black tribe and praises the decision to promise such an arrogant man a godly position, regardless of how low the position may be. Another soldier mentions that his majesty had emphasized the importance of the evil god in the great war and suggests letting the evil god know about his majesty's generosity. He contemplates that he can use Lightning Storm whenever he wants, believing that the opponent will fall for it this time. Reflecting on skill sharing with Xiong Miri, he utilizes her Lightning Storm, causing damage to the ant soldiers. Xiong Miri becomes excited witnessing the result. An ant soldier questions how he possesses the evil god's powers. A neighbor voices frustration urging them to quiet down, as it has become a frequent disturbance. Xiong Miri admires his ability to use lightning, expressing her admiration. However, he, with a sorrowful gaze at his destroyed home, starts crying. She inquires about what's wrong, addressing him as master. Meanwhile, a soldier returns to the emperor and reports the incident, stating that the delegation was slaughtered. The emperor questions if the evil god massacred his delegation. The soldier confirms and explains that the evil god emitted lightning abruptly, leaving no room for conversation. The emperor angrily addresses Grasshopper, blaming him for suggesting the idea of sending a delegation to the savage evil god. Grasshopper attempts to defend himself, but the empress swiftly stabs him, executing him for the perceived sin of upsetting the emperor. In response to the emperor's frustration, he declares the evil god arrogant and claims that he has never faced such insult in his 500-year reign. He commands to bring him the head of the foolish and ignorant evil god, emphasizing the honor of the divine throne and the empire's loyalty. The soldier pledges to obey his majesty's command, acknowledging the emperor as the great half-god and ruler of the empire. The scene shifts to a ground where Xiong Miri runs swiftly and thinks about how she can run so fast without using any of her abilities. A high-class hunter sure is amazing. She asks her master if she should do more laps. He asks if she has already completed a hundred laps. She agrees, and he suggests she drink a potion and take a break before continuing, handing her the potion. She thanks him, and he observes numerous empty bottles of potion, thinking that it is just a Red Bull, but it works on her. She drinks it, and he contemplates that it might sound like nonsense, but since he accepted her as a disciple, he should do something for her, and all he can do is give her this potion. She asks her master what she should do next. He suggests squats, and she agrees. 
he thinks about using Blind God's Eye to evaluate her abilities and figure out how she should train, as he activates Blind God's Eye's inherent ability and reaches inside her inner body. He finds a tiger captured with chains. He wonders what this is. Yuil Shin checks the details of the tiger and learns that Xiong Miri's true nature has been sealed for 10 years, with her specialties bound by an SS rank chain. He realizes that she was originally an SS rank, and she was momentarily unsealed by God's cursing forefinger. This means all her power will be unlocked if the chain gets cut. He thinks about using God's crushing forefinger to break the chains, but only a small portion is cut. He realizes that if only this much cuts at once, it will take a long time to cut it all. He wonders who chained her, as she wouldn't chain herself. He decides that he'll find out eventually. Returning to his senses, he notices people observing them. He sneaks secretly towards his house, and Xiong Miri disappears from the park. Upon reaching his house, he sees the destruction and screams that her chains aren't his problem right now because his issue is his house. Meanwhile, his phone rings, and upon checking, he exclaims what now as he sees a notification that Soundless Nightmare is looking at him sorrowfully. He thinks he blocked its Kakeodok last time, so what is it now he finds it annoying. Another notification follows, stating that the thousand blade that cuts all is looking at him with resentment. He realizes this guy is the owner of that blade and receives another message claiming that it isn't just a mere blade owner, but a god blade that cuts even gods. He dismisses it with a casual so what and wonders if these guys can read his thoughts. He expresses annoyance, realizing he now has two stalkers and puts his phone into his pocket. Yet another notification arrives, with Soundless Nightmare requesting him to unblock it, and the thousand blades that cuts all asking for the return of its god sword. Frustrated, he contemplates the messages he's receiving. He exclaims stop it, and mentions he almost died getting that god blade or whatever. Another message arrives, stating that the thousand blade that cuts all offers an estimated amount of 2.2 million god coins received from its army as tribute in exchange for the god blade. He questions when it stole that and accuses it of making offers with the money it stole. Another message comes in, with Soundless Nightmare laughing as if finding him cute and signaling for him to give the blade to it, offering 10 million coins. He is surprised and thinks that with that much, he can get a good low rank authority, or item and buy a bunch of potions for Xiong Miri. Another message follows, stating that the thousand blade that cuts all is nervous at Soundless Nightmare's betting offer, and he receives another message from Soundless Nightmare laughing, and calling the thousand blade that cuts all broke. He receives a message that the thousand blade that cuts all sheds a tear, and states that it will offer its authority in exchange. He inquires about the kind of authority, and the thousand blade that cuts all offers its unique authority, Ultra Blade. He expresses admiration for Ultra Blade, finding it cool. Another message arrives, appealing that no one would dare face him if he possesses its authority. He comments that a blade like this is something all men fantasize about. Then, he receives a message from Soundless Nightmare, which laughs and tells him to take its authority, Rose That Blooms at Night. He asks about Rose That Blooms at Night, and it is explained that with its power, he won't even have to sweat and will easily be able to suppress his opponent. Meanwhile, he inquires about who wants to offer more, and he receives messages that he has obtained Ultra Blade, 2.2 million god coins, and three uses of Thousand Blades treasure from Thousand Blade that cuts all. Additionally, he has received Rose that blooms at night from Soundless Nightmare. He contemplates the items, mentioning that since he can only use Thousand Blades treasure three times, he'll have to save it. He questions what Ultra Blade and Rose blooms at night are and wonders if he should try using them. Attempting to use the authority Rose that blooms at night, he expresses frustration when it doesn't work. He then receives a message explaining that Rose that blooms at night activates when the user is asleep. He exclaims in frustration, questioning how he'll know what it does if it activates when he's asleep and blames him for trusting a stalker. He declares now onto the next authority, Ultra Blade, and attempts to use it. Frustrated, he exclaims that nothing works and deems them trashy scammers. However, he receives a message that Ultra Blade has been activated. Confused, he questions why he feels weird and why he wants to cut everything. As he grabs the blade, he thinks about how he shouldn't be like this and expresses a desire to cut everything. He runs out, conflicted, thinking that he needs to stop because the boss is a good guy. He arrives at a hotel where a lady acknowledges his good work and mentions she'll be leaving. Another staff member and waitress discuss wrapping up and leaving, but the partner notes there are still vegetables left to cut. Meanwhile, she points toward Yuil Shin and exclaims they have him. 
He laughs and acknowledges it, expressing gratitude for him being a regular for years and assisting with tasks. He mentions Yu Il Shin being a writer of some kind, a web novel writer, while Yu Il Shin continues cutting vegetables. Exhausted, Yu Il Shin returns home, stating that he feels like he's going to die. He puts the Ultra Blade in a drawer and dismisses it, calling it dangerous and noting that it seems to control people on its own. As he lies down on his bed, he mentions that he won't touch it again, adding that his hips hurt from suddenly using it a lot. After a while, Salju arrives with her army and inquires if the evil god is asleep, and her man confirms that he is indeed asleep. She declares that the honor of killing him will be theirs, and he agrees, while thinking that today she'll sit on the seat of the best of the ten blades, replacing the gloomy spider, she commands her army to follow. Observing rose that blooms at night on Yu Il Shin's chest, she notices a notification stating that the condition for Soundless Nightmare's unique authority, rose that blooms at night, has been met. The soldiers rush to attack him, but the rose bloom consumes them all, angering Salju. Another notification appears, stating that pathetic creatures tremble in fear, and his nightmare will soon bloom. While she identifies it as the nightmare flower, Salju confirms that she read about it in their tribe's old documents, and when her commander inquires about their course of action, she explains the terrifying god that devoured 90% of the great continent's population 3,000 years ago. Referring to the disciple of the soundless nightmare, the nightmare flower, she declares that they will not fear. The events of today will go down in the history of their time for eons to come. She then rushes to attack him. The commander states that they will follow Salju, and she instructs them to approach the main body while averting the movement of the branches. They all agree and attempt to cut the branches of the rose, but it captures them, and they cry for help. Salju secretly reaches Yu Il Shin's chest and contemplates that she may not be able to kill the evil god but she will take the disciple of the terrible god, the monster flower, as her companion to death. She attempts to cut the flower, but her attack has no effect, and she shouts as it absorbs her ultimate attack in one gulp. She thinks it's impossible while he continues to sleep. He turns to another side, wondering what it is, and gets up, asking why his stomach feels so full. He says fine and checks his phone, receiving a notification that the Holy Maiden and her 101 followers desperately wish to be rescued by him. He wonders what's up with him, questioning if he's not feeling well. He says wait and tries to activate his blind god's eye ability. He gets the message that the evaluation is completed, revealing that the Holy Maiden and her 101 followers special characteristic is being addicted to the Killer Bee tribe's Venom. He questions Venom and wonders how in the world they got addicted to Bee Venom. He asks if they invaded their honeycomb because they wanted honey or something. Pondering what they are supposed to give to ants addicted to Venom, he says don't die, just wait a minute, and begins searching for a solution on his laptop. He receives a notification that, because of his sincere, heartfelt thoughts, the miracle menu is activated. Intrigued, he questions the concept of a miracle and checks all its details, realizing that one of the most important things for a god is a miracle for the believers. Depending on the miracle he may provide to his believers, they may worship or fear him more as their faith grows. After a while, he receives a notification stating that to perform the miracle of healing, his divine power and 100,000 god coins are required, and he must decide whether to accept them or not. He enthusiastically exclaims that, of course, he's overflowing with coins, and if he needs this divine power or whatever, he just takes it. Another notification follows, indicating that 100,000 god coins are used, and a portion of the world tree absorbed by him is utilized as an ingredient for the miracle. The miracle is then performed according to his will. He wonders if they are going to be okay now, feeling a bit drowsy as he just got up, and asks why he feels so sleepy before falling asleep again. He receives a notification stating that the good god title Merciful Redeemer has been upgraded from E-Class to D-Class, and his tendency has changed from evil to neutral. Some of the good gods, including Bountiful Abundance, start to take notice. The saintess starts vomiting and thinks please, dear god, take pity on their tribe and give them a miracle. She begs him while the rain begins, and they all become happy, saying that the rain is washing away the venom. They attribute it to god Yu Il Shin's blessing and express their heartfelt gratitude. She tells her people that Yu Il Shin has saved them once again, and now they must repay him with the unwavering faith of their tribe. She suggests giving him a tribute as a sign of their faith, and they all agree. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin wakes up and asks what time it is and why he feels so tired. Xiang Miri asks if he's awake, and he apologizes, explaining that he didn't show up for training, so she came because she was worried. 
He notices a statue behind her and asks what that thing is. She points towards the statue, questioning what it is. He looks at the statue in surprise and receives a notification about its details. The notification reveals that it's a statue of him, and the Black Tribe has made it with gratitude and fanaticism. Its special characteristic is described as fucking ugly. He questions the strange appearance of the statue, finding it unattractive, while she expresses admiration, suggesting that it appears better upon closer inspection and expressing a desire to have it. He agrees to her request, suggesting that she might need an eye checkup, apologizes for not being able to train that day, and proposes resuming training next time. He shifts his focus to the script, but irritation arises when he receives another message. Upon examining the details provided by the sprout of the world tree, he discovers that it is unhealthy. Determined to make use of the blessing of the growing god, he is perplexed when it fails to have any effect. Contemplating the potential value of nurturing and selling the fruit from the world tree, he considers the possibilities. He mentions being certain there's something useful in the store and begins scrolling. Subsequently, he claims to have found the tears of bountiful abundance and proceeds to check its complete description. He mentions a quest that will pop up, specifically involving the collection of the ashes of Sergrite. While contemplating the need to go to such lengths to save the world tree, he receives a message indicating his contribution to the cleaning of the world, resulting in an increase in his good score by one, with the requirement to reach a total of 100. Choi Kangsen approaches from behind and questions his presence on his territory. He turns to see who the person is, and the old man asserts that a newcomer like him shouldn't set foot in this area. He, in turn, perceives the old man as a homeless person but recalls having seen him before. Attempting to defuse the situation, he suggests there might be a misunderstanding and acknowledges the sensitivity homeless people may have about their territory. In an effort to resolve the matter, he hands the old man money, advising him to use it to buy a warm meal. Choi Kangsen shouts that he dares to give alms to him, all the while thinking that he remembers Choi Kangsen the S-class hunter who used to be a street cleaner. He says he won't reject his goodwill and quickly inquires about when he did that, checking his phone for details. He thinks, wait, why isn't his good deed score going up despite having given alms? He speculates that it might be because he donated to a drunkard and remarks on the person drinking, addressing him as grandpa. Choi Kangsen responds by urging him to toss it here, promising to dispose of it properly, and calling him brother. Choi Kangsen laughs, pats him on the back, and acknowledges that he indeed has keen eyes. He then asks about the man's affiliation, to which he replies that he's a freelancer. Choi Kangsen expresses agreement, stating that being by oneself is more comfortable, and laughs. Suddenly, they hear a sound and turn to look. People shout about a monster. Two ladies stand there, talking to each other. One of them asks what they should do now that monsters have appeared, and the other suggests going home for the time being. Choi Kangsen remarks that they're finally here, expressing confidence in his prediction. Yuil Shin states that he'll be taking his leave, but Choi Kangsen grabs his shoulder, insisting that he should go with him. He firmly holds on to him, expressing his liking for Yuil Shin. Yuil Shin protests, claiming there's been a mistake, but Choi Kangsen laughs, enjoying the situation. He mentions the miracle that hinted at an 80% chance of a rift occurring indicating that he hasn't lost his touch. Choi Kangsen throws him to the floor, rendering him unconscious. Choi Kangsen questions if he's passed out, expressing surprise that he thought Yu Il Shin was at least B-class as he looks at the approaching monster. He mentions it's just Beelzebub, anticipating a good workout, and jokes about having frog legs for dinner. Beelzebub looks at Yu Il Shin, asking if he's the rumored young god. He expresses satisfaction that he arrived before the others and suggests offering Yu Il Shin to his master. He dismisses Choi Kangsen, calling him an old human. Choi Kangsen remarks on the noise Beelzebub has been making, but the monster tells him to get out of the way, referring to him as Grandpa, and claiming the kid is theirs. Yuil Shin receives a notification that the owner of the ability has detected danger, and the inherent ability of Rose that blooms at night, given by Soundless Nightmare, will now activate. The monster flower attacks the monster, and in the chaos, both Choi Kangsen and Yu Il Shin are consumed by the flower monster. After a while, Yu Il Shin wakes up and asks where he is. Saintess responds that he's awake, addressing him as her great and charitable god. He looks around, noticing Choi Kangsen, who seems scared and mentions getting eaten by a big flower. Yu Il Shin wonders if he fell into the sewers. He receives a notification stating that he has defeated the subordinate of the evil god and brought peace to the world. 
perplexed, he questions what is happening and gets another notification informing him that he has exceeded quest requirements and received the item Bountiful Abundance as a reward. He expresses satisfaction, thinking he'll be rich and can finally relax. Another notification arrives, congratulating him on successfully reviving the World Tree and refueling the revival of the Black Tribe. He wonders what they should do with Choi Kangson and considers leaving him. However, he decides to call an ambulance and send him to the hospital. He receives a notification stating that the more the influence of his followers increases, the more powerful his divine powers will become. He thinks it should be fine. Another message arrives, and he expresses irritation, asking what it is. Upon checking, he learns that, as a token of thankfulness and gratitude for reviving the World Tree, the Black Tribe members have given him a stone statue of himself. The scene shifts to the President, who mentions Choi Kangson, acknowledging that even after a long break, he managed to handle the monster easily. He hears that Choi Kangson is in the hospital and inquires about his well-being. His subordinate informs him that Choi Kangson wasn't injured during the battle. The president laughs, expressing satisfaction that Choi Kangson still has the skills. However, when he learns that Choi Kangson had a sudden reaction to flowers, he asks if he might be allergic. Shifting the topic, he inquires about the progress of the hunters from the academy. His subordinate assures him that everything is ready, and once Choi Kangson leaves the hospital, they will initiate the project. The president expresses confidence that Choi Kangson will be an excellent teacher for the Lightning Empress's child and anticipates success with the combination of the best teacher and a talented pupil. The scene shifts to Yu Il Shin's house, where he expresses annoyance while looking at the statues. He questions what part of those statues resembles him when he receives a message from Saintess. He asks if she's the aunt from before, and she confirms, stating that due to the effects of the stone statues, his sympathy rate with Antrinia has increased by 105. He expresses disbelief that he can communicate with ants through texts. She again pleads for him to save their pitiful tribe members. Perplexed, he asks what's wrong with an ant lying on the floor. She explains that these black tribe members are his devout followers and were attacked by demonic beasts. Enraged, he questions who dared to mess with his followers and demands to be led to where the demonic beasts are so that he can deal with them with his own two hands. Meanwhile, Saintess expresses gratitude for the blessing from their lord, Yu Il Shin. He agrees and instructs her to lead him. As he follows the ants, he becomes impatient, thinking they are taking too long. Suddenly, his phone screen blurs and he questions what is happening. A notification appears, stating that it is currently scanning the target. He looks around and identifies the creatures as demonic beasts. Terrified, he screams and starts running away. The notification reveals that these are cockroach beasts summoned by demonic beast handlers from the demon realm, and they duplicate every hour. Panicking, he exclaims that they are all cockroaches. He questions why there are so many of them, and the black tribe members sadly confirm that this is it, they are all going to die. They plead for everyone to run away. Saintess reassures them not to fret and reminds them that they, the black tribe, are blessed with the protection of the great Yuil Shin who runs away. Some of them feel betrayed, claiming that God has betrayed them, and they cry for help. The scene shifts to the Emperor's castle, where he asks a soldier if he is sure. The soldier confirms, expressing confidence and mentioning witnessing the summoned demonic beast's accomplishments in the last battle. The Emperor responds that in four days at most, he expects the soldier to bring him the body of the evil god. He adds a warning that death awaits if the soldier fails. Another soldier arrives with an urgent message, and the Emperor threatens dire consequences if it's not important. The soldier bows down and reports that the cockroach beast tamperer's beasts have multiplied to millions. The evil and ruthless false god set traps for them and sprayed them to kill them all. The scene shifts to Yuil Shin, who discovers something and exclaims that he found it, expressing relief that he bought bug spray for situations like this as he covers his face. He notices there are still a couple left alive and remarks that they thought he'd miss them. Seeing Saintess with a sad face, he asks what's wrong, assuring her that he defeated all the demonic beasts now. She starts crying, expressing doubt in her faith in him as her god and insisting that he should kill her. He refuses, telling her there's no need for that and advises her to calm down. As he does, he receives a message that he has satisfied the requirements to earn a new inherent ability. He inquires about the multiplying thumb of God and receives a notification stating that he can obtain the inherent ability, the multiplying thumb of God, by paying 100 coins. He asks if he would like to obtain the inherent ability. He considers it a great deal for 100 coins, thinking it's all or nothing, and checks the comments, finding them still pretty weird. 
he decides to take a look at what kind of ability it is and runs out. While looking at his phone, he wonders about the message from the great manager, stating they need to meet now. After a while, he arrives to meet the manager, who offers him a drink. He agrees and takes it, then asks why the manager is staring at him like that. The manager addresses him as sir and inquires about his current work rate. He responds, prompting the manager to passionately urge him to put more effort into his work. Others in the vicinity observe their interaction. He requests the manager to refrain from screaming and questioning what's wrong. The manager continues to express frustration about the challenges at work, causing a scene. He receives a message about demonic beasts attacking the black tribe again and whether he would like to help them defeat the demonic beasts. He expresses annoyance at the recurrence and declares his determination to face them. The manager chastises him for playing a game on his phone, leading to a heated exchange. An onlooker intervenes, urging them not to make a scene. He swiftly exits, observing Saintess praising the blessing bestowed by their lord Yuil Shin. She expresses determination to rid the world of all demonic beasts. He receives a message that the God of Destruction's inherent ability has eliminated the Beast of Disaster, earning him 300 million God Coins. The Tears of the Bountiful Abundance, his supporter, requests assistance, offering any ability as a reward for reaching rank C of Merciful Redeemer, with the cost covered by Tears of the Bountiful Abundance. Frustrated, he exclaims it just doesn't stop, hiccup again and again. He then questions if he can obtain a free inherent ability, opting for the most expensive one, saying, well then, he's saying he can get an inherent ability for free if that's the case, hiccup, the most expensive one. Meanwhile, he receives a notification stating that he has chosen the ability to create heaven and earth, a transcendental class ability reserved for transcendental beings, which costs 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 god coins. Shocked by the exorbitant cost, his phone slips from his hand. Another notification informs him that he is not adequate to use the innate ability of creation of heaven and earth. Consequently, it will be converted into one use of false creation of heaven and earth to match his status. Numerous warning messages follow, indicating that the world will undergo partial changes. Xiong Mina comes out of the bath and asks Xiong Miri what she has been doing up until now as she looks out of the window. Xiong Miri mentions the sky and Xiong Mina inquires about it. Meanwhile, Choi Kangsen continues his cleaning work on the road. People observe the sky and express confusion, wondering what is happening. A lady expresses fear to her partner, and everyone gazes at the sky, focusing on the moon and the sun. The scene shifts to the Hunter Academy, where guild leader questions Yohan Nim about the Lightning Empress. Yohan Nim confirms that they will eliminate all disciples and destroy everything. The guild leader asks for the name of the hunter causing trouble for the guild leader's business. The guild leader acknowledges this and states that the time has finally come. Yohan Nim suggests starting with 2,000 people for now. Guild leader agrees, and the boss thinks about waiting a little longer for his devoted follower to fulfill his will and bless the world with the will of God. The news broadcasts this is Houston, Exploration Rocket MTS-2. Please provide a status report on approaching the second moon. The response comes from Houston. This is Exploration Rocket MTS-2. Orbital approach to the second moon is impossible, and passing through the gas is impossible. Repeat that. The news further reports that with the sudden appearance of another moon, many people were likely surprised. However, nothing is known about it except that it radiates golden light at night and green light during the day. The report mentions predictions from experts that the breaking of gates and dungeons will drastically increase. In response to the second moon phenomenon, Korea's Hunter Association has urged all other governments and hunter associations to gather, as conveyed through a press conference. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin sits in the park and mentions that his head is about to explode. Seong Miri informs him that she has finished the run and he asks if she has completed all 500 laps. She confirms it, adding that it took a bit of time today. He then suggests starting with planks, and she questions planks, to which he replies that the core is important. He laughs and acknowledges the importance of core exercises, but in his thoughts, he contemplates entering her inner world again. He instructs her to remain in place as she prepares to start, activating his blind god's eye. He enters her inner world, commenting that it might start to look a bit cute. Using God's crushing index finger, he breaks the chains, noting that there is still quite a lot left, but they have made significant progress, and it seems this entity isn't wary of him anymore. He instructs her to check if Miss Mir's abilities have increased, and the tiger licks his face. He laughs and says okay, got it. Returning, she expresses amazement at the noticeable effects of his training, but he remains doubtful, 
and emphasizes the need for caution due to the presence of many onlookers. She acknowledges and thanks him. He agrees with a laugh, thinking he's pleased with the apparent effectiveness of the training. As she resumes running, she mentions concluding the training with a final 200 laps. He receives a message from Saintess, asking if he could bestow upon her a name. He ponders the idea of giving her a name, noting that calling her Saintess all the time is not ideal. He suggests the name Karen but recalls his manager's comment that he lacks naming sense. He suggests the name Auntie for the ant, and everyone becomes excited and requests Lord Yuil Shin to bestow names upon them as well. He reluctantly agrees, starting with the first one and proceeding with numbers 2, 3, and so on. He emphasizes that home is the best, noting that repairs are complete and they can finally get some rest. Suddenly, he receives a notification that the Saintess and 100 Black Tribe followers, whose names he graced, have evolved due to the experience gained from hunting demonic beasts of calamity. The special note mentions that they are absolute cuties, and he expresses amazement at the stylish change in the screen. He receives another notification informing him that due to the evolution of the Formica tribe, cockroach summoning experience points will be converted, and now he is on level 2. He expresses surprise that the game has level ups and receives another notification that, due to an increase in levels, civilization renaissance has been created. The black tribe ants observe the changing forest, and Saintess prays for the miracles Lord Yuil Shin will bestow upon them. He is pleased that he can finally start customizing and creating houses and fields for the Black Tribe. He notes that with the training ground and walls he has created, the tribe should be able to train and defend themselves. Saintess asks her tribe members if they have witnessed the miracles Lord Yuil Shin has bestowed upon them, encouraging them to worship the Great Lord. They all cheer for their Lord, praising him for providing them with food, shelter, and protection. He laughs and comments on how these fellows seem to be getting cuter, even the name Formica tribe is cute. He wonders if these creatures will evolve further and expresses his continued interest. He then checks the functions of the tribe and receives a notification about the warrior's tower, an imitation of the tower managed by the Eternal Seeker. The notification states that only the brave and faithful can challenge the tower, which longs for the blood and souls of the challengers. One of the ants asks about it, and he explains that it craves blood and souls, with a survival rate of 1 out of 100,000 at best if the ants enter, even out of curiosity. After a while, he receives a notification asking if he wants to collapse the outer wall. He decides to do so, intending to block the entrance to ensure that none of the ants go in, even out of curiosity. One of the ants expresses admiration for Lord Yuil Shin as an impressive being. Ilho comes out, reflecting on the tower that only the bravest people can challenge. He recalls incidents when his friends needed help and determines that if he can become even a tiny bit stronger, he will be able to protect his friends. The scene shifts to the Emperor's castle, where a soldier expresses disbelief, stating that it's impossible. He describes the accused as a great shaman who had contracted with the Demon King, pleading for one more chance. The Emperor orders silence, declaring death as the only atonement. The soldier pleads for mercy once again, but the Emperor dismisses him and orders his guards to kill the shaman. The shaman runs away, calling them useless bugs and expressing frustration at having to handle it himself. Arachne intervenes, urging the Emperor to remain calm and questioning why he, someone so noble, would lower himself to deal with something so insignificant. He retorts, criticizing the incompetence of those who can't handle lowly ants, while the ants bow in front of Arachne, showing her respect. She implores him to reign in his anger, and he questions her return, referring to her as his imperial consort. She bows before the Emperor, confirming that she has indeed returned to his side after fulfilling his orders. She reminds him that he is a demigod on the brink of being reborn as a full god, advising him to entrust the affairs of this world to her. She emphasizes the need for his focus on ascending to the new world and dealing with the black tribe and the evil god they worship. With determination, she pledges to obliterate them all, staking her name, Arachne, on the promise. Arachne identifies him as the white bloodsucker Mosto, who welcomes her. She instructs him to make the evil god pay the price for going against his majesty's will, and bestows upon him the cursed needle bestowed by the abominable plague bringer. Mosto expresses his understanding but mentions that he has one request. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin works on his laptop recalling his manager's warning about the possibility of contract cancellation and serialization termination if he doesn't meet his quota. Determined, he takes a deep breath and urges himself to hold on a little longer until he finishes his work. While checking his phone, he wonders what his comrades are doing and observes that they are all asleep. He comments on them sleeping comfortably and then notices Ilho in the tower. 
Puzzled, he asks about the scene, observing him exercising and throwing a rock away. He expresses surprise, noting the rock's size compared to him and sensing something different about him. Yuil Shin checks his details and learns his name is Ilho, a Gayami warrior with the special characteristic of training hard to protect his kin. Meanwhile, he finds it interesting, noting that after evolving, the Gayami tribe developed its own unique characteristics. He questions whether it's enjoyable to raise and let them evolve and considers what he can do for Ilho. Tossing a bottle of the Blessing of the Growing God potion, Ilho receives it and questions its nature. Ilho wonders if it's a gift from Lord Yuil Shin, expressing his appreciation and emotional gratitude, stating that Lord Yuil Shin likes him and is watching over him. Yuil Shin responds positively, urging Ilho to start doing his best again. White Bloodsucker Mosto arrives, recognizing the rumored evil god is the one who eliminated the third, a member of the Ten Swordsmen like himself. He recalls a moment when Arachne asked him about his request, addressing him as White Bloodsucker Mosto. He responds that he would like to have a taste of the evil god's blood, the one worshipped by the Black Tribe and expresses curiosity about how his blood tastes. She assures him that the evil god's blood and his honorable flesh are all his, addressing him as White Bloodsucker Mosto. He contemplates the potential power he could gain from the blood of the evil god, flying towards him with the intention to surpass the emperor, ascend to the throne, and eventually claim him as well. He laughs, deeming the evil god slow-witted. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin remarks on the need to meet the deadline so he can get some more sleep. Unaware of White Bloodsucker Mosto's approach, he adds that he doesn't even feel him coming. White Bloodsucker Mosto expresses satisfaction, relishing the increase in strength he feels from sucking the evil god's blood. He confidently declares that with this much power, he will be able to kill him. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin touches his head where White Bloodsucker Mosto bit him, realizing that it woke him up. Upon inspecting his hand, he notices blood and wonders why there are still mosquitoes in late autumn. Suddenly feeling cold, he starts coughing and sneezing, deciding it's time to wash his face. Perplexed, he questions the mark on his forehead, receiving a notification about a mark from the abominable plague bringer and the activation of a chill's curse. He inquires about the nature of the chill's curse. Annoyed, he sneezes again, expressing frustration with the curse, likening it to a cold. Despite having a deadline to meet, he receives notifications that a fever curse, a muscle pain curse, and an anemia curse are all activated. After a while, he falls down and wonders about an item to cure himself. He decides to check the god shop and finds an option for a famous doctor. Urgently, he buys it, and after the purchase, he receives a quest. Frustrated, he questions why he can't just be given the item and expresses the need to go to the hospital. On the other side, Kim Tebium recalls Johan Nim asking him if he fears death. He responds that God's will is more than enough, expressing his dedication to purifying the world. Convinced that today, he will give up his life for the mission of purifying the world, he affirms that Johan Nim's mission is now his mission as well, all while wearing a live bomb jacket. On the other side, the cab driver informs Yu Il Shin that they have arrived at the hospital. He expresses gratitude and attempts to enter the hospital. However, he receives a notification about a quest related to saving others and is puzzled by the demand to save 100 people, interpreting it as a directive to die immediately. Simultaneously, Kim Tebium arrives at the hospital and commands everyone to lie down and stay still. He threatens that anyone moving will result in everyone's death, holding a nurse in a firm grip. Xiang Miri intervenes, insisting that he release the nurse. Dismissing her as hunter scum, Kim Tebium continues his actions. Yuil Shin witnesses the chaotic scene, questioning how it escalated to this point. Kim Tebium spots him and identifies him as a brother sent on the same mission, urging him to assist. Yuil Shin notices the mark on Kim Tebium's forehead, contemplating the situation. Xiang Miri questions Yu Il Shin about having an accomplice and questions his presence. Kim Tebium persists in calling for Yu Il Shin's help. Kim Tebium pleads once again for help from his brothers and urges them to offer a sacrifice for the God of Destruction's descent while the nurse cries for help. Xiang Miri questions what Kim Tebium is saying and asserts that he got it wrong. Yu Il Shil is her teacher. Kim Tebium insists that she is mistaken and points out the skull on his forehead as their mark emphasizing that he can feel a wicked aura emanating from him. Siang Miri asks in disbelief if they just called their teacher wicked and expresses her anger, questioning if they want to die. Yuil Shin interjects, stating that he's dying, and implores Lightning Empress for treatment. However, Kim Tebium counters, claiming that the person is the right-hand man that disciple Johan has sent. He dismisses the idea that he is their teacher and encourages Siang Miri to strike him, asserting that he'll detonate the bombs. Siang Miri condemns him as a cowardly villain, 
Kim Tebium shouts, calling him a fool for daring to prevent a sacrifice from being offered to the one who will purify this world. He questions whether he understands the great significance of that being. Simultaneously, he receives a notification that the subject's memory is being read successfully. Another notification follows, stating that he has read the memories and images in the subject's mind. With this knowledge, Kim Tebium suggests that the person join in on the great work they are doing. Recalling Johan Nim's instructions to kill the sacrifices after they have experienced a great amount of fear, and understanding that the God of Destruction's descent requires a great number of sacrifices, Kim Tebium asks if he, as his warrior, can do it. He replies affirmatively, addressing him as his lord. Kim Tebium adds that if someone like the person can be sacrificed, then that being will be very pleased. He contemplates, realizing that he might die if this continues. Kim Tebium, driven by the fervor for the God of Destruction, attempts to press the button of the bomb. Yuil Shin understands that he has to stop him and employs the technique of crushing God's index finger, immobilizing Kim Tebium in that position. Yuil Shin instructs Seong Miri to move forward, and together they run towards Kim Tebium, who is trying to press the button. Seong Miri quickly attacks him with a lightning bolt, causing him to fall. However, Yu Il Shin also collapses. Seong Miri addresses her teacher, stating that Kim Tebium has been defeated, seeing him lying on the floor. Yu Il Shin experiences a dream where a monster declares that his time to die has come, and he receives a notification that the curse of necrosis has been activated. Seong Miri approaches Yu Il Shin and asks if he's alright, urging him to wake up. She pleads, saying, Teacher, please wake up. Meanwhile, Nava says, Beautiful consort, Arak just give him the order, and he will kill that evil god with his poison right now. She replies that he won't have to meddle at all, and he reiterates his offer, expressing concern about the potential failure of the god of plague's curse. She assures him that there's no need for any concern. Nava continues, mentioning the emperor, the leader of this abominable plague, as a very stubborn and greedy being. She acknowledges that the emperor won't ever let go of anything they sink their teeth into. The scene shifts to Yuil Shin who wakes up and inquires about his whereabouts. He recalls hearing a strange voice before the curse activated but wonders why he is here and what exactly happened. The monster responds, stating that a newborn god dares to stare him awake, condemning him to eternal suffering and endless death. The monster predicts that Yuil Shin will soon wallow in despair and beg him to end his life. The monster further elaborates that he will serve as food to his steeds, and his blood will be used for that purpose. Yuil Shin thinks the monster is talking a bit too much. As the rose that blooms at night arrives, the monster questions why the demon is here and gets scared upon seeing him while he attacks him. Yuil Shin receives a notification about a quest, stating that if he wishes to live, he must save others and eradicate diseases. To survive, he needs to use his desperation to save 100 human beings. He successfully saves the required number of humans to complete the quest, and the notification congratulates him on accomplishing the quest, emphasizing the importance of saving others to ensure his survival. Meanwhile, she attempts to wake him up, and he receives a notification that the owner of Chen Nanjong smiles upon him. He wakes up and questions if it was a dream. Another notification informs him that he has been gifted the medicinal elixir of Hua Chuo. She expresses her relief that he woke up, addressing him as a teacher. He confirms, feeling something in his mouth, and notices that his body is fully recovered, speculating whether it's the effect of the elixir. A notification follows, stating that as an additional reward, a portion of that being's godly power is now flowing into him. People gather around them, expressing admiration for Xiong Miri and requesting her autograph. They remark on how cool she is and inquire how such a young girl can be so courageous. He departs, assuring her that he'll call her later. Johan Nim observes the entire incident and acknowledges that they have thoroughly examined the bomb situation, asserting that Kim Tebium must have made a mistake. He apologizes and promises not to disappoint him next time. In response, Johan Nim informs him that he'll give him four days, instructing him to kill those hunters and bring that man to him. Curious about Johan Nim's intentions, he inquires about what Johan Nim wants with that man. Johan Nim expresses disdain, claiming that insects like him haven't received the favor of the gods. He questions whether he can truly not perceive that man's value, even when he's shining as bright as the sun amidst lowly insects. He asserts that he can see the favor of the gods permeating from that man's body. The guild leader thinks to himself, this guy is insane. Yuil Shin lies down in bed, acknowledging that he is alive, and remarks on the amazing effect of the elixir of Hua Chuo. He receives a notification stating that Ilho is desperately requesting salvation from Yuil Shin. Confused, he questions the desperate request for salvation. Shortly afterwards, he gets another notification, 
in which Ilho deeply apologizes for disturbing him but humbly asks if he could have more of the medicine Yu Il Shin graciously gave him last time. Concerned, Yu Il Shin wonders what's wrong and what happened and decides to call Ilho. Ilho believes he will emerge victorious in every trial within the warrior's tower, all to obtain the power that will allow him to protect his tribe. He hears that a challenger Ilho is now attempting a trial on the first floor of the warrior's tower, specifically the trial of rock. The condition to clear the trial is to climb the stairs and reach the second floor, and the trial has begun. He tells himself not to be scared, reflecting on how he leveled up with the drink Yu Il Shin gave him. He even switched his job to a soldier and is now wearing amazing armor, confidently stating that he can do this. Suddenly, a big rock comes from above and hits him, causing him to cry for help. Yu Il Shin receives a notification that he has read the subject's memories. Upon seeing Ilho, he recognizes him as the ant he trampled and killed for fun in the past. Yu Il Shin asks if he suffered like this, too. Meanwhile, he receives another notification stating that in 10 seconds, Ilho's life will be suspended. Shocked by this revelation, he exclaims no, for now, let's get the blessing of the god of growth, and gives him another bottle of potion. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, and he receives a notification that in 8 seconds, Ilho's life will be suspended. Reflecting on the situation, he remembers receiving a reward from the owner of Chengnagil. He gets another notification indicating that he has spent 100 coins and obtained the innate authority divine healing medicine. The notification asks if he will use his authority, and he instantly replies, of course, yes. A subsequent notification informs him that in three seconds, Ilho's life will be suspended. He administers healing medicine to Ilho, who gradually heals and wakes up. Yu Il Shin reiterates that he had advised Ilho not to enter the tower since it's dangerous. Ilho apologizes, explaining that he just wanted to protect his tribe. Yu Il Shin acknowledges the danger and suggests leaving for now. Ilho agrees, but they find the door isn't opening. Yu Il Shin questions why it isn't opening. He receives a notification explaining that the warrior's tower entry is a replica of the Seeker of Eternity. It has been 39,131,321 years since its last use, and he can't exit until he has cleared the 50th floor. Yu Il Shin realizes he can't leave unless he climbs up to the 50th floor and clears it. Concerned, Ilho asks what they should do. He gets a message that the gifted authority of the Seeker of Eternity has arrived. Yu Il Shin questions what it is, thinking it's probably another ripoff, but feels compelled to consider it due to the lack of options. After a while, Kim Timon arrives at the door and asks if he's there. He inquires about the visitor, and Yu Il Shin advises Ilho to drink what's given to him for now. Assured that he'll be back soon, they both consume the drink. As he walks towards the door, he questions the contents of the drink, concluding that it's just protein and Red Bull, deeming it a scam. There's another knock at the door, and he responds yes, he's coming. How impatient is he before asking who's there? Kim Timon identifies himself as Hunter Yu Il Shin and introduces himself as department head Kim Timon, an exclusive scout of the Brilliance Guild. He expresses it's an honor to meet him. Yu Il Shin clarifies that he's not a hunter, to which Kim Timon predicts he will be soon. He then asks if Yu Il Shin has time for a quick chat. Yu Il Shin agrees, and he receives a message stating that the Seeker of Eternity looks down fondly on Challenger Ilho, who is walking the path of a true man. Ilho says nice, let's try this again, and attempts to break the rock with full force, successfully breaking it. Yu Il Shin receives a notification stating that Challenger Ilho has cleared the trial of rock. Ilho is rewarded with the blessing of rock for clearing the first floor of the warrior's tower, and is now attempting the second floor trial of wind. He sits with Kim Timon and questions the annual salary of 300 million. Kim Timon confirms and suggests going to his guild right away to sign the contract. He asks if there's a problem. Yu Il Shin contemplates the offer, thinking that with 300 million, he could freely write his manuscript without worrying about an evil manager. He could enjoy fried rice and beef and indulge in whatever food he desires. Additionally, he could buy numerous presents for his sweet niece, Sung Yeon. Kim Timon offers him 70% of the byproducts and rewards received when hunting monsters. Yu Il Shin contemplates the offer, thinking that he could invest the rest of the money into creating his masterpiece and become successful, eventually marrying a beautiful woman. Kim Timon notices Yu Il Shin seems lost in thought and asks if he's listening. Yu Il Shin apologizes, stating he was deep in thought. He receives a message that he has appraised the subject and checks Kim Timon's details, discovering that he is a person from the Lackey of the God of Destruction Guild. 
He reiterates that he won't receive an offer like this anywhere else. However, Yu Il Shin reflects on Kim Taemin being a lackey of the God of Destruction, and wonders if the 300 million was just bait. Frustrated, he curses Kim Taemin under his breath. Kim Taemin asks if there is a problem. Yu Il Shin replies, thinking about it, that he's actually quite busy right now and suggests Kim Taemin contacts him later. Kim Taemin inquires if the conditions are not to his liking. Yu Il Shin responds that he just has a manuscript that he needs to complete. Kim Tiemann acknowledges that he may have disturbed him but emphasizes that the money he could make as a writer would be a hundred times less than what he would make with them. Yu Il Shin clarifies that it's not about the money and mentions that he's not doing this work just for financial gain. He apologizes, and Kim Tiemann does the same. However, Kim Tiemann adds that the guild master was quite earnest in his request to bring him along. He expresses gratitude and says that if Yu Il Shin has the time, he would be very grateful to have him join. Yu Il Shin states that if Kim Tiemann puts it that way, then he doesn't have a choice. But suddenly, his stomach starts aching. He asks if he could quickly go to the toilet. Kim Tiemann responds affirmatively, telling him to go ahead and that he'll wait for him there. Yu Il Shin hurries to the toilet, pondering what kind of person Kim Tiemann is. When he appraised him earlier, it definitely said that he was the lackey of the God of Destruction, like that terror bomber from the hospital. He wonders whether he should call the Hunter Association or the police. While Yu Il Shin is in the toilet, Kim Tiemann breaks the wall and enters, asking who he is trying to call. Kim Tiemann says he'll ask him again and inquires about whom he is planning to call. Yu Il Shin replies that he has an urgent call to make to a publisher. Without understanding why he was summoned, he punches Kim Tiemann, throws him away, and expresses frustration that others could have handled the task since he doesn't seem to comprehend. He seizes him by the neck, stating that he will take him along after rendering him unconscious. He asks if it's painful and mentions that it would have been better if he had just listened. If he stays still, he promises to make him sleep peacefully for some time. A notification arrives indicating that a quest to save the next believer has been created. He inquires about the Save the Believer quest and checks its details. The quest involves saving the Earth Branch's first member, Siang Miri, from death, with a reward of plus 100 faith. Meanwhile, he contemplates that Siang Miri is on the brink of death, and Kim Tiemann inquires how he has endured for quite a while. He adds that ordinary people would have fainted by now. Reflecting again, he realizes he needs to do something about this situation, acknowledging the significant gap in strength. At this rate, he fears he will die first without gaining the necessary strength. Ilho expresses a prayer to the great and only God, asking for strength and success. He receives a notification that skill sharing has been added, Gayami clan Ilho, acquiring the steel body skill. He shouts share, and his clothes tear as he becomes muscular. He thinks about body enhancement, realizing he is creating matter with his ability. Now, he is certain that he is someone the guild master is interested in. Another notification arrives, indicating that the steel body is a class A, and the iron bulk up Ilho obtained from the warrior's tower with the blessings of rock, wind, steel, and fire. Kim Tiemann expresses his disappointment, realizing that he was let down because he thought the mission he was entrusted with was easy. In light of this, he concludes that there is no need to envy the one who got the lightning person. He is uncertain if the matter with the lightning empress has already been resolved, but he decides to stop fooling around and quickly escort teacher Yu Il Shin. He then asks when they will begin and prepares for the fight. Yu Il Shin rushes to punch him, but Kim Tiemann evades the attack, thinking that it's a heavy punch, Yet the attacker is not guarding and is throwing punches recklessly. Kim Tiemann is convinced that this guy is a newbie, finding it disappointing. He moves to punch Yu Il Shin, who attempts to counter but he grabs his face, kicks him in the face, and delivers blows with both hands to his neck, subjecting him to abuse. He falls unconscious to the floor, and Yu Il Shin remarks that he should have called her first. However, his phone indicates that the person he has called is currently unavailable. He shouts in frustration, demanding the stupid game to help him quickly as he needs to find Siang Miri. A notification appears, stating that the Believer Management System of the Only God will now be implemented. He inquires about the Believer Management System and receives an option that, to find the location of the Believer, he has to pay 1,000 coins. He notes that he already has plenty of coins, so he selects yes. Instantly, he receives the confirmed location and situation of Siang Miri. He observes a sword demon walking towards her, saying, don't worry, and it won't be painful. She is badly injured and calls out to him just as the sword demon stabs her. Alongside this, he notices an achievement award letter. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin reflects on Siang Miri being attacked by a strange guy, identified as a sword demon. He 
he receives a notification stating that he has foreseen Xiong Miri's disastrous fate, and mentions that these events have not yet happened but are soon destined to occur. Yuil Shin considers that it's similar to what happened in the past with the Death Demon, concluding that Xiong Miri is not dead yet. An option appears, asking if he will change the destiny of mortals with the authority of God. Yuil Shin confidently chooses yes, recalling that the Sword Demon's unique trait is being a sword fanatic. He realizes that he, too, has a sword in his drawer. Retrieving the God Blade, he says nice, let's go. Another notification follows, stating that in exchange for changing their destiny, 100,000 coins will be consumed. His current title, the Benevolent Savior, and the effect of the only God's creation, Second Door, will create an amazing miracle. Excited to witness this, he disappears. The scene shifts to Xiong Miri, who attempts to get up and asks why he is doing this. Sword Demon responds that he has no ill feelings towards her, he's just doing his job. As he spots someone, he runs towards that person and inquires about their identity. Yuil Sin wonders about a stealth skill that she couldn't detect and questions who on earth he is. The Sword Demon expresses a desire to slice and cut him up while she also recognizes him. Sword Demon reflects on his journey after choosing the path of the sword, having to defeat many talented individuals to reach his current position. He wonders if he's on the same side as the Lightning Empress, recalling how he stood against stronger opponents and defeated them by finding an advantage. Yu Il Shin laughs and expresses his desire to cut everything. Sword Demon, observing Yu Il Shin, thinks something is off with him. Noting that Yu Il Shin is holding a fruit knife, Sword Demon believes cheap tricks won't work on him and charges to attack. Yu Il Shin moves back, successfully evading the attack. He reflects that even S-Class hunters couldn't handle his blade, and he'll be impressed if Sword Demon can dodge it. Yu Il Shin declares his intention to cut, wondering how he managed to block his strike with a fruit knife. He questions the kind of person he is but realizes it's his fault for underestimating. Stating that his blade cuts through stone like tofu, Yu Il Shin attacks again. Sword Demon thinks he won't be able to block it, but Yu Il Shin confidently walks towards him and launches another attack. He is puzzled about where Yuil Shin came from and is determined to cut everything, countering the attack. In the midst of the confrontation, the opponent reflects that he has never heard of someone like Yuil Shin before, and he might be the Lightning Empress teacher. However, he also considers that Yuil Shin could be an unknown, unofficial hunter managed by the government and the Hunter Association which explains why he didn't recognize him. Meanwhile, he contemplates that he didn't anticipate having to resort to this, acknowledging that it will consume some of his lifespan. Nevertheless, he believes that a single attack fueled by this potion will be enough to defeat him. Taking out a bottle of potion, he drinks it, experiencing a surge in power. With newfound strength, he confidently declares that he is ready to face him and charges forward, addressing Yuil Shin as the teacher of the Lightning Empress and a hunter of unknown origin. As Yu Il Shin counterattacks, Sword Demon runs away. Employing his Shadow Step skill, Sword Demon launches an attack, but to his surprise, his opponent remains unscathed. Seated on the floor, he reflects that the strike landed, deeming it a good duel. However, his satisfaction is short lived as he suddenly notices that his sword has shattered. He exclaims how his blade breaks and expresses surprise that he remains unharmed after taking the attack. Despite the situation, he continues to shout, declaring his intent to cut everything, engaging in a dance with his blade as he observes Yu Il Shin. Puzzled, he questions Yu Il Shin's identity and contemplates his impending demise as Yu Il Shin approaches to launch an attack. In the midst of their confrontation, Sword Demon, unharmed, questions why Yu Il Shin spared him, given the immense power at his disposal. He implores Yu Il Shin to reveal his identity. In response, Yu Il Shin casually states it's yummy and identifies himself as the Sword God. Overwhelmed, Sword Demon reflects on the significance of the title, recognizing the Sword God as the one who attains the pinnacle of the Path of Swords. After some time, a notification informs Yu Il Shin that the Steel Body Skill Sharing Session has concluded, and he is reverting to his ordinary, seemingly useless body. Observing the transformation of the God Blade back into a mere fruit knife due to a lack of authority, he exclaims the fruit knife as he regains awareness. Sword Demon bows respectfully, acknowledging his defeat and addressing Yu Il Shin as the Sword God, expressing both defeat and a hint of fear. Another notification appears, indicating that Sword God is now eligible for evolution. Sword Demon pleads for the opportunity to witness more of Yu Il Shin's swordsmanship, offering to lay down his life for him and follow any command, regardless of how extreme. Yu Il Shin, recognizing Sword Demon's disturbed state, receives a notification confirming Sword Demon as his second follower and marking him as a fanatic. 
Meanwhile, they suddenly spot Xiang Miri on the brink of death. Swiftly, Sword Demon rushes to her aid as she calls out to Yuil Shen. He administers a potion to her, the same elixir he had consumed earlier. Perplexed, Yuil Shin questions the nature of the potion, examining its details. It turns out to be a high potion, Sword Demon's most potent curative elixir, kept as a last resort with the special attribute that, as long as the person is not yet deceased, they can be saved. Another notification arrives, congratulating Yuil Shin on successfully instilling fanatical faith by showcasing the awe-inspiring and majestic qualities of a god. Apologizing for his earlier outburst, Sword Demon addresses Yuil Shin as the Sword God. Xiang Miri, too, regains consciousness. Yuil Shin receives a notification confirming the successful completion of the Flower Redemption Test, resulting in Xiang Miri's faith increasing by 100, now totaling 139. He reflects on the numerous instances, ranging from bothersome insects to guild members he's never even heard of, where people incessantly interfere with him and those close to him. Sword Demon reassures Yuil Shin that the Lightning Empress will recover once she reaches safety. However, Yuil Shin questions who is to blame for her getting injured in the first place. Sword Demon, in response, pleads for Yuil Shin to absolve his guilt by allowing him to cut open his own stomach. Yuil Shin finds his followers' behavior irrational and wonders about his sanity. He reiterates his commitment, stating that the moment he acquires a new blade, he will proceed to cut his own stomach open. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin reflects on Sword Demon's origin, recalling that he was recruited from a guild known as the Sheen Guild. Yuil Shin instructs Sword Demon to take charge of dealing with the Sheen Guild. Sword Demon affirms his readiness to fulfill any order given by Yuil Shin, emphasizing that there are scarcely ten individuals in the country he cannot defeat. Yuil Shin strategizes, considering the Sheen Guild as his next target, deeming the assassin hired by his adversaries expendable and preparing to disrupt the guild's operations. Yuil Shin instructs Sword Demon to eliminate the Luminous Something Guild. Sword Demon, taken aback, seeks clarification, asking if that's truly what he wants. Yuil Shin reiterates his earlier statement, emphasizing that Sword Demon should do as he asked. Sword Demon, acknowledging the command of the Honorable Sword God, expresses his willingness to comply. Yuil Shin receives a notification confirming the obedience of a fanatic, unlocking an acquired authority. Another notification appears, presenting the option to activate the proliferating thumb of God's authority. Excitedly, Yuil Shin contemplates the potential of this skill to multiply money and gold bars, eagerly deciding to activate it. After a while, Yuil Shin arrives home and begins searching through drawers, exclaiming that he hid some emergency funds somewhere. He finds his piggy bank and expresses disappointment, stating that there are only 101. Regardless, he mentions the proliferating thumb of the god. However, he receives another notification informing him that this skill doesn't work on objects, holding the coin in his hand. Frustrated, he complains about the lack of a skill that could make his life easier. Messages from Soundless Nightmare and Thousand's Blades that cuts all prompt him to pull himself together and uphold the majesty of a god and put an end to all impudent trash. Yuil Shin realizes that he needs to take action as well, as the first one to strike wins. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin asks the guys what he should do if he wants to get stronger. He receives a message from Endless Granting Abundance, suggesting that, from a long-term perspective, he should build up good karma. Soundless Nightmare chimes in, stating that building up good karma will take ages, so it's better to accumulate bad karma through carnage. Thousand Blades that cut all agrees with Nightmare, mentioning that he can easily commit carnage using a celestial sword. Yuil Shin ponders the options and decides to go with both methods. He then receives a notification welcoming him to Godmaker, a game where, depending on how he plays, he can either become a good god or an evil god. He sits on his bed and decides to use the proliferating thumb of the god to increase the number of his ants. He exclaims it's proliferating thumb of the god. Now, a million troops are needed to wipe out the entire enemy army. He receives a notification that one million troops of the Gayami tribe, proliferated by a god's authority, are now marching towards the imperial army with a duration of 24 hours. Laughing, he commands them to kill all the enemy armies and questions Auntie about what she is doing. She uses the healing ring finger of God, surprising him that she can use her skill. The kid ant mentions that her arm doesn't hurt anymore, and Auntie says to everyone please believe in Lord Yuil Shin with his grace, they can live a new life. All the ants express their belief in him. He receives a message stating that as the number of believers increases, the amount of God karma will also follow suit. 
He wonders if this feels similar to a fanatic and considers it a bit dangerous. He remarks that thanks to these antis, the amount of good karma automatically accumulates. His phone rings with a call from Almighty Manager Baster, and he answers with a hello. Almighty Manager expresses frustration, asking why his manuscript isn't coming in and emphasizing the challenges he faces because the president asked him to terminate the contract. He explains that he had to take a break for personal reasons, to which Almighty Manager responds by questioning what he means by a break. He adds that he hasn't even started his serialization yet, expressing disbelief and frustration. While thinking about the situation, he wonders what will happen if he uses the proliferating thumb of God on himself and considers giving it a try. He places his thumb on his forehead and activates the proliferating thumb of the God skill, causing an explosion. Before him stands a man who looks similar to him. A notification appears, indicating that the proliferating thumb of the god has activated with duration of 6666 seconds. He exclaims that it worked and designates the other version of him to handle writing the manuscript, intending to assist the warriors. However, Inner Self intervenes by punching him and tossing him aside. Inner Self retorts not to tell him what to do and proceeds to inflict severe injuries through continuous punches. After the beating, the Inner Self expresses satisfaction. Meanwhile, Almighty Manager remains on the call, questioning the meaning of this and expressing disbelief. Inner Self becomes irritated and verbally abuses him, leaving the Almighty Manager confused about his statements. The Inner Self utilizes the cruel slaughterer equipment, transforming into a monster. Uttering a statement, it contemplates whether they will go and then proceeds inside the God Maker, initiating a confrontation with the Black Tribe's monster. One of the Black Tribe soldiers remarks that even with their numerical advantage, the Inner Self is too formidable, making it seemingly impossible for them to engage in combat. The monster expresses delight, specifically mentioning the Black Tribe, receiving a message that the Inner Self has elevated the Cruel Slaughterer to a C rank. Subsequently, the monster arrives to support the Black Tribe, characterizing it as an evil god only heard of in stories. The monster conveys this information. A soldier approaches Iraq while coughing, offering sincere apologies. He reveals that all the troops sent into battle were annihilated. She becomes angry and asks why he's telling her it was the work of a single evil god. Meanwhile, he says not to go against an evil god who looks like the devil himself while trying to convey something. Her guards exclaim goodness, he died without even leaving a body. Hurry up and let his majesty the emperor know. The emperor is currently in closed door meditation. She instructs them to summon the general and the ten swords immediately while he secretly listens and mentions that if they do that, they will be under attack from monsters and other surrounding nations. Barak insists that dealing with the Black Tribe is of utmost importance right now, and she orders them to bring her the evil god's head before his majesty comes out of his meditation. He thinks Mistress Arach forgives him for leaving without saying goodbye, and he will forget his manners just this one time. He says he will offer her the evil god's head with these hands of his. Yuil Shin gets back to his senses and asks what the hell just happened. He says his other inner self gives him a beating since there's nobody around to beat him up now, so his other inner self took it upon himself to do just that. He receives a notification that Endless Granting Abundance is asking where his sexy other self is and if he could introduce them. Annoyed, he notes 121 missed calls, wondering who it is, though no one's calling now, and there are some messages too. He gets a message from Almighty Manager that they are not only terminating his contracts, but also instructing him to return the down payment. He receives a message that Anti changed occupation after a successful missionary work in the Termite Kingdom. Anti successfully captured the Grass Kingdom, experienced growth in several titles, and collected a number of white and dark coins, leveling up. He asks what the heck these are used for, questioning the significance of his progress in the game. Yuil Shin receives a notification that, due to the successful propagation of the White Ant Kingdom's nomads, he has been promoted to bishop in the Antiga team. He has also obtained 131,302 prisoners from the Grass Kingdom, with details indicating that number one has been promoted to beginner muscle warrior, number two has been promoted to spearman, and number three has been promoted to archer. Perplexed, he questions the point of all of this. He then gets another notification that White Tiger has been promoted to military band soldier and he has acquired a large amount of white coins and dark coins. Frustrated, he wonders about the purpose of the game going well now, and curses the game. Recalling the manager's mention of contract cancellation and contract funds refund, he looks at his laptop and notices the deadline. In response, he resolves to type it out quickly and send it. 
he receives another notification about a new Believer's rescue quest to save the Fanatic Believer. He also gets a message asking if he will save the Fanatic Believer, Sword Demon, with the reward being that saving her will help his abilities bloom like flowers. He questions the validity, stating that he has work to do right now, and contemplates ignoring it, expressing his indifference. Simultaneously, he receives another notification to understand what the Believers are thinking and the perspective of the fanatic believer, Sword Demon, will now be shown. Observing Chialmi tying Sword Demon up, he asks if she really isn't talkative. Yuil Shin checks her details, finding out that her name is Chialmi, a 26-year-old female human working in Sheen Guild, blessed by the God of Destruction. She can wield impressive flames. She grabs him by his hair and asks if he spills it now, she'll kill him painlessly. Observing this, Yuil Shin is frightened and thinks what the hell, and did he get captured while attacking the Sheen Guild? Seeing Chioldu, he believes there's one more super strong guy, while she tells Sword Demon that he's so boring. Using his inherent authority, he approaches the opponent's mind. He recalls that he was sold to the Dark House when he was young, raised to be an assassin. After awakening his Tai Chi abilities, he carried out several assassination missions and got to know Chialmi and Chioldu, who were raised like him in the Sheen Guild. Yuil Shin asks what that is, while Sword Demon says they naturally became his rivals. She sees him and asks if they were first again this time and questions if this is favoritism. Sword Demon expresses that he couldn't have normal dreams of his future like others. He tells both of them that if they are envious, they should try harder. Both Chialmi and Chioldu abuse him as he walks away. He reflects on how he walked the path of becoming one with the sword to become stronger. At least his swordsmanship is as advanced as it could be, and he has reached his goal. However, he feels ashamed, wondering if this is the end. The story returns to the present, where Chialmi asks him who ordered him to attack the Sheen Guild and how he could betray them. Chioldu states that traitors get killed, suggesting they should just end this. She questions what they should kill him with, revealing that Priest Johan said he'd give them 100 million if they bring him alive because he wants to use him as a sacrifice. Angry, Sword Demon declares that he'll kill her too if she interrupts. She states that she won't and just thinks it's a shame. Sword Demon, in his thoughts, apologizes to Sword God when Chioldu is about to punch him and declares that he'll make him suffer as much as possible. Yuil Shin observes this and realizes it's bad. He has to save him first and share the skill of Believer Number 1, Steel Body. At the same time, he receives a notification about approaching the Believer in danger. He thinks he needs Number 1 second muscles and quickly takes Sword Demon away. Chioldu asks who he is and where he came from, to which Yuil Shin responds that it doesn't matter right now, and he's a busy man. Yuil Shin contemplates using Xiang Miri's lightning tactic skill while he's in number one second steel body state. He decides to share the skill of believer Xiang Miri, lightning tactic, thinking they'd all be wiped out in one hit, feeling like a genius as he gets ready to attack. He receives another notification that the skill limit has been reached, and he can't share more than two strong believers' skills with his current divine level. Shouting in frustration, he sees the skill limit reached and his status overloaded. Chioldu becomes angry, accusing him of mocking him, and attempts to punch him, but he ends up hurting himself and screams. Yuil Shin gets another notification that he has endured the overload with his steel body skill, thinking he almost died. Chialmi runs towards him and urges him to wake up, while Yuil Shin thinks he somehow took care of one of them. She shouts at Chioldu for hitting him and prepares to attack him. Yuil Shin contemplates if he is going to die like this, but then he receives another message that he has endured the flames using number one second steel body skill. He thinks about how hot it is but oddly feels good, likening it to being in a bathtub. She declares that she defeated him while seeing him in an ice dress and asks how he did that, not believing it. He thinks he didn't know number one second steel body skill was this strong, laughs, and expresses his satisfaction that he leveled him up a lot. Frustrated, she asks what bloomed, calling him an idiot for expecting something good. Sword Demon wakes up and becomes ecstatic to see him, praising him as Sword God. He admires Yuil Shin for defeating the enemies with methods he has never seen before, calling him amazing. Yuil Shin thinks not to look at him with those kinds of eyes and wonders where he is, realizing he has to go home and work. He tells Sword Demon that it's time to leave, and Sword Demon eagerly agrees, asking for an order. Yuil Shin replies that it's fine, he just wants to go home, and they should get out of there. After a while, Priest Johan arrives and expresses that Yuil Shin is as amazing as he expected, greeting him with a nice to meet him. Sword Demon warns him to be careful, addressing him as Sword God. 
priest Johan acknowledges that they finally meet and declares that Yu Il Shin is the cause of all this. Yu Il Shin checks his details, finding out that he's priest Johan, a male human in charge of sacrificial rituals for the god of destruction. In his thoughts, Yu Il Shin deems him a pervert. Priest Johan repeats that it's an honor to meet him, and Yu Il Shin thinks he has encountered a wild pervert. Yu Il Shin contemplates that no matter how he tries to look at it, he can't see it, and he has to be careful. Priest Johan, emotionally moved, approaches him, and Yu Il Shin thinks the wild pervert is coming his way. Priest Johan laughs, expressing his excitement that his whole body is shaking, unable to believe he has finally met a fellow apostle. He is about to hug Yu Il Shin, but Sword Demon quickly steps forward to stop him, warning him not to come any closer to the Sword God. Sword Demon slaps him and throws him away, calling him a trivial insect. Yu Il Shin is surprised that the Sword Demon, who defeated the Lightning Empress, was beaten by him so easily. Priest Yohan then asks Yu Il Shin about the god he follows and whose apostle he is, inquiring which god. Yu Il Shin becomes angry and tries to attack him, declaring it's the Bobble God. He uses the skill sharing lightning strike and punches Priest Johan. The scene shifts to Iraq, where one of his men goes out, thinking that Iraq will forgive him for leaving without saying goodbye. He decides to go and beat the believers of the evil god, reasoning that the fewer the believers, the weaker she will be. He approaches the black tribe, where an old ant advises him not to go deep into the woods while they play. He acknowledges the advice and the old ant notices him, asking what he is. The old ant exclaims no way. He declares that they have reached the Black Tribe village and uses his poisonous skill, stating that the Black Tribe will be poisoned to death, weakening the power of the evil god. As he observes, the people in the village start coughing. On the other side, Yu Il Shin attacks Priest Johan, knocking him out and thinking that, as expected, the one who strikes first wins as he observes him. Despite this, Priest Johan gathers his strength and gets up again. He launches another attack on Yu Il Shin with Xiang Miri's lightning skill, saying die but he starts coughing. Nevertheless, he tries to get up again. Yu Il Shin reflects that the skill of the Lightning Empress doesn't work on Priest Johan, considering whether it's because this pervert isn't just a pervert but an immortal pervert. Priest Johan laughs, stating that it's no use, as no matter what attack Yu Il Shin strikes him with, it won't work since he comes back alive again. Yu Il Shin concludes that the time for strong skills is already over, and he can't use his Lightning Strike skill either. Even if he uses it, Priest Johan will just come back to life again. He contemplates whether he is going to die in vain from Priest Johan. He urges Johan, asking if he only amounts to this much, and implores him to hurry and entertain him more. He realizes he has to figure something out and activates the multiplying thumb of God. Inner self reappears, and he thinks there's no way he'd do a team kill when there's an enemy. Priest Johan expresses disbelief that Yu Il Shin has an alter ego, noting how cool it is. Yu Il Shin reflects on the fear he felt last time when, as he was giving orders, Inner Self beat him up, so he advises Inner Self to stay quiet. Inner Self exhales and says this is trouble, while Yu Il Shin acknowledges the alter ego situation and urges Inner Self to do something, anything since he knows it's trouble. Inner Self affirms that the Gayami tribe is in danger and questions whether Yu Il Shin knows that when the believers die, all the power of a god disappears. Priest Johan, angered, comments that they are just talking to each other and asks if they are ignoring him. Inner Self takes flight to attack him while Yu Il Shin falls down, contemplating the use of all this power and everything if he dies again. Inner Self instructs Yu Il Shin to burn the weak, then disappears. Priest Johan, shocked, questions what happened and asks if he's done with his petty tricks. Yu Il Shin worries that this time, the Inner Self disappeared as he wished. Priest Johan prepares to attack Yu Il Shin, who thinks about Inner Self's words, wondering what he meant by burning. He recalls Middle Finger God's condemning skill and thinks about burning right, realizing he has his own skill, too. Yu Il Shin employs his God's condemning skill, using the middle finger to attack Priest Johan and throwing fire at him. As flames appear on his finger, Yu Il Shin reflects that it's a great size for lighting cigarettes. Priest Johan questions if this is his last trick and prepares for an attack. Yu Il Shin becomes worried, thinking about drawing this out with multiples, attempting to use the multiplying thumb of God at that flame, and throwing fire flames at Priest Johan. Priest Johan warns Yu Il Shin to stop playing around, almost attacking him. Yu Il Shin closes his eyes, wondering if this is the end, contemplating that he got team killed like a dumbass by his alter ego, never expecting his end would come from a wild pervert. He becomes emotional, stating that his life is about to end. Priest Johan attacks him, but there's no effect. 
Yuil Shin questions why his regeneration isn't working, expecting to be invincible. Meanwhile, he receives a notification that he is being consumed by Jehanna's brutal fireworks. He thinks that it has this sort of function and asks if he could please explain skills properly from now on. He observes a burn wound on Priest Johan's back, who is hurt. Seeing this, he thinks it's because of this ridiculous skill he used earlier, and it's getting annoying. The scene shifts to the Black Tribe, where a man states that the Black Tribe is being poisoned to death. He observes them in a bad state, coughing, and asserts that the evil god's strength will weaken. He blames the evil god they serve. Feeling something behind him, he looks back and asks what this feeling is. He sees inner self and thinks it's the evil god of the ant tribe. He shouts for him to come, calling him a heinous and wicked god, claiming his power will soon be reduced to nothing and gets ready to attack him. Inner Self attacks him and kills him in one hit. Inner Self descends into the village and sees people lying on the floor, asking if they are all dead. On the other side, Yuil Shin also falls down, expressing how much it hurts, feeling like every bone in his body is broken. Then, he receives a warning message that the number of believers is rapidly decreasing. If he loses a large number of believers all at once, he will lose his power. He reflects on how the God Maker alarm is going off right now, thinking it honestly sucks. Another message arrives, asking if he wishes to restore those believers with God's healing ring finger. It mentions that 5,212,385 coins will be consumed according to the number of believers. Yuil Shin thinks about this new information, realizing he never knew he was allowed to use God's healing ring finger on himself. He contemplates the potential invincibility that could come with it and decides to try using God's healing ring finger on himself. He then receives a notification that, as he has used it on himself, 10 million coins have been consumed. He thinks, wait, why is this a thousand times more expensive than the number of believers but he dismisses it, just glad that he survived. He receives a message asking if he wishes to save the ant tribe with God's healing ring finger, and he confirms. Another notification follows, stating that he has obtained 5,212,385 white god coins in accordance with the number of lives saved. He thinks it's the best kind of payback. Priest Johan sees all of this and asks how Yuil Shin is still able to stand. Yuil Shin once again tries to use skill sharing strong body, saying this is how the tables turn and employs God's condemning middle finger again. But Priest Johan escapes the attack. He laughs, acknowledging that Yuil Shin truly is an incredible disciple, and asks how he mistook him for a useless offering until now. Yuil Shin becomes angry and declares that Priest Johan is finished now. Priest Johan replies that he will devote the 999 offerings he has, and he, an offering higher than any disciple grade, is his final piece. Yuil Shin receives a notification about the descent of the God of Destruction, and wonders if this is why Priest Johan kidnapped Sword Demon and targeted him. Priest Johan thanks him for becoming his last offering and makes a hole in the roof, revealing someone there. Yuil Shin thinks he has to stop him, while Priest Johan joyfully exclaims that his God is coming. Yuil Shin uses God's crushing forefinger but gets a notification that this authority can't be used on the God of Destruction. Priest Johan starts coughing badly, saying this is different from what he promised, bleeding and eventually collapsing. Yuil Shin looks at the God of Destruction, wondering if this is the end. He contemplates whether it is a dream or an illusion. He envisions himself as a strong and benevolent God, revered by all. Recognizing the excessiveness of this perception, he acknowledges that the true name of the thousand blade that cuts all is the great god who swallows mountains, the god of destruction. He narrates how the god of destruction was betrayed by the abyss, losing the maiden that the great god loved and, consequently, the world with her. He expresses that all this happened before he lost his own life. He laments that he was once a god seeking peace but has now become the manifestation of revenge. Yuil Shin observes a huge sword and thinks it's massive vengeance. He invites it to join him in seeking revenge and notices the reappearance of the god of destruction. Sword Demon gazes at the scene, tentacles coming towards them, and wonders what on earth is happening. He feels the need to protect the sword god, but he finds himself unable to move a finger, experiencing fear and terror for the first time. Yuil Shin calls out to him, urging him to snap out of it and closely observe how he's going to kill the god that the pervert serves. Sword Demon, captivated by the spectacle, thinks it's so cool. In the midst of this, Priest Johan cries for help, denying that this is his lord and not what he wished for. Huge snakes capture him completely, and he pleads for mercy, expressing dismay at being devoured by those who serve him. The outcome transforms him into an old form. Yuil Shin asks if they now understand that the god they are serving is nothing but a ferocious demon, witnessing the snakes kill Priest Johan. 
He questions if that is right and addresses the God of Destruction, asking why he is just staring. Sword Demon reflects on how the same eye maimed Mr. Johan with just a single look, but the God of Destruction is not even flinching. Yuil Shin takes his sword and invokes the authority, Sword Mastery, an authority gifted to him by the all-slashing Heavenly Blade. This authority allows him to bring out the full power and potential of the sword, as well as mold the wielding weapon as one. He declares destruction and attacks the God of Destruction, attempting to cut some of his tentacles. He questions why the God of Destruction doesn't just leave his world and make him disappear. The scene shifts to Wuwan City, District 12, an abandoned downtown area where soldiers discover something. The director instructs them to ensure a thorough search. Hyo Kangchiao, the director of the Hunter Association, remarks that it's an SSS grade rift. And another hunter warns that a monster capable of ruining an entire country might emerge from a rift of this level. The director questions what happened in that area, and Hyo Kang Chiao suggests they might have to initiate that project immediately. Soldiers report to the director that they have found a survivor. He reaches the location, sees the survivor, and contemplates how someone managed to survive such a disaster. He asks the old man what happened there. Priest Johan starts laughing, and Hyo Kang Chiao comments that his condition is not good instructing the soldiers to get him into an ambulance immediately while recalling the entire incident. He reflects on the moment when Yu Il Shin asked the God of Destruction why he doesn't just leave his world, realizing that the guy truly is the God of all gods. The scene shifts to Xiang Mina standing before a monster. Beak Yu Haiyan expresses admiration, acknowledging Xiang Mina's skills as expected, as she easily kills the monster using mind control alone. He wonders how this is possible and questions if she is truly an S-rank. Beak Yu Haiyan notes that dragons are known to have particularly high resistance against psychic abilities, but Xiang Mina still took it down effortlessly. Xiang Mina dismisses his concern, instructing him to take care of the rest and hand her the teleportation stone. Beak Yu Haiyan, surprised, asks where she is going. She urges him to hurry up and hand it over. Beak Yu Haiyan agrees, assuring her that there is no need to get angry and scrunch up that pretty face, then tosses the stone toward her. He comments that a single stone costs 100 million won and questions if there really is a need to use it in this situation. He wonders what's really going on. She advises him to mind his own business if he doesn't want to go to hell. She explains that she was told there's going to be a dragon, so she came here immediately, only to encounter this small fry, considering it a waste of her time. She then teleports from that place. He remarks that with such a volatile temper, she's no different from a tyrant. Nonetheless, he finds it awesome that not a single person was lost in clearing an S-Class dungeon. The scene shifts two days later to Yu Il Shin's house, where Sung Yeon asks Yu Il Shin if she should stick this one here. He instructs her to move it up a little bit, then corrects her further until he's satisfied, commenting that it feels nice as she tends to his bandages. She teases him, saying he sounds like an old man. He replies that the reason he's being taken care of by his niece's cute little hands is that his uncle isn't even married yet. He thinks it's because of the rebound from the giant celestial sword lent to him, allowing him to stop the giant eye monster from getting out. Sung Yeon whispers about the scary looking uncle over there. He reflects on having to make use of his body, something he doesn't usually do, and now he's aching all over. He looks over and Sword Demon sits there. He calls him Sword Demon, and Sword Demon quickly bends down in front of him, asking if he called him. He gets scared, and Sung Yeon does as well. He asks if Sword Demon isn't going home and, by the way, questions if he was the one who fixed the broken bathroom door. He reflects that, speaking of which, this guy is the only one who can fix things without him noticing. Sword Demon confirms that he fixed the broken bathroom door because he couldn't stand seeing the almighty sword god's house in ruins. He thinks he's none other than a fanatic but quickly dismisses that description. Yuil Shin changes the subject, inquiring about the task he gave Sword Demon. He doesn't think Sword Demon has the time to be sitting inside. Sword Demon responds that he is cleaning up the remnants of the Luminous Guild, and there's no need for him to go out of his way to do that. Yuil Shin thinks about what Sword Demon is talking about, noting that the Hunter Association's special task force, headed by S-rank Hunter Xiang Mina, is dealing with them now. Sword Demon states that, in fact, it can be said that the Korean black market has practically collapsed. Yuil Shin inquires about Xiang Mina, the model who has been appearing in TV advertisements. Sword Demon confirms her identity and describes her as a real beauty. Yuil Shin thinks about Xiang Mina's name, finding it pleasant rolling off the tongue. He compares it to Xiang Miri's name and briefly considers them to sound like sisters based on their names. However, he dismisses this notion, realizing they are different based on their body types alone. This reminds him to check if Xiang Miri is alright. 
Yuil Shin gets up, puts on his clothes, and asks Sung Yeon if they should go visit her mom. She agrees, and he thinks about paying her a visit at the hospital, using the authority he has to heal her if possible. He looks at his phone and receives a notification that the calculation of godly achievements is complete. He managed to prevent the clone and the god of destruction from reaching the earth, and his god karma has gone up by one million. He becomes extremely happy to see that his god karma went up by a lot. He wonders if the god of destruction is the same eye monster he blocked from coming to earth. He contemplates the magnitude of the situation, pondering if the current size is just one out of a hundred clones. He speculates about the immense size of the Dragon of the Abyss. Another notification congratulates him for having accomplished a divine feat, making him qualified to take on a promotion quest. Yuil Shin questions what a promotion quest is and receives another message with details. It explains that it's a low-grade god promotion quest, and he can either acquire 1 billion intelligent life forms as believers or obtain 10 intelligent life forms that are S-rank or higher as believers. The message asks if he would accept the promotion quest. He thinks for a while and expresses frustration. He questions if he has to deal with both good god and evil god simultaneously. He finds the level of difficulty to be excessively high. Yuil Shin asks what, gather a billion believers or kill them. He contemplates whether he has to either gather or kill 10 s rank believers. He questions if they are instructing him to do it or not. Regardless of whether it's an evil god or a good god, he finds the level of difficulty to be extremely challenging. This is a time when he needs to get stronger, but the quest seems like a death sentence. He receives another message detailing the promotion quest. Yuil Shin thinks about the possibility of accepting both quests for both the good and evil gods. He considers that it might be ingenious to pit the stalkers on each side against each other. He envisions these individuals fighting each other to the death. He laughs, thinking about his potential genius move, while Sung Yeon looks at him. The scene shifts to the hospital, where Yuil Shin arrives in room 505 and knocks on the door. He wonders about the strange panting sound and asks if Seong Miri is there. She responds affirmatively and invites him in. Yuil Shin opens the door, enters, and wonders why the patient's voice is so loud. He observes her exercising, quickly getting up and approaching him enthusiastically, asking if he's there to visit her. Yuil Shin questions why an injured person is acting this way, and she explains that she got a bit bored just staying still. He inquires about her body, and she assures him that it's fine, showing him that she didn't even get any scars. Uncomfortable, he suggests she doesn't have to do that, but she removes her bandages, saying look, isn't it clean? Turning his face away, he avoids looking. Seong Mina arrives, sees she shows him her body, and exclaims that she's crazy before slapping her. Yuil Shin wonders where this girl suddenly appeared from, while Seong Miri comments that it hurt. Seong Mina asks why Seong Miri is taking off her bandages in front of a man and questions Yuil Shin about his identity. Yuil Shin responds by asking Seong Mina about Seong Miri's relationship with him. Seong Mina approaches him, grabs his collar, and demands to know his connection with her younger sister and why Seong Miri is behaving like this. Yuil Shin realizes that Seong Mina is Seong Miri's older sister, and that she doesn't seem like a normal person. Seong Mina reiterates that if he's trying to play around with her younger sister, she'll kill him. Seong Miri intervenes, shouting that her sister shouldn't do this to teacher Yuil Shin. Seong Mina looks at her and asks if this guy, this sloppy and beggar-looking person, is a teacher. She questions again if he is a teacher at the Hunter Academy while adjusting her glasses. Yuil Shin denies it, but Seong Miri whispers to herself that he can't tell her the truth. Seong Mina asks once again about his identity. Yuil Shin concedes, stating that she's correct, he's the physical education teacher at the academy. Seong Mina questions the idea of him being a teacher at the academy, as he definitely looks like a current hunter and she has never seen him before. She presses on, asking about his rank, expressing doubt about his abilities based on his appearance. Seong Miri defends him, insisting that their teacher is truly an amazing person. Seong Mina, annoyed, questions the theirs in Seong Miri's statement, and Yu Il Shin also wonders about it. Seong Miri clarifies that even though he may not know, he is someone who can be much stronger than Seong Mina, and she shouldn't treat him casually. Seong Mina skeptically responds, removing her cap, and he sees her face completely. Yuil Shin realizes that Seong Mina, the S-rank hunter celebrity known to be more beautiful than other celebrities, is Seong Miri's sister. She addresses Seong Miri, asking if she has lost all her fear just because she made it to a rank, asserting that she has no respect anymore. She activates her skill and mind control, commanding Seong Miri to say who is stronger. Seong Miri, under her control, obeys and admits her mistake. Seong Mina then questions what kind of hunter this weak person is and orders her to kneel down. 
Xiang Miri complies swiftly, and Xiang Mina reinforces that she just has to do what she tells her to do. Yu Il Shin witnesses the incident and suggests that Xiang Mina should calm down, as she might end up hurting the kid. Angrily, she tells him to stay away. Yu Il Shin, covering his ears, remarks that her voice is a lot louder than it looks. She attempts to control him with her mind control skill and instructs him to move while using abusive language, but it doesn't affect him. Puzzled, she wonders why mind control is not working. Yu Il Shin acknowledges that he might have crossed the line but suggests that siblings should resolve their issues through conversation. Xiang Miri observes and commends him for resisting her sister's mind control, recognizing her primary ability. Yu Il Shin reflects on the fact that Xiang Mina is a mental affinity hunter. Xiang Mina, still upset, asks for his rank, and he thinks it's embarrassing to admit that he's a G rank. She acknowledges causing an incident due to her ignorance and requests Yu Il Shin to look after Xiang Miri in the future. He is shocked and agrees, wondering about the complete switch in demeanor. She instructs Xiang Miri not to complain about the hospital food and to eat the porridge since it was expensive, pointing towards the food. Xiang Miri agrees and thanks her. Yu Il Shin observes that she unexpectedly takes good care of her younger sister. Checking Xiang Mina's details, he discovers that she is a descendant of the God of Destruction under the Curse of the Abyss. Reflecting on this, he believes he should tell her about the curse. Despite her temper, she is Miri's sister and even brought porridge for her. He approaches Xiang Mina and expresses his concern asking if she is hurt anywhere or under a curse. She questions the mention of a curse when he brings up the curse of the abyss. Becoming angry, she demands to know how he is aware of this. He becomes anxious, wondering if he made some kind of mistake, possibly due to his sensor skill. He notes her fluctuating moods as she suddenly switches back to using informal language. She reassures him that it's fine. Observing her, he thinks she's quite intimidating, akin to Janice. She announces that they will meet again soon and heads out. He agrees, telling her to take care. He reflects on the pressure of dealing with an S-rank hunter, acknowledging the formidable mental affinity she possesses. Convinced that convincing people like her to become his believers will be challenging, he finds it to be a daunting task. After a while, Xiang Miri inquires about what he's thinking. He apologizes and thinks he can't express his concerns about the future of Earth or, more accurately, his own future. Deciding to stick to his original plan, he asks if she minds going up to the roof for a moment. She agrees, expressing her interest. Once on the roof, he enters her inner world and attempts to break the chains, but his efforts prove futile. Frustrated, he questions the situation, realizing that even with his abilities, there's no change. He tries using God's crushing forefinger repeatedly, but it doesn't work. Fatigued, he reflects on how he expected it to be easier after his recent growth, pondering why it's failing. He returns to his world, feeling his strength returning. Perplexed by the difficulty, he wonders if he's approaching it incorrectly. She is requested to stand in a specific spot, and she complies. Upon checking her details, he learns that she is his first believer on Earth, having been in use for 19 years. Her electric affinity is S-rank, but part of her abilities is currently sealed. Pondering the seal, he instructs himself to concentrate on it. Curious, she inquires why he's staring at her like that. He reassures himself to focus intensely, likening it to threading a very fine needle. Realizing the reason for the seal, he mumbles about the unsealing process. She questions him, seeking an explanation. He then asks if she knows where her sister went, contemplating a sincere discussion with her guardian. Priest Johann sits in the prison of the ship and says don't worry. His apostle, when they arrive, those alive in this world will receive salvation and thinks it's like the miracle of God that he heard of when he was losing hope in life. Everything was lie salvation that was the only reason his mind and body were able to survive. And he believed in God like a madman and to think he would consider being a part of his honor. And he recalls that demonic eye monster and says he just demonic and that's not what he wanted and recalls you will shin and says however he is different. The one and only God, the God of gods and says please this world will receive salvation thanks to him so please forgive him and allow this lowly and corrupt believer to follow the great and honorable you will shin. He receives a notification indicating that he has developed faith in you will shin. Overwhelmed with emotion, he expresses gratitude for being accepted as a lost and sinful believer. Sensing someone behind him, he inquires if it's Yu Il Shin. Xiang Mina questions if he mentioned Yu Il Shin. Startled, he turns and queries her identity and how she gained access, noting that only those in at least S class should enter. He speculates that the association officers have abandoned him. Puzzled, he wonders who she is. Acknowledging the envy directed at his abilities and being aware of his past actions, he questions if this is their decision to manage public opinion. 
Although he asserts he is no longer an apostle of evil, he warns he can still pose a threat. Xiang Mina dismisses his words and accuses him of not hitting the abyss. Confused, he asks about the abyss, and she responds that regardless, she cannot forgive him for attempting to kill her sister, Xiang Miri, before launching a fierce attack. The scene shifts to Yu Shen, who is seated at his house. He remarks that it seems he never had the chance to meet Xiang Mina, speculating that her busy schedule as a top celebrity might be the reason. Dismissing the thought, he contemplates that the sword demon has finally returned home after receiving a letter from him expressing the hope that he won't come back. Upon checking his phone, he questions the godmaker about the situation. A notification informs him that priest Johan has been converted to the order of Yuil Shin by the god of destruction, and is now considered a fanatic. He reacts with surprise, wondering why Johan was converted. Another notification arrives, detailing a promotion quest that increases his normal followers by one and adds one S-class follower. He questions why he is only receiving an S-class follower when he should be beyond that level. Meanwhile, he continues to inquire about the situation unfolding around him. He doesn't know what's happening, but this is perfect, two birds with one stone. He notes that the sword demon left, and now he has an S-class follower. Wondering what happened to Johan, he receives another message indicating that Johan, his fanatic, has died. Shocked, he questions why Johan died and expresses concern about the new S-class follower being pointless. Upon checking the notification details, he learns that everything a fanatic owns becomes the property of God, and the sacrifice will be absorbed. He reflects on Johan's death, realizing that he was absorbed, and questions what's going on. Warning messages continue to appear, indicating that absorbing the sacrifice may result in excruciating pain. He asks what as he grapples with the unfolding situation. After a while, he contemplates whether he absorbed Johan's abilities, expressing frustration at the lack of clarity in the game. He questions the process of absorbing abilities from a fanatic, wondering if Johan genuinely died and how it happened. Upon seeing news that the mastermind of the black market has been found dead due to a heart attack in prison, identified as Johan, he remarks on the lack of an official announcement and questions the circumstances of Johan's death, receiving a message about his quest for lower rank good god advancement being in progress due to having one S-class follower. He acknowledges the uncertainty or relief surrounding this development. Despite the unexpected influx of godly information, he ponders the factors that led Johan to become a fanatic. He contemplates the sudden death from a heart attack, noting that despite Johan's demise, the progress is still intact. Reflecting on the death of a follower of the God of Destruction, he wonders if he should feel glad. He acknowledges his lack of understanding, labeling himself as a bad guy, and decides to cease pondering over the matter since it's already concluded. He questions what he should focus on and realizes he can utilize the authority he possesses to become a hunter, amassing wealth and glory. However, he recognizes that it's not what he truly desires. Acknowledging his identity as a writer, he believes that even if he's a third-rate writer without any current work, he achieves the best results when motivated. A few hours later, he reflects on the impact of uploading 10 chapters at once, thinking it should garner enough attention. Believing that his experience-based content will be interesting, he anticipates attracting more fanatics. As he checks the comments, he laughs and contemplates trying a different job. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door. Annoyed, he questions if it's the sword demon threatening to confront him. However, when he opens the door, he finds Xiang Miri standing there. Surprised, he asks why she's there. Seating herself on her knees, she earnestly requests a challenging favor from him, addressing him as a teacher. Yuil Shin contemplates the sparkling eyes before him, realizing he can't bring himself to turn Xiang Miri down. He agrees, receiving a message indicating that the faith of Earth Apostle Xiang Miri has increased by 10. Puzzled about the nature of the favor, he becomes nervously curious. The scene shifts to the next day at the Hunter Academy, where Yuil Shin arrives with Xiang Miri. He inquires about being her guardian as a substitute for her sister. Xiang Miri affirms this, expressing her delight with laughter, leaving him pondering the unexplained absences and why her sister isn't present. He acknowledges that he can now understand why her faith increased by 10. Xiang Miri comments on how good he looks in a suit and wonders why he doesn't wear one more often. Apologizing, he mentions having only one suit. She suggests buying him a new one, given her ample resources. He declines, advising against wasting her money, as he sees no reason to wear a suit. She playfully suggests getting him a designer sweatsuit, emphasizing the need to showcase the teacher's coolness to the world. 
he contemplates the notion of coolness, finding a resemblance between her tendency toward fanaticism and that of anti and black ghosts. Acknowledging the need to attend a meeting promptly, he urges Seong Miri to join him. They enter the meeting together. Lee Junik asks about her relationship with Seong Miri, and she responds that he's her older cousin. He comments that they look nothing alike, but she attributes it to her cousin's unconventional appearance. Suspicious, he wonders if he's been caught in a lie. Seong Miri dismisses the idea, insisting that she and her teacher look remarkably similar. Yu Il Shin thinks her lie was too transparent. He checks his details, noting he's a human male who has been in use for 33 years and possesses useful muscles. She demands that he retract his statement about their brother being ugly. Lee Junuk denies making such a comment. Yu Il Shin speculates that, given the positive evaluation, this person is likely not just an ordinary individual. He notes that the name suits the person's muscular appearance. Apologizing for any earlier rudeness, he mentions that he expected Seong Mina to be present. In response, Lee Junuk confirms this expectation. He asks if Yu Il Shin is also a hunter, suggesting talent due to shared blood with Seong Miri. Yu Il Shin humbly denies being anything more than an ordinary person. Seong Miri interjects, wanting to clarify that their brother is not just ordinary. The scene shifts to the principal's office, where Choi Kangsun sits, reflecting on the considerable amount of time that has already passed. He enters a flashback, recalling a moment when his soldier exclaimed in frustration about a gate appearing in the middle of a city, right above an elementary school. The soldier mentioned a devil ogre that posed a significant threat to Korea. They questioned if the hunters could handle such a formidable opponent. In his flashback, Choi Kangsun observed the division commander fighting and ultimately defeating the devil ogre, an S-rank sovereign monster, single-handedly. He marveled at the hunter's strength, wondering where such a powerful individual had come from considering he had never seen this hunter before. If the hunter possessed this level of strength, he speculated that the individual must be of S-rank caliber. The story unfolds in the present, and he has continuously tried to live quietly. However, because of that individual, his entire world changed, and it was from then on that people started to refer to him as Choi Kangsun, the sweeper, but he feels he's too old for that now. His duty involves delving deep into this academy to discover and foster new talent. However, the academy faces a more significant problem, Seong Miri observes while looking out the window. He notes that not only has she grown dramatically recently, but only the upper echelons of the association know that she's actually quite coddled on the inside. It's crucial that they make it possible for her to grow in an orderly fashion. In today's meeting, he'll have to address this matter properly, hoping she might come to her senses. Lee Junuk remarks that, surprisingly, he's a writer. Yu Il Shin senses a feeling that he's somehow being looked down upon. Lee Junuk says again that he may look like this, but reading is actually a hobby of his and asks if he may inquire about what sort of things he writes. He replies that he's currently writing a story about raising an ant with a mobile phone. There's a saintess ant, a muscle ant, and so on. He looks at him weirdly and asks about his muscles, and Yu Il Shin responds with an affirmative, of course, as they reach the principal's office. Lee Junuk observes that they have arrived and that this is the principal's office. He knocks at the door and informs them that student Seong Miri and her guardian have arrived. Choi Kangsun says come in, please. Yu Il Shin responds with a yes as he adjusts his tie, thinking that he's nervous. They proceed to go inside. Upon entering, Yu Il Shin greets Choi Kangsun, introducing himself as Seong Miri's cousin who has come here as her guardian. Choi Kangsun laughs and welcomes him. Yu Il Shin starts expressing concern, stating that he doesn't know what Seong Miri has done wrong. Choi Kangsun interrupts him, laughing, and reassures him that's not the case. They both recognize each other, and Yu Il Shin thinks that this person is the one who was drunk before, confirming that he's definitely S-rank hunter Choi Kangsun otherwise known as the Sweeper. Choi Kangsun also recalls the flower monster and thinks this person is from back then but then dismisses the thought, reasoning that there's no way that guy would be here. Yu Il Shin inquires if he's the drunk brother, expressing his pleasure at meeting him again in this manner. He thinks it's nice to encounter someone he knows, anticipating that this meeting might conclude quicker than expected. Choi Kangsun becomes scared and shouts for him not to come any closer. Shocked, he looks at Yu Il Shin and apologizes, explaining that he's just happy to see a familiar face, while Lee Junuk wonders why the principal is suddenly acting this way and decides to intervene for now. Yu Il Shin contemplates that an ordinary person would die after a single hit and questions why Choi Kangsun is behaving like that. Seong Miri steps forward and asks what they are doing. 
Choi Kangsun insists that she doesn't know anything, so she should stay still because they don't know when a monster will appear. Lee Junuk is perplexed, not understanding what Choi Kangsun is talking about. He realizes that the principal seems unusually scared, and more importantly, he wonders about Seong Miri's cousin and who exactly he is. Yu Il Shin questions Choi Kangsun, asking if he's really going to act this way, especially after Yu Il Shin gave him 5001 back then. This revelation startles Lee Junuk, who thinks about the significance of 5001. Choi Kangsun decides to run away, and as Yu Il Shin reassures him that he doesn't have to give the money back, Choi Kangsun jumps out of the window, leaving everyone in surprise. Yu Il Shin questions what's wrong with him. Choi Kangsun yells and runs exceptionally fast, catching the attention of Yu Il Shin, Seong Miri, and Lee Junuk, observing him from the window of the principal's room. Seong Miri comments on the principal's impressive speed, while Lee Junuk speculates that something might be wrong since he exhibited such speed when saving people the last time. He suggests it might be an occupational disease and recalls that Choi Kangsun didn't seem quite sane when he first saw him. Lee Junuk expresses confidence that the principal will return soon. After a while, Choi Kangsun returns, and they all sit together to have some tea. Seong Miri enjoys some cookies and encourages Yu Il Shin to try them. Yu Il Shin declines, saying he's fine, but Seong Miri insists he should try some. She tells him to hurry up and taste them, mentioning that she has already had a lot. He says fine, thanks, and wonders why Choi Kangsun is staring at him so intensely. He receives a message that the human follower Seong Miri has given Yu Il Shin a tribute in the form of Choi Kangsun's favorite snack. He thinks about Choi Kangsun's favorite snack and considers it a tribute while looking at the cookie. He wonders why Choi Kangsun is staring at him like that, questioning if it's because of the snack, and dismisses the idea. Yu Il Shin asks if there's something Choi Kangsun would like to discuss privately, offering to go somewhere else for a conversation. Choi Kangsun declines, insisting they all have the conversation together. Yu Il Shin thinks this situation is difficult and wonders how he's supposed to counsel them. Lee Junuk mentions they decided to call him because Seong Miri has been skipping class regularly. He acknowledges her as a bright and sincere student and suggests that Yu Il Shin keep a closer eye on her to ensure her success in school. Yu Il Shin agrees, promising to take care of Seong Miri. Lee Junuk expresses gratitude for his presence during a busy schedule. The response is a casual assurance, urging Lee to take care of Seong Miri on his behalf. Lee Junuk contemplates that it seems appropriate to conclude matters at this point. Yu Il Shin proposes his departure, receiving an affirmative response. However, Choi Kangsun intervenes, expressing reluctance to let him leave in this manner. Yu Il Shin seeks pardon, then reiterates the considerable time spent searching for him, emphasizing that it is destiny. Perplexed, Lee Junuk inquires about the nature of his statement. Yu Il Shin elaborates on the advanced equipment at their Hunter Academy, suggesting they perform a few tests together. Urging Lee to accompany him, he fervently requests him to do this favor for him. He questions the reason he should comply but then earnestly pleads with him, stating that if he agrees to take the test, he is willing to do anything for him. Lee Junuk addresses the principal, while Yu Il Shin contemplates that, given the current situation, if the principal forgives all of Seong Miri's absences and stops pressuring her to participate in training, he will consider the proposal. Yu Il Shin agrees, and Lee Junuk attempts to interject. However, the principal dismisses him, asserting that this is the perfect opportunity and instructing him to proceed. The scene transitions as Yu Il Shin enters a machine, expressing concern about the excessiveness of the situation. Choi Yunbai points out that a regular human is undergoing hunter testing, and Choi Kangsun insists that it's a one-time occurrence and is of great importance. She questions the significance of previous tests indicating a G-rank while he recalls encountering the flower monster and mentions that there is something important about it. Observing his surroundings, Yu Il Shin notices a ball and identifies it as the Orb of the Selector, currently in the possession of the Hunter Academy. It serves as a tool to assess the abilities and strength of an individual, often used to distinguish between followers and sacrifices. Reflecting on the Orb of the Selector, he considers that it must be an item worth millions of one. It possesses the ability to differentiate followers, too, and he senses an ominous feeling about it, although he can't discern why. The system instructs him to commence the test, prompting him to place his hand on the orb. He complies, and shortly after, the system declares the test is over, instructing him to exit. Upon checking his results, she expresses admiration, leaving him to ponder the meaning of impressive. He wonders if they finally recognize his greatness. He inquires about his rank, contemplating whether it might be B rank, a rank, or even S rank, given his perceived status as a god. 
She responds that he is a G-rank, detailing that it encompasses his health and intelligence, and concludes that there is nothing noteworthy. Hearing this, he becomes upset. Choi Kangsen expresses disbelief, questioning if there could be an issue with the machine. She asserts that the results have a margin of error of 0.1%. Seong Miri queries Choi Yun Bai about the closeness between the two of them. Yu Il Shin examines her details, discovering that her name is Choi Yun Bai, and she currently serves as the medical team leader at the Hunter Academy. Choi Kangsen's daughter is described as pretty but brash. Choi Yun Bai confirms their relation and mentions that at work. He prefers to be called Manager Choi by the principal. Choi Kangsen reluctantly concedes, saying, All right, fine, while Seong Miri adds, but they don't look alike. Yu Il Shin questions this, thinking that even if he's of a lower rank, he's still considered a god. He examines the details of the orb of the selector, pondering whether the machine can truly measure the powers of a god. Choi Kangsen, seeking confirmation, asks his daughter if she is absolutely certain about him being a G rank. She reassures him, addressing him as principal, while he finds it peculiar, reflecting on the events of that day and wondering how he managed to perform as he did. Choi Kangsen recollects that he was convinced he had passed out on the rooftop, contemplating the idea that he might be the type who needs to lose consciousness to manifest his powers. Considering this, he thinks that if that's the case, he just needs to induce sleep him. Yu Il Shin suggests getting something to eat on the way back, to which she agrees, and he says all right, let's go. Choi Kangsen intervenes, stating that he won't allow him to leave as they attempt to exit. Annoyed, Yu Il Shin inquires what's now while Choi Kangsen suggests sparring with him to showcase his skills, emphasizing that there's no way a machine like this can accomplish anything. Yu Il Shin questions why he should participate, noting that there's no apparent benefit for him. He contemplates the potential benefits, thinking about how both the Sword Master and Johan became fanatics after facing him. Considering the situation, he thinks that perhaps teaching this old man a lesson could earn him the S-rank follower needed for the advancement quest. Ready to proceed, Choi Kangsen approves and suggests heading to the sparring room. Lee Junuk interjects, expressing concern about the appropriateness of having the principal of Korea's legend engage in a sparring session under these circumstances. Yu Il Shin and Lee Junuk step into the boxing ring. Yu Il Shin observes the sturdiness of the ring thinking that it will effectively absorb the energy from any skills used. Lee Junuk questions whether he is really not going to wear any protective armor, to which Yu Il Shin responds that he's not wearing any either, citing the difference in experience between him and his brother. Despite concerns, Lee Junuk decides not to wear any protective armor, stating that he doesn't want to either. Yu Il Shin acknowledges that he might regret this decision, prompting Choi Kangsen to caution him not to be careless. Yu Il Shin apologizes, but Choi Kangsen reassures him, highlighting that Lee Junuk is a top B ranker with extensive real-life fighting experience, capable of taking on even an A-rank hunter. Yu Il Shin seems surprised, and Seong Miri encourages her brother, expressing confidence that he can finish the fight with a single blow. One of the students observes the sparring match, noting that it appears to be a recruitment test for a new teacher, speculating that teacher Junuk is participating. Yu Il Shin questions why everyone is gathering and decides to end the situation quickly before it becomes more chaotic. Apologizing, he asks if they can start, allowing his opponent to attack first. He finds Lee Junuk's nonchalant attitude toward the difference in ranking irritating, wondering what the principal sees in him. Determined to illustrate the reality of living as a hunter, he prepares to counter. Lee Junuk initiates the attack and both participants brace for the exchange. Yu Il Shin manages to dodge, reflecting on whether it was beginner's luck. Amused, he contemplates that this stroke of luck is about to end. Lee Junuk, undeterred, is determined to finish the confrontation and launches another attack. The students express admiration, acknowledging teacher Lee Junuk's impressive strength. Yu Il Shin activates his god's crushing forefinger technique on Lee Junuk's forehead, causing him to bleed from the nose and fall to the ground. Lee Junuk is shocked, finding it impossible that a mere G rank could defeat him to a B rank. Yu Il Shin contemplates whether Lee Junuk is truly a B rank, speculating that he might be at least in a rank at this point. Seong Miri enthusiastically praises him as her teacher and brother, asserting that he's the best. Choi Kangsen concurs, stating yeah, as expected. The students express disbelief at the PE teacher being defeated in a single blow, questioning the identity of the person responsible. Choi Yunbai notes that the person seemed ordinary, wondering how such an outcome occurred. The medical team takes Lee Junuk for treatment, and Yu Il Shin looks on, concerned about his condition. Choi Kangsen suggests that he should face Yu Il Shin next and enter the boxing ring. 
he inquires about the surprising development and checks the details of his opponent, finding that he is a male human who has been in use for 58 years. Assessing the muscular potential that could transcend, he contemplates a new approach, expressing a preference not to face such a beefy opponent. However, he sees an opportunity to make the drunkard brother a believer, deeming it even more beneficial and ultimately sweeter. Choi Kangsen, feeling somewhat annoyed, reflects on the destruction of teacher Lee Junuk, concluding that the machine was broken. However, he considers it insignificant compared to Yu Il Shin's abilities that day. Yu Il Shin confirms that he intends to make him pass out, feeling his blood pumping for the first time in a while, and then signals the start of their encounter. Yu Il Shin proposes a bet before they begin, suggesting that the loser has to fulfill a single request from the winner. He questions the idea of a bet, to which Yu Il Shin responds, stating that as long as it isn't anything illegal, it's acceptable since he is still a public servant. He assures that it won't be anything unusual, and the loser just needs to fulfill one request if they lose. Choi Kangsen, skeptical of Yu Il Shin's confidence, thinks that the young man is genuinely sure of his victory. Yu Il Shin agrees to the terms, mentioning that even if he doesn't become a believer after losing, they will have to say the keyword, as he did with Xiang Miri. He responds, agreeing to the terms and adding that if he wins, Yu Il Shin has to do him a favor as well. Yu Il Shin agrees with a smile, stating okay, let's do it, and thinking that winning is not a problem. He responds with a confirmation, and both prepare for the fight. Yu Il Shin notes that the drunkard brother is formidable, deciding to gather all his power and activating his skill, sharing a strong body. Observing the scene, students express shock and curiosity, asking who the guy is and marveling at how many skills he possesses. Choi Kangsen affirms that it is indeed him, and Miracle's words are accurate. Referring to Miracle's mention of an S-rank hunter named Yeji, Choi Kangsen confirms this and adds that she predicted the imminent appearance of the most brutal and honorable being in the world. Yu Il Shin contemplates the terms most brutal and most honorable, speculating whether Miracle was referring to the evil god or the good god. He acknowledges Miracle's incredible insight. He responds, revealing that Miracle advised him to affiliate that being with the Academy if it ever appeared. Questioning if it's the Academy, he confirms, stating that's correct. He expresses reluctance, explaining that he has to write a novel and seek promotion, emphasizing his busy schedule. He suggests that it would be troublesome to take on such an affiliation. Choi Kangsen attempts to punch him, but Yu Il Shin intervenes, halting the attack. Choi Kangsen insists on continuing to assess whether he is the being Miracle was referring to. Choi Kangsen throws a punch at Yu Il Shin, who retaliates with a kick. Both are engaged in a fierce struggle, attempting to defeat each other, refusing to accept defeat. Choi Kangsen acknowledges Yu Il Shin's skill, calling him amazing. Yu Il Shin, thinking that Choi Kangsen is S class but still worth trying, decides that he is not using his full power yet and must defeat him to have him enter the academy even if it means utilizing his full strength. Choi Kangsen dismisses the idea, insisting that he's coming in full force. Observing the intense confrontation, one student remarks that it's the principal's full power, while another student mentions the fists that have defeated monsters like balloons, questioning whether they should intervene. Xiang Miri is concerned, thinking that even teacher Yu Il Shin won't be able to withstand such an assault, and they need to stop them. However, both combatants prepare for another round of attacks. He receives a message that Number One has successfully conquered the Trial of the Flower on the 11th floor of the Tower of Warriors, and Ilho is his loyal believer and interim apostle. Number One expresses a desire to present an offering. Number One contemplates the timing and decides to deal with Choi Kangsen first before confirming anything. Unconcerned about potentially breaking an arm, they both attempt to stop each other's punches with full power when, suddenly, a flower bouquet materializes in their hands. He questions the unexpected offering, and Choi Kangsen, frightened by the sight of the flowers, recalls the flower monster and hastily retreats. Overcome with fear, he cries out for his mother, pleading for help. Choi Kangsen reflects that he hasn't fainted yet, considering the monster's appearance. On the other hand, Yu Il Shin wonders if Choi Kangsen is allergic to something. He contemplates the situation, thinking that if things continue like this, he might win, and the homeless brother could become his believer. However, upon checking his phone, he hasn't received a message confirming that Choi Kangsen has become his believer. He ponders the need to share the keyword and questions why Auntie is summoning him. Suddenly, he receives a notification that 4,210,221 non-believers wish to enter the city, 
asking if he will accept and bestow them his grace. Excited by the prospect, Yu Il Shin marvels at the increasing numbers of his believers, realizing that the quest is progressing smoothly. He decides to go somewhere quiet, anticipating further developments. Soon after, he receives another message instructing him to develop and expand the city, doubling its size, building more houses, and congratulating him on the increased number of believers. Receiving another notification about the promotion of the low-grade good god, Yu Il Shin notes that the number of his believers has increased. He mentions that he has expanded the territory based on the number of believers for now but becomes irritated wondering when he will reach 1 billion believers. Observing this, one of the black ants remarks that it seems like an exclusive greeting for Lord Yuil Shin, and another asks if that doesn't make it a divine utterance. Auntie enthusiastically shouts a divine greeting. Yuil Shin notices a message from Lord Yuil Shin and asks what it is now, to which they all respond with reverence, calling him the great and merciful Lord Yuil Shin. Yuil Shin, unfazed by the lack of restraint in language, asks where their principle has gone and what the matter is this time. Spotting Sword Demon attempting to stab him, Yuil Shin exclaims in surprise. Simultaneously, he receives a notification stating that his fanatic believer, Sword Demon, is on the verge of committing suicide and asks if he would like to save him. In response, Yuil Shin shouts suicide. Yuil Shin swiftly teleports to a position near Sword Demon urgently calling out to him and becoming emotional as he pleads for him to be saved. In response, Yu Il Shin quickly snatches the dagger from Sword Demon's possession and throws it away, questioning what prompted him to attempt suicide suddenly. Sword Demon denies attempting to take his own life, and when he notices Xiang Mina nearby, he clarifies that he almost killed himself. Xiang Mina expresses skepticism, stating that she didn't sense anything and wonders where he came from. Sword Demon explains that he can't let his guard down, indicating that the individual over there is using strange techniques. He warns that if one were to listen to her voice manipulation, they would realize that he's not an ordinary pervert. He looks at Xiang Mina in shock, asking what and stating that he's neither a guy nor a pervert. Sword Demon, surprised, asks for clarification, wondering what he means. Yu Il Shin questions why Xiang Mina is there, thinking about her motives. He checks her details, finding out that she has been in use for 24 years, and her special remarks are related to the God of Destruction. Being under the curse of the Abyss, Yu Il Shin asserts that, as mentioned earlier, he possesses sensing skills. Sword Demon reflects that the people the Sword God encounters are indeed on a different level. Xiang Mina removes her mask, and upon seeing her face, Yu Il Shin comments on her beauty, stating that he can't believe someone so attractive would resort to deceitful tricks, and he won't be fooled. Xiang Mina retorts, saying not to make her laugh, as the mask utilizes in a class cover-up magic. She exclaims that a sensing skill cannot break through an item like this. Sword Demon senses an overwhelming energy, and Yu Il Shin asks what he is doing there aside from that. Sword Demon confirms that he is there to kill a specific individual. Yu Il Shin clarifies if he means the Sword Demon, to which he responds that the Sword God, one of the ten people he mentioned earlier as those he cannot kill, is present. Yu Il Shin asks Sword Demon if he is genuinely weak. Attempting to interject, he is cut off as he continues, suggesting that, regardless of the situation, he should forgive him. Yu Il Shin intervenes, vouching for Sword Demon's character and mentioning that he may appear lacking but is actually a good person. Sword Demon questions if Yu Il Shin wants her to spare someone who tried to harm her younger sibling. Realizing that she understands, Yu Il Shin proposes that, in such a case, she should let the person live, and he is willing to take responsibility and surrender. She declares that she doesn't understand his delusions, but if he has that sorted out, it's perfect timing, as he is next in line. Yu Il Shin shouts, questioning why it has to be him. She responds, telling him not to act innocent, as Johan mentioned his name as well. Yu Il Shin mentions Johan, and she asserts that she already knows he is behind everything. She questions Johan's motives, asking for what purpose he approached Xiang Miri, pretending to save her and currying her favor, and demands to know his true intentions. Yu Il Shin finds this situation infuriating, wondering what she is conspiring. He confronts her with a question, asking why, if she truly cherishes her sister, did she seal Xiang Miri's abilities? She is taken aback, pondering how he learned this information considering if it's due to his sensing skill. Realizing that he is dangerous, she contemplates the need to eliminate him, recalling the notification about the blood seal, which indicates that Xiang Mina, cursed by the abyss, is risking her life to seal both her own life and Xiang Miri's, a situation that cannot be resolved regardless of the skill used. Yu Il Shin acknowledges that this curse belongs to Xiang Mina. 
he expresses confusion about why she would risk her life for a seal, speculating that it might be due to jealousy, perhaps because her sister is a more skilled hunter and she had to cut ties with her. Seong Mina rejects his speculation, insisting that he doesn't know anything, and employs the declaration of the apostle to launch an attack on him. Sword Demon also moves to attack her, but she swiftly employs her mind control skill, asserting that he is nothing but a bug. As a result, he falls down and sustains injuries. Yu Will Shin ponders the extraordinary nature of her ability, realizing that she seemingly just flicked him. Concerned, he asks if he's okay. In response, he is cautioned to be careful, as there is a rumor suggesting that Xiang Mina is not just an S-Class, but an SS class. Yu Will Shin contemplates her potential SS class status, contrasting it with his own G class, and wonders just how strong she truly is. Xiang Mina declares that she will cease attempting to kill him for the moment, yet simultaneously prepares to launch an attack aimed at his heart. Sword Demon urges Yu Will Shin not to die as he observes Yu Will Shin's deteriorating condition. Yu Will Shin dismisses the concern, telling him to shut up, claiming it's just a little ticklish. Surprisingly, Sword Mina questions this, and Sword Demon emotionally expresses that Yu Will Shin is indeed strong, relieved that he can survive. Yu Will Shin laughs and remarks that he can now continue to live. Meanwhile, Sword Mina reflects on her efforts, wondering where Yu Will Shin came from. She concedes that he is better than she expected but warns him that if he believes her ability is only mental manipulation, he is mistaken. With that, she transforms herself. Sword Demon, sensing a crisis, grips his sword, acknowledging the looming danger. He cautions Sword God to be careful, reiterating that, as he mentioned earlier, Xiang Mina might be an SS class. Reflecting on the official classification, he notes that the S class is the highest for Korean hunters. However, if Sword Demon is correct, Xiang Mina surpasses even the homeless guy, being incomparable to him. Xiang Mina commands a fire attack, causing them to try to escape but they sustain minor burns. During the chaos, Yu Il Shin burns his hand, and they discover a significant hole in the floor from the fire attack. Yu Il Shin is amazed by Xiang Mina's ability to execute such an attack skill in addition to her mental manipulation skill. He questions whether she is genuinely trying to kill them but wonders if that's too extreme. Xiang Mina declares them rats and indicates that she hasn't even started. Yu Il Shin realizes that she is genuinely serious. She conjures a massive water magic ball to freeze them, and they attempt to escape again. However, Sword Demon transforms into an ice statue, and Yu Il Shin's feet also freeze. Yu Il Shin contemplates Xiang Mina's ability to use attack skills freely and wonders if she is a mind hunter. He picks up on something and exclaims, Wait, this is just a mind hunter. He attempts to move his feet and break the ice. Yu Il Shin tells Sword Demon that these are all hallucinations, emphasizing that they're all fake. Xiang Mina laughs, acknowledging his correctness, stating that her ability exists in the mental realm and all the illusions are indeed just mental constructs. However, she adds that a perfect illusion is indistinguishable from reality. She gathers numerous stones to launch an attack on them. Xiang Mina holds a mountain-like illusion on her head and asserts that even if it's just an illusion if this kind of perception is imprinted on their bodies, they will die. She hurls the illusionary mountain toward them and warns that unless Yu Il Shin reveals his identity and purpose, they will face destruction. Yu Il Shin reflects that even if he tells her, she won't believe him but decides to claim that he's a third-rate writer emphasizing that even ants can be gods. He asserts that, at the moment, his priority is turning Xiang Miri into an S-class hunter. He admits to not knowing the details of the situation but requests the release of Xiang Miri. Xiang Mina responds by stating that if he desires death so much, he must be insane. And if he truly wants to die, then so be it. She proceeds to hurl another rock at them, declaring them bugs that should die. In response, he activates the skill-sharing strong body and successfully breaks the rock. Xiang Mina observes that he managed to break through her force alone, finding it insane. Yu Il Shin laughs in response, and Sword Demon also breaks his ice shield, commending Yu Il Shin as expected of the Sword God. Yu Il Shin reminds him that he had mentioned it was just an illusion, but Sword Demon didn't believe him. Sword Demon acknowledges this and bows down, offering his apologies to the Sword God. Yu Il Shin insists that he is overdoing it. Xiang Mina looks at them, surprised, thinking that the guy is just a mere G-class. Yu Il Shin punches Sword Demon, declaring that he will cut the blasphemous man's stomach open and telling him to stop with the nonsense. Yu Il Shin instructs him to stay quietly while he tends to something else, placing his foot on Sword Demon's head. Meanwhile, he addresses Xiang Mina, inquiring if she, Miri's guardian, will listen to him as he approaches her swiftly. She ponders his quick movements, questioning how he dares to do such a thing, and activates her skill. 
He interrupts her, stating that someone is still talking. Despite his objection, she activates the illusory space and throws him away. Inside the peculiar space, he looks around, questioning the nature of this place. The floor is both hard and smooth, and a pleasant breeze carries a natural scent. He remarks that he feels exceptionally good for some reason. Although the space appears empty, he senses the sound of insects on a midsummer night. Moving forward with closed eyes, he expresses the sensation of finally finding the place he has longed for, feeling like he can achieve anything. He gazes at the sky filled with stars and admires its beauty. Xiang Mina observes his appreciation and becomes angry, expressing her frustration. She activates another skill, and he questions the sudden change. She attacks him with an infinitely deep swamp, and he screams. She declares that this is his end and tells him to give up. In response, he activates his god's crushing forefinger, asserting that the skill is of no use because he quickly descends into the swamp. She reassures him that he won't die. But if he gets sucked in, his body will enter a vegetative state, and he will never wake up. He starts crying and questions if it isn't essentially the same thing. He contemplates, no, let's calm down, this is just another illusion for sure. Siang Mina asserts that this is truly his last chance. He urges her, saying, Miss Guardian, please calm down. She instructs him to say it, and he queries what to say. She places her foot on his head, demanding to know who he is and what his motive is. Attempting to speak, he struggles, and she repeats, asking if he feels like talking now. He clarifies that it's not about that. He can simply see it. She questions what, and he responds that he can see her underwear, describing it as white. He internally thinks about the impracticality of wearing a miniskirt while stepping on someone's face. She retorts with, just die and submerges him completely underwater. Feeling drowsy, he fights the urge to sleep, contemplating why she sealed Miss Seong Miri. As he battles the drowsiness, he receives a message that the condition to activate Night Blooming Rose has been met. Though unsure of the reason, a monster flower materializes behind Siang Mina, catching her attention while he feels like he's having a particularly pleasant dream. Siang Mina expresses that she didn't get to find out about his identity, and she initially thought he might have some connection to the Nether Dragon. She considers that although she didn't learn his identity, she did eliminate a potential future threat. She decides to return to reality and notices something behind the flower monster, questioning if it could be. The flower monster attempts to consume him, prompting her to run away. She reflects on the increased size of the monsters and wonders how such entities could exist in his thinking space, a place inaccessible without his permission. She ponders if the monster is responsible. Meanwhile, he sits within the rose underwater, finding it cozy, and drifts into a peaceful sleep. Siang Mina observes him, feeling frustrated that all she can do is dodge. She reflects on the overwhelming difference in power, leaving her with a sense of helplessness. She contemplates that these are the horrors of that day and insists she can't die in this manner. The tentacles of the ominous flower draw near, ensnaring her completely. She pleads desperately, stating she still has things to accomplish and can't meet her end before seeking revenge on the nether dragon. Despite her pleas, the flower moves to consume her. The scene shifts, and Yu Il-shin finds himself in front of a dilapidated building. Puzzled, he wonders about his location and recalls the recent battle with Xiang Mina. As he takes in the surroundings, he activates the blind god's eye's inherent authority, allowing him to observe Xiang Mina's nightmare. He inquires about Xiang Mina's nightmare, contemplating the revelation he witnessed regarding the reason behind Xiang Mina sealing Xiang Miri's ability. The nightmare unfolds 15 years ago, initiated by the Nether Dragon hailed as the most malevolent monster in history. This creature devoured numerous people in a single breath, including Mina and Miri's parents, leaving an indelible mark on the two sisters. He observes that the Nether Dragon recognized the extraordinary potential within the sisters and marked them for the purpose of being utilized as sacrifices. Due to the seal, Xiang Mina managed to ascend to an S-Class hunter. Post this ascension, she dedicated her life to seeking vengeance for her parents. Rumors circulated that the Nether Dragon had perished. Observing the situation, he notes that Xiang Mina harbored the belief that the Nether Dragon would return someday. However, the curse imposed by the dragon persisted, not releasing its grip on Xiang Mina. Although her power may have experienced exponential growth, it came at the cost of her lifespan. It became evident that, at this rate, she wouldn't live for an extended period. He explains the curse's nature, elucidating that it granted her accelerated power while simultaneously diminishing her life expectancy. Xiang Miri seeks reassurance from her sister, asking if she did the right thing. He points out the issue, the curse extended beyond Xiang Mina. Despite Xiang Mira's optimism about avenging their parents, he reveals that Xiang Mina attempted to undo the branding, but her efforts were futile. 
Instead, she chose to further sacrifice her lifespan to seal her sister's ability. He suggests that Xiang Mina could have prevented her sister from becoming an S-Class if she hadn't sealed her power. Xiang Miri pleads with her sister to stop, expressing pain and remorse. Despite her pleas, Xiang Mina persists in sealing her power, all the while thinking that revenge is an unrealistic dream and that she just needs her sister to understand. Overwhelmed with emotion, he breaks down in tears, realizing the depth of Xiang Mina's sacrifice. Simultaneously, he receives a message indicating that Xiang Mina, consumed by the rose blooms at night, is undergoing a mental breakdown. Another message follows, informing him that the thinking space containing him is being destroyed. Sword Demon arrives on the scene, expressing concern for Sword God's well-being. When Sword God doesn't immediately respond, Sword Demon grows even more worried. Sword God finally replies, acknowledging Xiang Mina's defeat and expressing amazement at the situation. Sword Demon inquires about his plans moving forward. After a while, the night blooming rose throws Xiang Mina into an unconscious state in front of them. Sword Demon asks if he is going to sell her off to the Hunter Association. Quickly approaching her, he attempts to wake her up and pleads for her to awaken, saying, please, wake up. She regains consciousness, and he expresses relief, thankful that she's not dead. He then asks if she's hurt anywhere. Glancing at him, she utters Mama. Yuil Shin takes Song Mina to a hut, and she sleeps calmly. Observing her, he thinks, damn it, the healing ring finger isn't working either. Checking his phone, he questions the stalkers, asking if they are watching and what he should do to cure Xiang Mina. A message suggests that a strong body will cure anything, and she needs to train her body. He responds with a firm nope, rejected, next, please. Another message, this time from All Cutting Sword of the Heavens, proposes that if she's going to die anyway, why not offer her as a sacrifice? He shouts that he didn't expect anything from him in the first place and instructs him to get lost. Then, he receives another message, suggesting that if he becomes a high-tier god, he'll be able to cure her with the power of God's healing ring finger. He dismisses this idea as well, stating that he's barely reaching a low-tier god, let alone a high-tier god, and rejects it. Meanwhile, he pauses, realizing that he doesn't really recall this, but whenever he loses consciousness after getting his ass beaten, he receives another message, indicating that he has fulfilled the criteria to bloom the original ability rose that blooms at night, gifted by Soundless Nightmare. All of this happened because the rose that blooms at night activated while he was unconscious. He wonders if he could be a genius and asks if he's right, Nightmare, and why she doesn't say something. Soundless Nightmare responds that she already ate it, and there's nothing that can be done. He asks what that means, he has to just leave her in this state. She replies that there's one way. He asks if it's really possible, annoyingly suggesting that she's telling him he has to sleep with her, and that's the only way. Soundless Nightmare vigorously nods its head. After a while, he wakes up, looks at her and covers her with a sheet, suggesting that she should sleep under it. He walks out, and she quickly gets up, asking where he's going. He replies that he's going to prepare breakfast and checks if she doesn't mind rice. He thinks there were no sexual implications included when Soundless Nightmare said that he had to sleep with her. She smiles and says she likes food. He thinks, just like how water flows from a high place to a lower place, her memories that he swallowed will flow back to her as a dream. This means he just has to share his dreams with her in the same space. He believes it seems to be working and says well then, let's check if she's okay and what's her name. Xiang Mina responds, and then he inquires about her favorite thing. She mentions her sister. He then asks about her least favorite thing. She begins to tremble and confesses that she is scared of flowers. He reflects that he has only succeeded in regressing her mental age to that of a child's and, as a result, he has been lacking sleep. She expresses her fatigue and states that she is going back to bed. Meanwhile, he comes across news reporting that S-rank hunter Xiang Mina has suddenly disappeared, with all contacts lost. It appears she may have been kidnapped. Concerned, he realizes that if she returns to the public in this state, he will face cancellation. He decides to keep himself hidden until Xiang Mina regains her senses. Deep in the mountains, he believes they won't easily find him. However, he decides to inform Xiang Miri first and heads out. Meanwhile, Sword Demon engages in sword training outside and observes Sword God emerging. He inquires if Sword God is awake and wishes him a good morning. He then asks about the progress of his training. Sword God affirms and praises the gifted swordsmanship book, describing it as a revolutionary style that breaks stereotypes. Reflecting, Sword God initially believed the lower god rank up quest would be impossible. However, upon examining the book, he thinks about the Heavenly Sword of Chen Ma, realizing that he purchased it at a high price just for Sword Demon's training. 
Honestly, he wonders how he is supposed to amass a billion believers and 10s ranked followers. Experiencing a headache, he receives a notification indicating that the possibility of transcendence for his S rank and above followers has increased by two, with the addition of Ilho and Anti. Sword Demon inquires about his well-being, and Yu Ilshin considers that he doesn't know the extent of their training. However, Ilho and Anti have advanced to S ranks, suggesting that Sword Demon also has the potential to achieve this rank. Considering the slim chance of an S rank hunter becoming his follower, he plans to elevate his current followers to S rank. That's why he invested 20 million god coins to purchase the sword book that Sword Demon recently acquired. Receiving a notification, he learns that ultimate swordsmanship involves transcending the sword itself, surpassing human limitations, slicing through the sky, and ultimately cutting down mountains. Reflecting, he admits that his fists are mightier than his blade. Despite feeling like he has been scammed, he realizes that items purchased from the Thousand Blade are non-refundable. He sits down on the floor and opens the book while Sword Demon practices with his sword. He thinks yeah, let's just lower his expectations and use potions, they are the best for growth. He hands bottles of potions, considering their effectiveness on Ilho, and expecting similar results with Sword Demon. He instructs him to drink them while he trains, bowing down and expressing gratitude. Reflecting, he thinks that this guy has watched too many historical shows. He announces that he's going to make breakfast, instructing Sword Demon to continue with his training. Sword Demon insists that he should be the one to make breakfast, but he insists that Sword Demon just follow his instructions to become stronger. Sword Demon pledges to live up to his expectations. When asked about breakfast, he contemplates recipes, saying let's see if there are any good ones. He comes across breaking news that S-rank hunter BQ Hyun issues a warning to the terrorist kidnapper, stating that if he dares to touch her, he'll twist his neck off. Shocked, he repeats, twisting his neck off. Explosions occur in the background, and they turn to look. Beak Yu Hyun stands there, questioning the whereabouts of Xiang Mina. Yu Il Shin asks if he's Beak Yu Hyun and checks his details, noting that he possesses a flame that may transcend. Sword Demon interjects, demanding to know how he dares and whether he has any idea who the person before him is. Beak Yu Hyun asks who he is, to which Sword Demon proudly declares he is the mighty sword god. Beak Yu Hyun, confused, asks the sword, God, what's that? Sword Demon expresses disappointment, stating that he expected more from someone so famous, noting that he has the eyes of a child. Yu Il Shin, thinking that Sword Demon is starting to get embarrassed, pleads for him to stop. He adds that Xiang Mina, the person he has been searching for, has already succumbed to the sword god and is now unable to live without him. Beak Yu Hyun, unable to fathom living without this person, warns that if it's what he thinks, they will all die there, growing increasingly angry. He mocks and tells Sword God to rest there, asserting that he's a fool who doesn't recognize true strength. Yu Il Shin intervenes, urging him to just shut up. Beak Yu Hyun confidently states that he will take care of Sword Demon, questioning where his confidence is coming from when he's up against an S-rank hunter. Sword Demon charges at him, declaring him an amateur, but Beak Yu Hyun retaliates, wielding his sword with flaming power and completely burning Sword Demon. Yu Il Shin observes the scene, and Beak Yu Hyun suddenly disappears, reappearing near him, putting his sword at his neck. Yu Il Shin marvels at his speed, recognizing it as teleportation. With anger, Beak Yu Hyun demands to know the whereabouts of Xiang Mina and questions the meaning behind the crazy individual's earlier statements. Yu Il Shin notices a dragon behind him, realizing it's the red dragon, the essence of Beak Yu Hyun's sword. Beak Yu Hyun, grabbing his neck, demands an explanation for what he has done. Yu Il Shin, fearing his face is going to get burned, decides to put off the flames first. He raises his forefinger to use his god-crushing forefinger skill on the dragon, making Beak Yu Hyun even angrier. Beak Yu Hyun questions how dare he point at him and expresses his inability to move, asking about the skill used. Yu Il Shin commands the dragon to vanish, and he falls into an unconscious state. Beak Yu Hyun feels perplexed, questioning what just happened and how his dragon sword broke. He asks if this is Yu Il Shin's doing as well. Yu Il Shin replies with a nonchalant what, urging Beak Yu Hyun to release his neck first. He mentions still feeling warm due to the flames from earlier, explaining his vulnerability to heat. Looking at Sword Demon, Beak Yu Hyun asks what he just said, stating that he knows he hurt him. Sword Demon, in awe, thinks that Yu Il Shin defeated Beak Yu Hyun so easily and considers him amazing. Meanwhile, Beak Yu Hyun still has a grip on his neck and identifies the skill as Agnes. Yu Il Shin responds, telling him that's enough, and mentions sharing the skill. Xiang Mina gets up and emerges, yelling for them to shut up as the noise is disrupting her sleep. 
Surprised, he looks at her and asks if she's okay, expressing his relief. She calls him a bad person emotionally and launches an attack, throwing him away and causing him to bleed. He questions why she is attacking him. Concerned, Yu Il Shin asks if she is okay. She rushes towards him, grabs him, and reassures him not to worry. Yu Il Shin agrees, and she asserts that she will protect him from the bad person. He wonders about the sudden hug. Beak Yu Hyun looks at her with a heartbroken expression and says Siong Nina, don't ever get hurt, okay. Yu Il Shin acknowledges her, saying yes, sister, and reflects on how he nearly referred to her as a sister. He contemplates the rumors about the two of them dating, imagining the challenges of having a girlfriend who can't recognize her and has regressed to her childhood self. He gazes at Beak Yu Hyun and decides to let this one go, feeling sympathy for him. Using his god's healing ring finger skill, he heals Beak Yu Hyun, who acknowledges that he has been healed, receiving a notification about the opponent's cause and effect principle calculation. Yu Il Shin notes that Beak Yu Hyun being healed indicates the possibility of transcending. Despite being an 8th place, low ranking being, Beak Yu Hyun possesses the potential for transcendence, leaving Yu Il Shin intrigued by this possibility. After a while, he receives another notification stating that 100 coins will be used in exchange for the healing. He thinks crap, a hundred coins, considering it pricey for an S-Class. However, he sees it as an opportunity to increase the number of S-Class followers. Observing BQ Hyun's eyes, he contemplates that he looks like someone who would give him his liver if asked. Examining BQ Hyun's eyes, he believes that if he handles this well, he might gain him as a follower. He decides to give it a try. BQ Hyun asks if he just healed him. He looks at his body and acknowledges the remarkable healing ability. Reflecting, he resolves to establish a good relationship with him first. He addresses Beak Yu Hyun, suggesting there has been a misunderstanding, and calls him to come closer, intending to explain the situation. Meanwhile, they observe three helicopters approaching, and Yu Il Shin wonders if he isn't alone. He asks Beak Yu Hyun if he can come with his subordinates. Beak Yu Hyun denies it, stating that he came alone. Yu Il Shin, considering the situation, thinks that Beak Yu Hyun probably wouldn't lie, so he questions who those individuals are. Seeing a large group of them, he speculates whether there is a reward for his head or if it's the Hunter Association's investigation team or whoever they might be as they come closer. He finds the situation increasingly annoying. The team members from the association jump from helicopters, catching Yu Il Shin's attention. Observing the considerable number of them, he notices Choi Kangsin among them and wonders why the principal is wearing such an expression. He realizes that the news might be portraying him as the kidnapper, and even Seong Miri is present. Seong Mina spots Seong Miri, exclaims that she is Seong Miri, and runs towards her. Yu Il Shin contemplates how to begin explaining the situation given the easily misunderstood circumstances they find themselves in. Reflecting, he recalls relaying everything exactly as it happened, including the part where Siang Mina sealed Miri's abilities. Siang Miri becomes emotional, understanding the reason for the seal, and expresses gratitude to her sister for risking her life. They share a hug, and Siang Mina encourages her to stop crying, questioning why she is doing so. Siang Miri confesses her love for her sister, and they share a heartfelt moment of wiping away tears, smiling, and expressing mutual love. Choi Yunbai says, please take this and hand a card to Yu Il Shin. He questions if it's a license for a class B awakened and wonders why she's giving it to him. She explains that, although he's a G class in terms of stats, with the principal's guarantee, and the monster flower he summoned, his ability to summon bizarre monsters was highly evaluated, leading to the B class license. The mention of the flower monster makes Seong Mina and Choi Kangsun visibly anxious. Choi Yunbai clears her throat and continues, suggesting that his skill in summoning unusual monsters was the reason for the B class designation. Reflecting on terms like flower monster and bizarre monster and recalling the night blooming rose, Yu Il Shin considers the implications. Choi Kangsun then asks why he doesn't work with them as a B class, mentioning that he could teach at the academy. He responds, questioning why he would do that, and reflects that he has to raise ants. Even if he's just a third-rate novelist, he still has to write, and he also has to raise S-class believers. Besides, he is a busy person. Choi Kangsun persists, offering to double the starting salary, and he asks how much that would be. Choi Yunbai provides the figure, including the principal's special budget for operational salary, and he marvels at the number of zeros involved. Contemplating the offer, 
he thinks about becoming an academy teacher, acknowledging that it has been a lifelong dream for him to teach. Excitedly, he grabs Choi Kangsun's hands and eagerly inquires about the start date. After a while, Seong Miri arrives at the academy, where Gong Myung Jai notices her apparent happiness and asks if something good has happened. She confirms that, indeed, something good has occurred, mentioning the arrival of a very special person. Yi Will Shin enters the classroom, takes his place at the lectern, clears his throat, and draws the attention of the students. One of the disciples whispers, inquiring about his identity, and another student mentions that he's the guy who defeated teacher Lee Junuk with a single hit, prompting curiosity about the person accompanying him. Yi Will Shin greets everyone, explaining that since Mr. Junuk is on sick leave, he will be their temporary homeroom teacher. The students start whispering among themselves, prompting Sword Demon to intervene. He instructs everyone to quiet down and introduces Yu Will Shin as the teaching assistant. Sword Demon emphasizes the honor of receiving teachings from the great Sword God, urging the students to recognize the significance of this opportunity. After a while, Yu Will Shin announces that it's their first class. A student points out that it's P. Teacher Lee Junuk's class. Yu Will Shin acknowledges this and decides to turn it into a self study period. Feeling fatigued and noting the small room, he contemplates the presence of teacher Choi Kangsun and even Beak Yu Haiyan, then rests his head on the desk. Sword Demon warns everyone not to make even the slightest noise, emphasizing that whoever dares to interrupt the Sword God's sleep won't be forgiven by Yang. Curious, a student questions the name Yang, finding it childish, and another one whispers that the energy emanating from him is at least that of an A-class. They agree to quiet down and proceed with the self-study. The scene shifts to the next day, and Yu Will Shin arrives at his class. He addresses the students, mentioning their upcoming exams and suggesting they engage in some self-study. The following day, he remarks on the heavy rain, deciding that, on days like these, self-study is unavoidable. The next day after that, he notes the beautiful weather and suggests another day of self-study. Go Myung Jai expresses frustration, wondering what's going on as they've been doing nothing but self-study for the past four days. Yu Will Shin remains seated, lowering his head onto the desk. Suddenly, his phone rings, and he retrieves it, thinking about the teacher who plays a game involving ants while asleep. Later, they all go to the mess for lunch, and Yu Will Shin expresses his satisfaction with taking the job, mentioning the added benefit of free food. The other students look at him in surprise. Meanwhile, Yu Will Shin comments on Go Myung Jai's small portion, questioning why she eats so little when the food is free. Go Myung Jai thinks to herself, calling him a deadbeat and a salary thief. Seong Miri, observing the scene, expresses excitement, noting how happily their teacher is eating. Go Myung Jai is baffled, wondering what's so good about a sloppily dressed uncle who only insists on self study. As they leave the mess, Seong Miri asks about teacher Yu Il Shin, asserting that only she needs to understand how charming their teacher is, and laughs. Irritated, Go Myung Jai questions what she's saying. Seong Miri mentions her sister and teacher waiting for her, checking her phone and announcing that she's leaving first while running off. She questions whether Seong Miri is meeting that guy after school hours as well and feels she can't bear to watch this any longer. Determined to get her friend out of this situation, she contemplates wrestling with whatever obstacles are clouding Seong Miri's eyes. The scene shifts to the next day, where Yu Il Shin stands near the wrestling ring and informs the students that, instead of self-study, they'll be doing some sparring exercises. He suggests pairing up with whomever they like. Go Myung Jai sees this as an opportunity and plans to use her abilities to beat him. However, he yawns, and Yu Il Shin, addressing Sword Demon, declares that he's leaving the rest to Mr. Sword Demon because he's sleepy. Sword Demon agrees, stating that his wish is his command. Go Myung Jai is baffled, thinking about how it's not different from self-study if he arranges sparring exercises but then goes to sleep. He walks away, commenting that the place looks good. She calls after him, saying teacher, wait, and he looks at her, asking what. She mentions that she doesn't have a partner. He asks what and thinks about the 21 people in the class, realizing he hadn't considered that because he wanted to sleep. She expresses that she would like him to be her partner. Sword Demon interjects, questioning how she dares to want the Sword God as her opponent. She asks why, wondering if it's too much to ask for him to be a sparring partner. She challenges him, asking if he's scared. He calls her a brat. Yu Il Shin intervenes, requesting Mr. Sword Demon to be quiet and stating that he will be her partner. He recalls Choi Yun by mentioning a salary deduction and making him pay for lunch if he doesn't put effort into this, so he decides to at least pretend he's working. She thinks to herself that she can still hear everything even if he says it quietly, labeling him a damn deadbeat teacher. They both enter the wrestling ring, 
Go Myung Jai exclaims that he's a loafing salary thief and vows to beat his ass. Yu Il Shin thinks about the foul language and acknowledges that he would still be able to hear every word even if it was mumbled. Reflecting on Go Myung Jai's identity as Seong Miri's best friend, he realizes that he can't say much even if she calls him a loafer and a salary thief since he has been sleeping during class, but there's a reason for that. The scene shifts to this morning, and Yu Il Shin gets up, complaining that his head hurts. He recalls giving up his bed for the two sisters, Seong Mina and Seong Miri, for the sake of Seong Mina's treatment. He hasn't been able to get a wink of sleep because of these idlers, noticing Choi Kangsun and Beek Yu Hyun lying on the floor while Seong Mina and Miri sleep on his bed. Observing the bottles of alcohol, he reflects on the fact that these guys are S-class hunters, and he thinks that the future of South Korea looks bleak. He taps on Beek Yu Hyun's face and says excuse him, why don't he go sleep at his own house? He comments on calling him an S-class and notes that he's not even budging. Yu Il Shin thinks about these two idlers staying in his place for a week now, drinking every single day. The scene shifts to the day before officially going to work. Choi Kangsun congratulates Yu Il Shin on getting a job, suggesting they should drink on a day like this. Beek Yu Hyun also congratulates him and asks him to take care of Seong Mina. Yu Il Shin reflects that this was the beginning of the past week when it rained. Despite concerns about hindering Seong Mina's treatment, they decided to have some drinks since it was raining. As they reach his home with a lot of drinks, Seong Mina encourages drinking again, expressing that she likes it because the guys look dumb when they're drunk. Yu Il Shin contemplates whether it's unfortunate or not but acknowledges that it's a good thing Seong Mina likes these idiots, and the two idlers eventually fall asleep. After a while, Seong Mina tells Yu Il Shin that she's hungry and asks for food, thinking that he still has to be on feeding duty. The god's blades vibrate, and he comments that here they go again, asking them to please stay still. She notices it and asks what it is. He replies, telling her to ignore it and that it's just a kitchen knife. He assures her that he'll make her some kimchi fried rice. Excitedly, she says she likes the sound of that and requests a fried egg, too. They head to the kitchen. In his thoughts, Yu Il Shin reflects on drinking all week and taking care of Miss Seong Mina at the same time, leaving not enough time to sleep. A news broadcast reports that an S-class hunter named Sergi, a naturalized Russian-born citizen, was killed in Gangwon-do, indicating the emergence of a disaster-grade monster. Choi Kangsun expresses that they would have anticipated this if Miracle were here, but mentions that Miracle had to be unconscious at such a critical moment. He comments on Sergi's unfortunate death. Meanwhile, Beek Yu Hyun says to take a look at this photo and shows his phone to Choi Kangsun. The photo depicts Sergi writing something on a wall with blood. Choi Kangsun asks about the curly handwriting and questions if it's a will left by Sergi. Beek Yu Hyun responds that, according to the analysis team, it's not Sergi's handwriting. It's written in an African language, stating a sacrifice to God. Choi Kangsun gets up, suggesting they go before it's too late. Beek Yu Hyun also gets up, agreeing and using his teleportation skill, and they both disappear. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin and Seong Mina cook food. He informs her that the kimchi rice is done and asks where the two idlers went. She responds, wondering where the idiots went. He gives her food and says he'll go find out. In the meantime, he suggests that Miss Seong Mina finish her meal and then get ready for school. She declares that she loves teacher Choi Yoon by the most. Meanwhile, he reflects that whenever they go to school, he always leaves her with teacher Choi Yoon by, considering it the best for both Miss Seong Mina and himself. Recalling a moment in the wrestling ring with Go Myung Jai, he thinks about how he had promised to work hard tomorrow, but there's no helping it. He checks her details, finding out her name is Go Myung Jai, and she is a 19-year-old female human. Notably, she possesses useful necromancer skills. Pondering on necromancer skills, she announces that she'll start now, addressing him as a teacher. She instructs him to open his eyes to his subordinate, Hades. He thinks about Hades, the king of the underworld in Greek mythology. She activates her skill, Spirit Summon, and calls forth a giant monster. He checks the details of the summon giant zombie Hades, noting that it is a summon ranked seventh in the underworld and has been in use for 1,100 years. Meanwhile, he reflects that she uses her necromancy skills to handle zombies, and it seems like this will be a lot of fun. As she tries to attack him, he quickly activates his skill, Steel Body, and giant zombie Hades refrains from attacking him. She questions Hades, asking what's wrong and urging it to attack, wondering if it has gone crazy. However, giant zombie Hades bows down in front of him, stating that this fallen and lowly being is honored to meet the great and supreme existence. She asks Hades what it's doing and demands it to hurry and attack, pondering how this ridiculous thing happened. 
A member of the audience wonders what's happening. And another person remarks, wow, he subdued Go Myung Jai's summon without even lifting a hand. Sword Demon praises the zombie, saying well done on recognizing the greatness of the sword god. Seong Miri laughs and comments that's also what she thought, that their teacher is really so cool. Go Myung Jai starts beating Hades, urging it to move, while Yu Il Shin thinks she's a bit pitiful, their squirrel-like student. He contemplates the idea of pretending to fight while looking at Hades. Hades replies, protesting that he dares not move, as faint as it might be. He can feel the strength of his master, the mountain-crushing giant, from him. He implores him to take back those words. Yuil Shin mentions the mountain-crushing giant, feeling like he has heard that name a lot from somewhere. He checks Hades' details again, discovering that he used to be a knight who served the mountain-crushing giant. After falling many years ago, he has now become an emaciated zombie with only his skin left. Yuil Shin realizes this and asks if he served that guy as a knight. Without even realizing it, he recalls placing his hand on Hades' head as if he were the mountain-crushing giant. Soon, Hades' past floods his head like surging waves. Hades' appearance looked nothing like the zombie he is today, as the giant gods night out of admiration. Hades failed to protect the priestess and ended up losing his life. Hades became a zombie phantom full of resentment, wandering endlessly throughout the underworld for a thousand years until Go Myung Jai summoned him. He remarks that it's so touching and receives a notification that he possesses the mountain-crushing giant's divine power. He has satisfied the conditions for believer succession and is asked if he would like to collect the fallen knight of the mountain-crushing giant. He confidently responds, of course, that's a given, and what's there to worry about and affirms yes, of course. He receives another message congratulating him on successfully inheriting the mountain-crushing giant's believer, making giant zombie Hades the third believer of the earth branch. It will take a lot of divine power, but evolution is possible. He inquires about the concept of evolution, to which he's informed that the result is unknown, but based on the current atmosphere, it should be something good. Another message prompts him to decide whether he'd like to use his divine power to evolve giant zombie Hades. He agrees and activates his divine power on Hades, who screams. Siang Miri exclaims that this is a miracle, truly the best, and Sword Demon expresses his honor to witness a miracle created by the Sword God. Yuil Shin acknowledges that this is an evolution. Giant zombie Hades transforms into another monster, and Yuil Shin receives a message congratulating him on giant zombie Hades evolving into Knight Paladin Hades. Sword Demon acknowledges the incredible miracle created by the Sword God, expressing amazement. Siang Miri also shares in the happiness. Another notification reveals that Knight Paladin Hades is classified as a Dark Paladin with the special note that he has the potential to transcend. Knight Paladin Hades bows down, expressing gratitude for the grace and pledging to become Lord Yuil Shin's shield. A quest notification follows, indicating the promotion progress for the lower grade good god, with S class and beyond believers having a 4% probability to transcend. Go Myung Jai observes that Hades has changed and can even talk now. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin feels a sudden dizziness and almost falls down. His followers rush to support him, with Knight Paladin Hades holding him. Sword Demon expresses concern over Yuil Shin's pale face, wondering what they should do and why this sudden change has occurred to the Great Sword God. Yuil Shin reassures them that he has only fallen asleep, checks his body, and finds nothing wrong. Siang Miri also expresses concern, while Sword Demon, overcome with emotion, bows down and wishes for him to sleep well, pledging to stand guard until he wakes up. A notification informs Yuil Shin that he will need to consume his divine power for his believer to evolve. He contemplates that he used up more power than he thought, considering it normal given the evolution process. In his dream, he lies down in Nunim's lap in the fields, surrounded by abundant scenery. He acknowledges the ability to meet the beings he has only interacted with directly through the status windows. A notification from endlessly granting abundance informs him that he used up a substantial amount of divine power, advising him to rest well for recovery. Grateful, he thinks about how good this feels, wondering if he's in heaven. However, he remains unaware that, during his rest, a malevolent being is approaching. In teacher Choi Yunbai's office, Seong Mina sits with her, eating candy and expressing her boredom. She wonders when Seong Miri and Yu Il Shin's classes will end, anticipating the fun of playing with them. Excitedly, she opens her bag, retrieves something, and smiles, stating that she foresaw this and secretly brought the item. She announces her intention to play with it now, asking if anyone is there and if they want some candy. The mysterious thing moves, and she teases about not sharing the candy. 
Choi Yunbai observes her and reflects on how she prefers Xiang Mina's old self despite her rudeness. She also contemplates the significance of the events involving her father and Mr. Beak Yu Haiyan and Gang Wen Du, wondering if it's a big deal. She looks at her again and comments that Miss Xiang Mina would have been a huge help if she were in her normal state of mind. However, she notices her candy falling down, causing her to become angry, and she sadly gets up. Choi Yunbai swiftly grabs her, assuring her that they still have plenty of candies left. Xiang Mina, however, hugs her and expresses fear. Choi Yunbai tells her to calm down and asks what has made her so scared. She mentions that a monster has come to swallow her. Gustav arrives at the academy, examining the building. He thinks about the two sacrifices hiding inside, sown by the abyssal dragon. However, he wonders why one of them is not ripe yet, reflecting on Xiang Miri. Determined, he enters the building, catching the attention of a guard. The guard, along with another, wonders about the identity of the man. As Gustav approaches, the guard decides it might be troublesome if he enters wearing that kind of outfit and places his hand on the man's shoulder, requesting to see his ID. He responds arrogantly, daring these insignificant beings, and swiftly cuts the guard's throat upon the request to see his ID. Other guards witness this and exclaim that he's a crazy who doesn't understand the significance of this place. They run towards him to attack, but he skillfully eliminates them as well, stating that they are all sacrifices to God. A warning alarm blares throughout the building, signaling a red alert due to the intruder. He dismisses the noise, declaring that there are only two sacrifices to God, and the rest are mere trash. As students prepare to confront him, forming a defensive stance, they express frustration about the absence of the principal. Activating his powers, he effortlessly stops all their attempts to attack. Xiang Miri and Sword Demon arrive on the scene, observing the unfolding situation. Locking eyes with Xiang Miri, he declares that he has found one of the seeds sown by the Abyssal Dragon, the unripened sacrifice. With a sinister smile, he proceeds to attack the other students to reach her. The students attempt to attack him while one of them questions who he is. Meanwhile, Gustav gathers rocks, proclaiming that loud little parasites should die, and kills them all and attacks Xiang Miri and Sword Demon as well. But he blocks his attack with his sword, and he says a parasite dares to block his attack. An announcement is made urging everyone to evacuate immediately to the bunker. The principal and the S-class hunter will arrive in 10 minutes, and the message emphasizes the importance of evacuating to the bunker instead of confronting the villain. Xiang Miri requests moving Mr. Yu Il Shin to the bunker, expressing her intention to fend off the attacker for 10 minutes. Sword Demon mentions that Hades will handle it himself. Gustav laughs, claiming it's impossible, and then transforms into an alligator monster. He roars, and Xiang Miri and Sword Demon observe the transformation, with Xiang Miri asking what this is. Gustav performs some magic, creating a shield around the building and warns 10 minutes, don't even dream of support, the insects. Meanwhile, she inquires if that is a territory barrier and comments that only Lord class monsters like the Nether Dragon can do that. Sword Demon advises her to run towards the bunker, emphasizing that it's the only option they have right now, and he'll distract that alligator. Gust have queries where they are going while running behind them. Sword Demon attacks him with his sword, but it breaks in an instant, throwing him away. Gustav questions how he dares and asks where the sacrifice has gone, searching for Xiang Miri. She emerges from behind and uses her lightning skill to attack. Choi Yunbai and Xiang Mina hide inside the bunker. Choi Yunbai asks if there is something wrong with Xiang Mina while she's shivering. Xiang Mina responds Xiang Miri's in danger and then disappears. On the other side, Xiang Miri attempts to fight with Gustav while Sword Demon shouts at her to watch out. However, Gustav quickly captures her, and she screams in fear. Sword Demon coughs and starts bleeding, apologizing to Sword God. Gustav puts her on the floor, and she continues to scream. He asserts that she can't escape from being a sacrifice, and a tentacle comes out from his hands, attempting to attack her as she calls for Yu Il Shin. Xiang Mina arrives and activates her mind control skill on Gustav, who remarks that the Nether Dragon Seed came here on her own. Looking at her, Xiang Mina thinks the skill didn't work, but the box in her bag says way too loud. She throws her bag away and says shut up, and her sister is about to die. She attempts to use the mind control skill again, but he captures her with his tail, stating that he will sacrifice her in a bit. She screams don't touch her sister, while he says they will begin the ceremony, and his hands again go to Xiang Miri. Demonic hand attack her while she says she's scared, please save her, and Xiang Mina also becomes emotional, saying please save her sister, and calls out to Yu Il Shin, 
who lies down in No-Nim's lap in the fields. Still, he opens his eyes. Yuil Shin says what's that and gets up, stating that he thinks he has to go now. No-Nim gets a notification that Tears of the Bountiful Abundance says his divine power has yet to fully recover, and she is worried that he might die to the God of Destruction's Apostle if he goes now. He thinks he has to at least do something and reaches the academy. He picks up Seong Mina's bag while both she and Seong Miri cry for help. Gustav says the blood ritual is done, and he will now offer the sacrifice to God. Yuil Shin reaches there and cuts Gustav's tail while he cries about his precious tail. Yuil Shin quickly picks her up and takes her away while she looks at her. He gets a notification that Apostle Gustav is 85 years old, an SS class in charge of the harvest, and he was raised by the God of Destruction. He leaves her away and takes God's blade, walking towards Gustav. Gustav asks who he is and how dares he come here and roars while he also runs towards him and says he wants to cut him up. He quickly attacks Gustav, moving from here to there and reaching his face, stating he wants to cut him up even more. Gustav throws him away, but he gives another cut on his leg as well. Meanwhile, Sword Demon observes this and remarks that it's the swordsmanship he wants to emulate. He delivers numerous cuts to Gustav's body, preventing him from getting up. Sword Demon then questions if that's all Gustav has, referring to him as an alligator. Gustav responds that he is indeed strong, but what Sword Demon witnessed wasn't the extent of his abilities. Gustav activates more demonic powers, stating that it's going to be an enjoyable experience. In response, Sword Demon expresses excitement, stating that slicing Gustav up will be even more entertaining. Gustav claims that by sacrificing himself, he can make the Great God happy, showcasing the power bestowed upon him by the Great God of Destruction. Sword Demon challenges Gustav to reveal any hidden powers, emphasizing that slicing him up would be more enjoyable in that case. As Sword Demon receives a message, he learns that Perpetual Truth Seeker is disappointed in him for using a sword instead of utilizing his great muscles. Additionally, he receives a message from Soundless Nightmare who cheers him on with cannibalistic flowers in both hands. After a while, he exhales a breath and considers these little stalkers to be useless. He ponders over the situation, wondering what is happening, while Gustav undergoes a transformation, turning into another monster. He dismissively thinks that's all Gustav has to offer as he cleans his nose. He leaps to attack Gustav, attempting to cut him, but his blade proves ineffective against Gustav, who identifies himself as Sword God. Undeterred, he makes another attempt, expressing his refusal to accept defeat and vowing to cut Gustav. However, Gustav counters by grabbing his hand, asserting that his sword can't penetrate his divinely given skin. Gustav proceeds to punch him and throws him away. Unable to move, he watches as Gustav approaches, grabbing him by the head. Gustav asks how it feels to experience the power bestowed upon him by God, and a tentacle emerges from his hand as he prays for God to accept the appetizing sacrifice he offers. As Gustav nearly kills him, he attempts to use his God's healing ring finger, but a warning notification informs him that he lacks sufficient divine power to activate the skill. Another warning notification follows, indicating that death is imminent. Yuil Shin notices his vision fading as Gustav attempts to kill him. Suddenly, Knight Paladin Hades appears from behind Gustav and engages in a fight with him. As they battle, Yuil Shin reflects on whether he has become too arrogant since becoming a god. He contemplates the idea that it would have been more characteristic of him to simply run away, regardless of who was dying. Ilho shouts for Yuil Shin to regain his strength, observing him in a worsened state. Anti also prays for his recovery urging him to regain his strength. Yuil Shin perceives the desperate voices and tears of his followers, feeling a connection to their emotions. Seong Mina, Seong Miri, and Sword Demon express sadness and implore him not to die. Sword Demon apologizes, lamenting his own perceived weakness. Yuil Shin recognizes that the earnest wishes and tears of his followers have affected him. He receives a notification indicating that a portion of his divine power is being restored as a result of the tears and prayers of his followers. Meanwhile, the demonic hand declares its intention to sacrifice him to God, and he receives another notification that the skills of Sword Demon and Hades have been added through skill sharing. He opens his eyes and uses his god's blade to cut through the demonic hand, prompting Gustav to scream and retreat. He explains that he used the skill share Sword Demon's heavenly demonic god sword for just one second. Beak Yu Hyun and Choi Kangsun arrive at the scene and attempt to break the shield, but they find it impenetrable. 
Beak Yu Hyun remarks that he can't get through the barrier, and Choi Kang Sen expresses frustration, stating that his skills are ineffective. Enraged, Choi Kang Sen curses Gustav, noting that he has gathered all of Korea's S class and A class hunters in Kang Wen Du. Beak Yu Hyun suggests that if they had a miracle, they could break through the barrier. Gustav questions what he is doing, to which Yu Il Shin replies that he wants to slay him. He inflicts numerous cuts on Gustav's body, and during the fight, his god's blade also breaks. Inquiring about the situation, Gustav asks what Yu Il Shin just did. Yu Il Shin calmly responds that he has already been slain and laughs. Gustav, in pain, accuses him of being a psychotic man, questioning whether he deceived him. In an attempt to resist, Gustav tries to punch Yu Il Shin and run, but he feels something in his belly gets cut into two pieces, and screams in disbelief, expressing his frustration at losing to someone like Yu Il Shin. With Gustav defeated, the shield breaks, allowing them to enter. They witness Gustav fall in front of Yu Il Shin. Gustav calls him a lowly parasite and questions what he has done to him. Seeing Yu Il Shin's powers, Gustav wonders if this is his true self and regrets not running away when he first sees him. As Gustav contemplates, he refers to Yu Il Shin as not just a person but a great being and then he disappears. Yu Il Shin receives a notification that the follower of the God of Destruction, Gustav, has been slain, and he absorbs the sacrifice. Another notification follows, congratulating Yu Il Shin, stating that Gustav is a sacrifice worth 5S class. He takes a seat while receiving a message about the quest Low Class Evil God promotion in progress, indicating that the sacrifice involves an S class possessing transcendence potential, with a current count of 2 out of 10. Choi Kangsen, Beak Yu Hyun, Sword Demon, Seong Mina, and Seong Miri rush towards him, tearfully pleading that he cannot die like this. Meanwhile, Knight Paladin Hades arrives and reassures them that the master is only asleep, checking for signs of breathing. They all look at him in surprise as he enters a dream, finding himself in a place that he recognizes as a soundless nightmare. Opening his eyes, he realizes he is in the mouth of a man-eating plant. Having been consumed by a stalker, a message from Soundless Nightmare informs him that once his body liquids are fully absorbed, no curse or poison will harm him. While he finds this comforting, he begins to doubt its effectiveness due to the extended duration. In response, she mentions that there is only one last punch remaining. Perplexed, he questions the reference to a punch, and a branch of the flower punches him inside, prompting him to scream for help. He swiftly regains consciousness in the hospital, where Seong Mina is seated nearby. She inquires if he's awake and mentions that he has been asleep for an entire week. He reflects, thinking a week, and it's only been a week. There is no way. Seong Mina moves closer, noticing his sweat and expressing concern about whether he's okay and if he had a bad dream. He assures her that he's fine, expressing gratitude for her concern. He receives a congratulatory message notifying him that Seong Mina's wish has come true and she has become his fourth follower. The message indicates that Seong Mina is a strong follower worth 2S classes. Another message about a quest arrives, stating that the sacrifice for an S class possessing transcendence potential is now at 5 plus a tenth. He gazes at her with a smile, realizing that she has become his follower. Curious, Seong Mina asks what he's looking at, and he receives a message reminding him that she is now his follower, suggesting that he should try asking for a kiss as she might be happy to comply. Contemplating a kiss, a large shark suddenly breaks through the wall and enters the room. Seong Mina promptly sits on his lap, exclaiming that another monster has appeared, and she's scared. Observing the shark, Yu Il Shin receives a notification that Ilho has offered a substantial fish as a tribute for him. Excitement courses through him, and he expresses gratitude, saying, Dear Yu Il Shin, please feast on this and feel better. Pondering Ilho's actions, he wonders about his friend's intentions. Choi Kangsen enters the room, questioning what has happened and expressing confusion over the presence of the shark. Soon after, Sword Demon and Seong Miri also arrive, both shocked by the sight of the shark. Concerned for Yu Il Shin's well-being, they inquire if he is okay. In response, he proposes having shark fin for lunch for all the students and staff, activating God's crushing forefinger to eliminate the shark. He adds that it's a direct delivery from the source, and he intends to cover the expenses for the shark. A few days later, the scene shifts, and Yu Il Shin returns to the academy for teaching. Nervous, he opens the classroom door and enters, prompting the students to start whispering. One of them remarks that the teacher is the association's secret weapon, 
pointing out that S-Class Xiang Mina is always with him and mentioning that he was the one who killed the SS-Class monster when they were in the bunker. Another student agrees, stating that the principal won't talk about it, but everyone knows. Yuil Shin reflects on being able to hear all of them. Sword Demon forcefully places his sword on the floor, declaring that everyone has finally realized the greatness of the Sword God. Go Myung Jai stands up and instructs everyone to put their arms to the side and greet the teacher. Yuil Shin realizes that she is the classroom president, a fact he had not been aware of before. After a while, they all bow down and greet him. Yuil Shin becomes emotional, thinking they've never greeted him like this before. Regardless, he is glad to see the students looking much happier after the Gustav incident. He greets them, saying it's been a while, and initially plans for a self-study session while he works on his overdue drafts. However, reconsidering, he decides against it, as they seem poised for an uprising if he goes through with it. He lightens the mood by joking about self-study, suggesting it as a form of counseling, and announcing that they will have one-on-one -on -one counseling today. All the students gather at the counseling office door as he calls in the first student, Hyojiyo. She enters, responding with a polite yes, teacher, while he checks her details. Noting that she is a 19-year-old female human with a seemingly healthy appearance but undisclosed blood problems, he decides to provide precise treatment using his status windows, counseling, and healing skills. Reflecting on his role as more than just an excellent PE teacher, he instructs her not to move. Meanwhile, he employs his god's healing ring finger skill on her, and she experiences a surge in power. Amazed, she asks how he accomplished that, noting that her senses have doubled. Yuil Shin explains that he healed her blood problems, causing the improvement, and cheerfully moves on to the next person. Siang Miri and Sword Demon enter, and he questions why both of them are present. Sword Demon responds that he wants his advice as well, and Siang Miri concurs. Yuil Shin suggests that they both train at home but they argue that it's different at school. Resigned, he agrees and inquires about who should go first. As they both vie to be the first, a fight ensues. Sword Demon asserts that he can't give this to her, even if she's his student, as he was there first. Siang Miri protests, pointing out that Sword Demon isn't even a student at the school. Observing the dynamic, Yu Will Shin intervenes, urging them not to fight, and decides to treat both of them simultaneously. During the session, Yuil Shin receives a message indicating that follower Auntie's desperate prayer has reached him. Puzzled, he asks what's happening, and he reads Auntie's prayer, pleading for Lord Yuil Shin to save them and expressing their inability to stop the situation with their meager power. He ponders what might be wrong with them and receives warning notifications. At that moment, he gains insight into Antria's urgent situation. He identifies a monster and checks its details, revealing it to be a 2,000-year-old follower of the Dominator of the Abyss Swamp, summoned by a rack, with the ability to regenerate endlessly. Observing another monster, he examines its details, discovering that it is a 666-year-old male beast, a follower of the strong and deceitful beast, also summoned by a rack. Encountering yet another monster, he investigates its details, learning that it is a genderless follower of light shining in the highest depths of the sky. This 2,200-year-old entity is known for using horrifying flames and, like the others, was summoned by a rack. Yuil Shin realizes that these three followers are exceptionally terrifying and receives a notification stating that they are similar to or stronger than SS-class Gustav. The message indicates a high probability that all of Antria's ants will face a massacre. He contemplates that these individuals are attempting to sever the source of his power, and receives another warning message indicating the time remaining until the Empire's priestess, Arakine, and her empirical army of 100 billion bugs arrive at Antria in 78 hours, 12 minutes, and 5 seconds. Faced with the daunting number of 100 billion bugs, he acknowledges that he can't stop them, even with truckloads of insecticides, and wonders if he can protect the ant tribe from this impending threat. Reflecting on his recent victory against Gustav, he feels he barely managed it. Sword Demon and Xiang Miri notice his concern and inquire about what's troubling the Sword God. Observing the monsters, he declares that they will charge alongside his majesty and the great gods to dry the seeds of the evil god. Realizing the gravity of the situation, he acknowledges that he has a low-class quest. Xiang Miri points out that he was absent for a week and receives a notification about a quest, indicating that the S-class possessing Transcendence potential sacrifice count is now at 6 tenths. Yuil Shin acknowledges this and concludes that his first priority should be to increase the number of followers. Yuil Shin, like a person drowning in a swamp, believes that individuals tend to grasp at straws for help. He goes to the mess area where Choi Kangsun is having lunch, seeing him as his potential lifeline. 
entering and sitting near him. Yu Ilshin checks Choi Kangsun's abilities, noting that he is a 58-year-old muscular man with the potential to transcend, appreciated for saving Choi Kangsun's daughter. While eating, Yu Ilshin asks if Choi Kangsun has something to say. Choi Kangsun replies affirmatively, expressing a favor he wants to ask. After hearing Choi Kangsun's request, Yu Il Shin laughs but agrees, acknowledging the peculiarity of the favor. Checking Choi Kangsun's details again, he realizes there's no change, and he assumes that the attempt did not work. Siong Mina and Siong Miri observe the interaction, with Siong Miri suggesting they stop gawking and continue eating. Amidst this, Yu Il Shin receives a notification about the quest, indicating that the count for the S class possessing transcendence potential sacrifice is now at 6 10. Reflecting on Siong Mina, who is currently being fed by her sister, he looks at them with gratitude. Meanwhile, he contemplates that he only needs four more followers to become a low-class god, viewing it as the only solution to the current situation. However, he wonders why Choi Kangsun's attempt to become a follower doesn't work when he utters the keyword, realizing it may be due to Choi Kangsun's lack of belief in him. Yu Il Shin asks if there is anything he can do to help, urging Choi Kangsun to share something that would increase his belief in him. Choi Kangsun, still chewing his food, questions Yu Il Shin's intentions, skeptical about whether there's an ulterior motive, even if he likes him, and makes it clear that he won't give him his daughter. Yu Il Shin, perplexed by Choi Kangsun's response, asserts that he will never give up and emphasizes that the world is not that easy. In response, Choi Kangsun laughs, reassures him not to worry, and adds that he is not interested in women older than him. This statement infuriates Yu Il Shin, prompting him to express his anger. Siang Mina, overhearing the conversation, also becomes angry. In his frustration, Yu Il Shin slams his spoon on the table, demanding an explanation and accusing Choi Kangsun of implying that he doesn't like his daughter. He reflects that Choi Kangsun is undoubtedly not normal, contemplating if that's the reason he can't become a follower. Regardless, he acknowledges the need to find a way to make Choi Kangsun believe in him. In frustration, he cracks the table with a spoon and asks him what he means. Choi Kangsun casually replies with a yes, what is it? Choi Kangsun inquires if Yu Il Shin is helping students with his healing skills. Yu Il Shin recognizes the potential of this and affirms that the students, including Xiong Mina, have significantly improved thanks to the healing skill. He mentions her initial inability to speak or recognize people. Choi Kangsun expresses genuine interest and asks if Yu Il Shin can heal someone reaching the end of their lifespan. Yu Il Shin receives a notification that an S-Class Choi Kangsun follower quest has been created and another notification for the follower quest to heal his friend, showcasing the powers of a great god. The quest's reward is Choi Kangsun's faith. Meanwhile, he stands up and is about to leave, thinking that he has to do this. He declares let's go right now, realizing that he has gained one S-Class follower. The scene shifts to a VIP room with guards positioned outside. Inside the room, a lady is asleep on a bed of flowers. He observes her, thinking that she is his friend, but she appears to be too young. Choi Kangsun questions what he is looking at, and he responds by saying that he mentioned she was his friend, and she looks more like she could be his friend than him. Choi Kangsun explains that Miracle doesn't age, recounting that she looked the same when he first met her, though she didn't have white hair. He adds that Miracle is not just an ordinary friend but a comrade who has been with him through the dangers of the battlefield and a hero who saved Korea alongside him. Yu Il Shin gazes at the flowers as the doctor arrives, apologizing and proceeding to examine Miracle. Choi Kangsun informs Yu Il Shin that Miracle's lifespan is already at its limit, and she is absorbing the plant's energy to sustain herself. He mentions that doctors and healer hunters have attempted to heal her, but all their efforts have failed. Choi Kangsun then questions Yu Il Shin, asking if he thinks he can do something about it. Yu Il Shin expresses his willingness to try and examine Miracle's details. He discovers her name is Lee Murray but can't determine her age. He notices a remark stating that her remaining lifespan has been put on hold by a coma. Perplexed by the inability to see her age, he wonders if this is the first time it has happened or if it's an error. A voice interjects, stating that it's not gentlemanly to obsess over a woman's age. Yu Il Shin realizes that this voice is Miracle's. After a while, Yu Il Shin approaches the bed, and Choi Kangsun notes that Miracle has invited him into her thinking space, indicating that he will leave it to him. Yu Il Shin enters her thinking space and finds her sitting in a garden, feeding birds and asking if they like the food. She greets him, prompting him to wonder if this is a dream. However, he realizes that it is her thinking space, similar to Mina's skill but stronger and clearer. He asks if she is Lee Murray, and she confirms, addressing him as Yu Il Shin. He questions if she knows him, and she replies affirmatively, 
describing him as a chosen one and noting that he appeared as the incarnation of evil in a premonition. However, she adds that he looks rather pathetic and kind in real life, expressing relief. Yuil Shin contemplates whether she is insulting him and wonders if she should be mad. She rises and approaches him, revealing that she had intended to use her remaining lifespan to eliminate him if he resembled the premonition. He resolves to remain composed and respectful towards the hero of humanity, then inquires about why she brought him to this space. Miracle explains that her physical body is essentially lifeless, and she brought him here so they could converse. Yuil Shin questions if she can send him back, expressing his desire to heal her. Recognizing the urgency due to the remaining time warning message of 68 hours, 1 minute, and 5 seconds, he suggests that he doesn't have much time. Miracle, however, informs him that she cannot be healed and asks if he wants to try using his authority on her. Yuil Shin inquires if she's sure, to which she asserts that his authority is much greater than he thinks, encouraging him to proceed. He agrees and utilizes his god's healing ring finger to attempt to heal her. However, he receives a notification indicating the calculation of the causality of the opponent to be healed, followed by another notification stating that the healing attempt has failed because she cannot be healed with the current amount of divine power he possesses. Frustrated by these notifications, he realizes that he lacks sufficient divine power, and this jeopardizes his brother's quest. Miracle bows down in front of him, and he inquires about what is troubling her. She expresses her belief in him and smiles. Lee Murray tells Yu Il Shin that he is still young and lacking, but she has decided to entrust the earth and her fate to him. He receives a notification congratulating him because Lee Murray has become his fifth follower, with a worth of two S-classes. Another notification informs him that the count for S-class possessing transcendence potential followers is now at 8 tenth. He reflects that it was sudden, but he now only needs two more S-class followers. Lee Murray mentions that she has observed him saving small worlds as he currently does and believes that he will be able to save their own world someday. Yuil Shin wonders if she means Antria and she expresses hope that he will save them when the time comes, addressing him as a young and cute god. She adds that she will happily look forward to that day and then disappear, despite his desire to stop her. She explains that she doesn't have much time but reassures him, saying that the solution to his problem is much closer than he thinks. He receives a notification that follower Lee Murray's skills have been added to the skill sharing. When he inquires about a prophecy skill, he gets another message indicating that he doesn't have enough divine power. Returning to his senses, Choi Kangsun asks if he is okay. Yuil Shin contemplates a solution that is nearby. The scene shifts to the academy gym, where he arrives and observes Knight Paladin Hades playing basketball with students. He receives a call, thinking that he may have failed the principal's quest but is devising another way to gain followers. Reflecting on Lee Murray's advice to check his surroundings, he says then please deliver it by tomorrow at the latest. He acknowledges having taken out credit loans and monthly loans and emptied his bank account, hoping that this plan will work. Observing Sword Demon practicing with his sword, he recognizes it as the sword he obtained from the fraud. He checks its details, revealing it to be the Sword Demon Training Sword Ver. 2. A heavenly demonic god sword training sword sold by the Thousand Blades. It cuts all heavily and is an upgraded version of Training Sword Ver. 1. Reflecting on the fact that he paid 20 million for it to aid in making Sword Demon an S-Class, he becomes emotional, realizing that he received this as a free reward. Soon after, he receives a message about the wise Teiji Sword, the secret collection of the Thousand Blades that cuts all, along with a book containing the essence of Jiang Senfeng. Meanwhile, he reminisces about the incident when Sword Demon gave him that book. He comments that placid-tempered swordsmanship doesn't align well with his type of swordsmanship, which strives for the extremes. Concerned that learning the wise Teiji sword, in addition to the heavenly demonic god sword, might overwhelm him and ruin his energy and blood, he recalls that sword demon politely declined the offer of the thousand blades that cut all. Pausing his training, he sweats profusely. Go Myung Jai observes him and admires his demeanor, calling him cool. He turns towards her and instructs her to stop watching and come up to him. Perplexed, she inquires if he would like water, but he clarifies that he meant the summoned monster next to her. Knight Paladin Hades, playing basketball with a student, overhears and comments on his rudeness. He asks Sword Demon if he wants to taste defeat again. Sword Demon responds that today is different, expressing confidence that he feels like he can win against Hades today. Yuil Shin contemplates that it may be impossible for an A-Class to defeat an S-Class, but the idea of Sword Demon reaching the S-Class through duels with Hades seems feasible. Reflecting on the heavenly demonic god sword, he realizes it's no ordinary sword technique and speculates that somewhere close by, 
Hades might have meant Sword Demon. Hades asserts that he won't go easy on Sword Demon, advising him to prepare himself. As Hades charges to attack, Sword Demon responds confidently, claiming mastery of the heavenly demonic god Sword to the extremes and asserting that he is not the same as yesterday. They both run to attack, but despite Sword Demon's efforts, Hades quickly snatches his sword, causing him to fall. Hades comments that Sword Demon's performance was good but still not enough to beat him. Worried, Sword Demon expresses frustration about his body but resolves to win one day. He starts crying, but Hades picks him up on his shoulder, reassuring him that he will definitely win someday. Hades tells Yuil Shin that he's alive and, addressing him as his liege offers to take him to the nurse's office. Yuil Shin agrees, and they leave, with Go Myung Jai also following and insisting she's coming along. Reflecting on Hades' words about Sword Demon becoming an S-Class one day, Yuil Shin contemplates the uncertainty of when it will happen. He drinks a potion and receives a notification that synchronization with the Godmaker has increased from 45% to 46%, reinforcing his inherent authority. Dissatisfied, he thinks about it being his 2000th bottle, and the increase being only 1%, realizing he has a war to attend to. Observing Xiang Mira and Xiang Miri, Yuil Shin inquires if everything is going okay. He realizes that Xiang Mina won't reply as she is highly concentrated. Currently, Xiang Mina is undoing Xiang Miri's seal, aiming to enable her to protect herself instead of becoming a powerless sacrifice to the Nether Dragon. Attempting some magic, Xiang Mina encounters difficulty, prompting her sister to ask if she is okay. Xiang Mina assures her that she is fine. Reflecting on Miracle's mention of a close place, Yuil Shin initially thought she meant either Sword Demon or Xiang Miri. Regardless, he encourages Xiang Mina not to push herself too hard and advises her to take it slow, expressing confidence in her abilities. Recalling his previous statement about not being interested in older women, Yuil Shin gazes away as he addresses her as a sister. In response, she vehemently rejects the term, expressing a preference for being called Mina. Swiftly, he produces a candy and offers it to her, asking if she wants it. Excitedly, she runs towards him, declaring her love for candy. Yuil Shin contemplates the ongoing quest, realizing that it would be complete if Sword Demon and Xiang Miri reached S-Class. However, he acknowledges the lack of time for such developments. A warning notification reminds him that the remaining time until the Empirical Army arrives at Antria is 48 hours, 1 minute, and 30 seconds. After a while, he considers that it's probably impossible, and he needs to hurry and start training. However, he realizes that he almost forgets something. He calls Xiang Miri, and she responds with a yes. He informs her that he needs to leave this world for a bit, and instructs her to tell Sword Demon that he's leaving the Guardian's duty to him once he wakes up. He emphasizes that he has something very important to do. Inquisitive, she asks what it is, and he cheerfully replies, happily sleeping, before heading to his bed. Yuil Shin goes to his bed, contemplating the unexpectedly close place mentioned by Miracle. As he lies down, covering his eyes, he considers the last option, hell training with the stalkers in his dreams. Time flows much slower in the dream world than in real life, giving him the opportunity to train for more than three months in the dream, equivalent to around two days in real life. Though uncertain about how much stronger he can become, he finds the prospect awesome. In his dream, he reaches the Sword God Temple, a realm of the thousand blades that cuts all. Reflecting on his first encounter with this fraud, he almost faints, but he dismisses that as unimportant. Inquiring about the repair of the thousand blades he left with him after the explosion during the fight with Gustav, he receives a notification that the repair is not yet complete. The thousand blades that cuts all states that more time is needed due to the severe damage sustained by the blade. He requests Thousand Blades to at least lend him something, to which Thousand Blades responds that it will cost 1 million G-Coins. Outraged, he exclaims what and why the price has doubled since the last time. Thousand Blades retorts that he shouldn't borrow if he's broke. Frustrated with the seemingly dishonest merchant, he checks his god's shop and reluctantly acknowledges that he has no choice but to pay the 1 million G-Coins. Suspicious, he wonders if Thousand Blades is playing a trick on him to earn extra money. Suddenly, a wall explodes, revealing a wooden sword. Perplexed, he questions what it is. Thousand Blades casually replies that it's just a wooden sword. Annoyed, he asks what he's supposed to do with it, expressing disbelief at the situation. He shouts, questioning if Thousand Blades thinks he's that gullible, while Thousand Blades insists that it is a better sword than it looks and encourages him to try it out. He receives a notification about an old and weary wooden sword, made from an apricot tree and 850 years old with a remark that it's a training sword used by the founder of the Mount Hua sect. 
he reflects 850 years old, a training sword used by the founder of the Mount Hua sect. That actually doesn't sound bad. In a hurry, he decides to use this sword since he already paid. He activates Ultra Blade. The thousand blades that cuts all explains that once the synchronization with the Mount Hua sect founder's wooden sword hits 50%, a miracle will happen. Excitedly, he asks what, 50%, a miracle. Thousand Blades clarifies that the synchronization rate will increase the more he trains in this dream world, reminding him that the rate did increase faster in dreams. He reflects on the wooden sword, considering that the Mount Hua sect founder seems to be conveying something. Nevertheless, he remains uncertain about the nature of the miracle. With a sneer, he declares that they will begin the hell training. Initially taken aback, he starts the training with the wooden sword, marveling at how he managed to block an attack with it. He instructs to try attacking him once, and a giant monster appears. A warning notification about the remaining time appears, indicating 30 hours, 50 minutes, and 10 seconds, with synchronization at 46%. He acknowledges that he has never succeeded in an attack in a dream before. The Thousand Blades that cuts all acknowledges the impressive blocking of 10,000 attacks and announces the commencement of another 10,000 attacks. As he consumes more potion bottles, a warning message alerts him that the remaining time is now 20 hours, 1 minutes, and 0 seconds, with synchronization at 46.5%. He reflects on his weakness and continues training, achieving a successful attack for the first time. The remaining time is 20 hours, 0 minutes, and 30 seconds, with synchronization at 47%. Determined to reach 50%, he drinks another bottle of potion. The thousand blades that cuts all expresses pride in him and jokingly requests a potion. He suggests buying one, but Perpetual Truth Seeker seizes him, stating it's time to work the metal. Taken to Muscle Temple by Perpetual Truth Seeker, he endures an attack from a hunter. As he screams, he realizes this stalker is not metaphorically whipping him but literally doing so. Despite the pain, he acknowledges that his muscles have become plumper and is praised for being instructed to lift a two-ton weight as a warm-up. In the midst of his efforts to protect the ants, he remains determined to succeed. Attempting to lift a 100-ton weight, he shouts and starts bleeding from the nose. Perpetual Truth Seeker applauds and advises him to drink potions to prevent muscle loss. Consuming another potion, he receives a warning message indicating only 10 hours remain, with synchronization at 48%. A message from Soundless Nightmare arrives, expressing excitement about being next. Frustrated, he urges her to stop consuming him, but he knows that falling asleep here would return him to reality, an outcome he cannot allow. He attacks the monster flower, prompting an unusual reaction from Soundless Nightmare, who blushes and requests a harder hit next time. As he confronts the seemingly insane stalkers, he receives a warning message indicating only one minute and one second remains, with synchronization at 49%. Frustrated by falling short by just 1%, he contemplates the need to drink over 2,000 potions to reach 50%, but the lack of time poses a significant challenge. Desperate, he implores Soundless Nightmare to hit him harder. She shivers in pleasure and agrees, expressing excitement about testing his newfound strength. Despite his frustration, he pushes forward and attacks the flower monster. However, as the warning message notifies him of only one second remaining, the urgency of the situation intensifies. He receives a notification that synchronization has reached 49.9%. Yu Il Shin exclaims damn it and feels as if he's on the verge of losing his mind. Gazing at the flower monster, he seeks a solution. Soundless Nightmare joyfully declares the heavenly demonic god sword is the best, announcing that synchronization has reached 50%. Realizing this, Yu Il Shin questions if direct intervention was the key, recalling the promise of a small but surprising miracle. He receives a notification stating that the mentality and stamina of a class followers will increase due to synchronization, leading him to speculate that Sword Demon and Xiong Miri might be the recipients of this miracle, possibly elevating them to S class. As warning messages about the Imperial Army's first attack and the commencement of the Holy War flood in, he curses and resolves to reach Antria. However, he quickly decides to head to the school rooftop first, anticipating a delivery awaiting him there. The scene transitions to Antria, where Arachne, along with her army, positions themselves outside the castle. She comments on the castle built with the evil god's authority, noting its reputed impregnability due to its sturdiness. She orders Beelzebub's filth fly unit to take the front, expressing disdain for the creatures. Panty, observing the approaching threat from the castle, laments the overwhelming numbers and acknowledges her inability to stop them with her divine power. 
She prays for Yu Ilshin's swift arrival and compliance with his divine order to remain within the castle. An Antria man expresses concern about Beelzebub's cursed filth, known to melt even stone, and suggests the necessity to escape. Beelzebub invokes a curse upon the inferior creatures, commanding them to die as they launch their attack. He commands his soldiers to unleash the filth with the authority of the god of filth and infectious disease. Upon Yu Ilshin's arrival, fear grips them all. He positions himself in front of the castle, facing Arachne and her army, armed with numerous insecticide sprays. Pleased with his timely delivery, he reflects on his insecticide army, feeling a sense of coolness. Beelzebub, observing the bottles, contemplates the unfamiliar writing and wonders if it's the language of the evil god. He becomes alarmed, realizing the severity of the war and the impending danger. Fearing their impending demise, he urgently urges everyone to run. Observing the swarm of flies, Yu Ilshin deems them disgusting and employs his god's crushing forefinger, activating the on, off authority combined with the telekinesis skill acquired from follower Johan. As the bottles scatter, he contemplates the effectiveness of this technique. Meanwhile, Beelzebub coughs and begins bleeding, realizing the potency of the poison unleashed upon them. Urging a retreat, he warns the soldiers to avoid the poisonous gas. Another soldier, horrified, identifies the evil god from legends worshipped by savages and implores everyone to run to avoid certain death. Barak dismisses their fears, stating that Yu Il Shin is alone and poses no threat if they flee. Yu Il Shin emphasizes the danger of the approaching poison gas, advising everyone to run as it could cover the entirety of Yu Ido. In response, she becomes infuriated, vehemently rejecting the idea that such a trick could work again. She addresses the strong and deceitful beast, requesting its assistance. The beast acknowledges her request and approaches Yu Il Shin. As it nears him, it roars, prompting him to recognize the impending danger of the insecticide gas heading its way. Frustrated, he utilizes God's crushing forefinger skill combined with telekinesis, lamenting the loss of his precious insecticide cans and the money spent on them. Meanwhile, she observes his actions, angrily attributing the situation to the evil god's deceptive tactics. The beast announces that the sacrifices have been collected, prompting Yu Il Shin to contemplate their brutal nature, wanting to increase their power by consuming the sacrifices. Arachne acknowledges the necessity of enduring such sacrifices, even if they number in the hundreds of thousands or tens of millions, as long as it grants them god's power. She orders Dragonfly to dispatch the blind unit. Meanwhile, he reflects on the loss of his insecticide canisters due to the fanged cat's interference. Cleaning his nose, he expresses determination to be the one to defeat the fanged cat, and attempts to use God's crushing forefinger. As he does, he notices the arrival of Dragonflies and questions what is happening this time. Arachne believes that the blind unit's jaws, capable of crushing stone, can inflict a mortal wound on him, with the apostles finishing the job if needed. The leader of the dragon flies commands the blind unit to drop, and as he observes this, he transforms his body into a steel form through skill sharing. When one member of the blind unit strikes his arm, it doesn't cause any harm. Simultaneously, he receives a message from Truth Seeker of Eternity, expressing appreciation for how the body turns to iron when utilizing bodily stores. A member of the blind unit instructs the others not to panic and to break through using their numbers, reasoning that their opponent is merely an evil god. They launch a massive attack, completely covering him. In response, he employs the condemning middle finger of the god, burning them, and then uses the proliferation thumb finger of the god to incinerate them all, throwing fire in their midst. One of the soldiers shouts it's raining hellfire. Run meanwhile, Yu Il Shin becomes tired and contemplates that he's running out of divine power. He receives a notification about the quest low-grade evil god promotion in progress, stating that ordinary sacrifices are at 52,023,002 out of 1 billion. He reflects on the fact that the Imperial Army is about 100 billion strong, and he initially hoped to kill the required billion for the promotion in one shot. Frustrated, he acknowledges his luck in achieving a 50% assimilation rate but realizes it's still not enough. Feeling dizzy, he wonders if it's due to using up a significant amount of his divine power. He notices someone staring at him and receives a warning message about the Apostle of the Flame shining in the highest sky. The message states that it's sexless, has been in use for 2,200 years, and is infuriated at Yu Il Shin for daring to use the same flame as its master. Meanwhile, he considers this individual as another unique character. Arachne declares Apostles of the Great Gods, may he take charge of this evil god. The Apostles of the Flames assert that the Chariot of Fire will answer her call, and in exchange, 
he will harvest 100 million sacrifices. She responds as he pleases, while one of the soldiers pleads to the priestess to have mercy on them and suggests another round of sacrifice. She dismisses the idea, considering it an honor for the victory of the Empire. The Apostles of the Flames launch an attack, killing many soldiers and stating that the sacrifices have been collected. On the other side, Yuil Shin attempts to defeat the Fang Cat and realizes it has grown bigger, foreseeing potential trouble. As the Fang Cat almost attacks him, he employs God's crushing forefinger. However, he receives a notification indicating that he failed to invoke the authority because he doesn't have enough divine power. He acknowledges that his divine power is low just as the Fang Cat attacks him, throwing him away. Barak asks Nava if he sees that the evil god has met a miserable end, and finally, she is able to avenge him. Yuil Shin contemplates whether he has lost, questioning if it was too arrogant of him. Born as a weak and dim-witted person, to believe he could protect the residents of the Gaami kingdom despite their reverence for him as their god. And he comes closer to his face and implores no, Lord Yuil Shin, please don't close his eyes. He asks her why she is there, reminding her that he told her not to step out of the fortress. She attempts to use her healing ring finger, but he receives a notification that complete healing has failed due to the divine power of flame shining in the highest sky preventing the healing. She pleads, please, Lord Yuil Shin's healing ring finger, and once again, he gets a notification that complete healing has failed because of the divine power of flames shining. The Fang Cat comments, tenacious punk, so he's still breathing and declares how dare a barbarian evil god use such dirty flames. Prepare to die as he runs towards him to attack. The Fang Cat asserts that he will definitely kill him and make him an offering to his master. Ilho suggests to Lord Yuil Shin, please allow him, number one, to descend, while Yuil Shin thinks number one, right, there's still him, and commands number one to descend. He tries to use God's crushing forefinger, thinking please, at least let him have enough divine power to bring number one out of the tower. After a while, Ilho emerges and announces that number one has come after heeding Lord Yuil Shin's call. He receives a message indicating that Number One's descent has been realized, and its duration is 60 minutes. Ilho reassures please, do not worry now, he has killed lots of monsters like them inside the tower. Yuil Shin asks if that is so and admires Number One's strength, questioning when he became so powerful. The Fang Cat attacks Ilho, devouring him, and comments on a bug that's not even worth a mouthful. Anti becomes sad for Ilho, and Yuil Shin observes this, thinking that it eats Number One. And this is really the end now, as he doesn't even have the strength to lift a finger. Meanwhile, he receives notifications that the all-slashing heavenly blade states the repair of the kitchen knife he entrusted to him is finally complete. The all-slashing heavenly blades also mentions that the delivery would be free since a few things have been stripped off, and they reach there in front of him. Yuil Shin wakes up, grasps the all-slashing heavenly blades, and regains his strength, sensing the surge in his power. The Fang Cat observes him and senses that something is a little off. Yuil Shin rises and utilizes skill share with Sword Demon, while the Fang Cat warns that this is no laughing matter and is very dangerous. He employs Reign of the Heavenly Demon, becoming immensely powerful, as the Apostle of the Flames expresses concern, stating that it's dangerous. Ignoring the warning, Yuil Shin attacks the Apostle of the Flames, who screams, starts bleeding, and laments the precious body that his master created and bestowed upon him. Yuil Shin proceeds to attack other monsters, cutting them into pieces. He thinks of them as sneaky men noting that they are the only ones left to deal with now. He is determined to kill the Fang Cat for daring to eat his number one. However, his problem lies in his divine power. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin is uncertain if he has enough divine power to use another reign of the Heavenly Demon, feeling disoriented again. The Fang Cat observes that Yuil Shin used up a lot of power just now and seizes the opportunity to attack thinking this is his chance to die. As the Fang Cat runs to attack him, it notices a sudden surge of power emanating from Yuil Shin's body, making it wonder what is happening. Yuil Shin receives more power, contemplating it, and simultaneously receives a notification that the seal on the Earth Branch Believer, Xiang Miri, has been successfully released. Now, she possesses the possibility to transcend. Yuil Shin thinks about Xiang Miri finally breaking free, guessing that the small but amazing miracle is starting to happen now. After a while, he receives a notification about a quest, stating that S-Class believers with the possibility to transcend are at 9 out of 10. He acknowledges the contribution of someone, and his divine power reserves are back up to full. Considering Sword Demon, he decides to give it his all and declares all right, he's gonna use the reign of the Heavenly Demon again, but this time on that Fang Cat. The Fang Cat replies that he needs to avoid facing him directly. 
Ewil Shin, hearing a sound, looks behind, and the Apostle of the Ruler of the Abyssal Swamp appears from behind. He asks if Ewil Shin is surprised, asserting himself as an insignificant evil barbarian god. He claims his body has been blessed with immortality, making it difficult for a sword or anything similar to easily kill him. Annoyed, he looks at him and asks if this is what it means. He receives a message about the Apostle of the Ruler of the Abyssal Swamp, which can endlessly regenerate and thinks that this means trouble is about to happen. He replies that there is nothing to be scared of, in the first place, such a pathetic sword aura can't kill them. He declares death and dismisses it as pathetic. The all-slashing heavenly blades respond, questioning what he meant by calling their sword aura pathetic. Yuil Shin thinks the hex with this sword, so creepy, while the apostle of the ruler of the abyssal swamp remarks looks at that. He asks if the sword can talk and finds it interesting, stating that he will take it as his trophy. The all-slashing heavenly blade retorts Snakehead, stop spouting nonsense, and repeat what he said earlier. He dares to claim that their majestic sword aura is pathetic. Meanwhile, he responds that the sword becomes worthless when faced with the power of endless regeneration. He tells the apostle of the ruler of the abyssal swamp to go ahead and test it out, stating that he will use the sword as decoration and display it at the entrance to his cave dwelling. Yuil Shin thinks the sword feels like it is possessed by a different entity and wonders who it might be. He considers the founder of the Mount Hua sect but dismisses the possibility, as the voice is completely different. Trying to hold the blade with full power because he's laughing, he concludes that the voice could only be from someone crazy, someone truly deranged. The apostle of the ruler of the abyssal swamp asks if the sword is laughing, and the heavenly blade replies well. All he can do is laugh because he's already dead. The apostle of the ruler of the abyssal swamp claims that the evil sword placed a curse on him. However, he asserts that as long as he uses the blessing of regeneration that his master gave him, it's impossible for a mere sword to have done this to him. As he disappears, the heavenly blade questions if he really thought he would survive after being hit by the reign of the heavenly demon. It states that the moment he was cut by the blade, he was already dead, and he cried for help. The blade expresses outrage at how an insignificant snake like him dared to do that. Yuil Shin receives a message indicating that he has killed the apostle of the ruler of the abyssal swamp and the sacrifice is being absorbed. Another notification congratulates him, stating that the Apostle of the Ruler of the Abyssal Swamp is worth two S-Class sacrifices, and he receives a quest notification that S-Class sacrifices with the possibility to transcend are now at 8 divided by 10. Yuil Shin thinks he can feel himself getting stronger, wondering what it will be like once the progress bar reaches 10 people. He senses someone behind him, realizing it is bloodlust. The fanged cat comments that he noticed it too late, and the all-slashing heavenly blades warn him that he will be torn to pieces by the wings of the wind. All-slashing heavenly blade acknowledges a job well done in adapting to the situation, noting that, at least, he isn't foolish. On the other hand, Yuil Shin dismisses the praise, telling him to be quiet, and accuses the sneaky fanged cat of planning a surprise attack on the heavenly demon. As fanged cat prepares to strike, heavenly blade readies himself for a counter-attack. However, Fang Cat's blade interrupts, advising everyone to wait. When questioned about the delay, he explains that he has resorted to employing such tactics. Meanwhile, he observes Fang Cat expressing pain from some internal injury. Perplexed, he contemplates the situation while witnessing Fang Cat collapsing with great force, crying out about the impending burst of his stomach. Ilho swiftly cuts through the belly with considerable force, emerging victoriously. Yuil Shin, witnessing the spectacle, rejoices, stating that he knew it, number one is still alive. Ilho responds confidently, stating that a giant monster who only cares about size can be defeated from the inside. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin acknowledges number one is the best, and all slashing heavenly blade remarks that he supposes number one is a servant a bit too troublesome for him to handle. Inquiring about Number One's identity, All Slashing Heavenly Sword responds by expressing surprise that he doesn't even know who he is, calling him foolish. He instructs him to open his ears and listen, introducing himself as an honorable figure and falling silent. Wondering about his identity, Yuil Shin asks what the big secret is and why there is a dramatic pause. All Slashing Heavenly Sword repeats his identity, and Yuil Shin reflects on how perplexing the situation is. He wonders if this might be the Sword God's kitchen knife, but the voice is different, leading him to contemplate just who this person is. Yuil Shin then thinks about Mr. Heavenly Blade and requests an explanation of the situation. 
He ponders the peculiar nature of the warranty service and receives a message indicating that all slashing Heavenly Blade is avoiding his question. Frustrated, he considers the odd response and contemplates the possibility of seeking a refund if this continues. After a while, Fang Cat wakes up and expresses indignation at how a mere bug like his opponent dared to destroy the body granted to him by his lord. He deems it unforgivable, asserting that he will never forgive the trespasser. He inquires whether the adversary is still alive. Arachne, addressing the priestess, is told by Fang Cat to make a sacrifice for him, emphasizing the need for numerous sacrifices to defeat the evil god. He specifies the requirement for all 100 billion sacrifices, shocking her. Questioning the meaning behind his words, she receives the reply that they should be offered for the glory of their god, giving up all their lives. Fang Cat launches an attack on all soldiers who cry out for help. Arachne pleads with him to stop, pointing out that this wasn't part of their agreement in the contract, and warns that the emperor will not forgive him. Dismissing her as a noisy woman, Fang Cat insists on the necessity of sacrifices and demands that she let him collect them. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin glares at the unfolding scene in anger, reflecting on the escalating madness of the situation. Meanwhile, Ilho arrives and declares that he will be the opponent of a guy who relies solely on his massive size. Holding a huge rock on his head, he hurls it towards Fang Cat, instructing it to shatter the wagon monster. However, Fang Cat counters by breathing fire on the rock, melting it. Observing this, Yuil Shin notes that the rock melted, while Fang Cat boasts about the power of his master, the flame shining in the highest sky. Ilho, seeking guidance, runs to Lord Yuil Shin and asks what he should do next. All slashing Heavenly Blade scoffs at him, calling him a silly and questioning whether he even needs to ask such a thing. Yuil Shin then queries if he has a good plan. All slashing Heavenly Blade responds by dismissing the wagon that makes use of such insignificant flames, suggesting that cutting it down will be sufficient. Yuil Shin wonders about calling those flames insignificant, and reflects that he has no idea who Ilho is. But as expected, Ilho is also not normal. All slashing Heavenly Blade assures them to trust in him, asserting that there is nothing in this world that he cannot cut. Despite acknowledging that it may seem insane, he concludes that there is nothing else he can do at the moment and decides to give it a try. Utilizing the skill share, he activates the Sword Demon's Heavenly Demon Divine Sword in just one second and initiates the reign of the Heavenly Demon. He charges towards Fang Cat for an attack, who questions if that is all he's got. Reflecting on the situation, all slashing Heavenly Blade realizes that even if Mr. Heavenly Blade repairs it, there are limits to what the sword can withstand. He regrets not looking more into it when the delivery was promised to be free, and worries about the potential destruction of Antria. He contemplates how he can possibly cut down such a formidable and crazy monster. All slashing Heavenly Blade skillfully cuts Fang Cat into two pieces, eliciting screams from the latter about his body, the precious body granted to him by his master. Annoyed by the situation, Fang Cat remarks that it's been cut and directs the question to Yuil Shin, asking if he witnessed the power of this honorable one. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin reflects that he was the one who wielded the blade, and this time, he didn't faint immediately, unlike the encounter with Gustav in the past. He acknowledges that he has indeed become stronger and wonders about what Fang Cat said, asking if he can repeat it. Endless granting abundance observes the burning skies with eyes filled with worry, and Soundless Nightmare reiterates that it's still too early to be complacent. Yuil Shin queries burning skies about what that is, referring to the burning skies. Yuil Shin receives a warning notification about the follower of light shining in the highest depths of the sky. The message explains that there were originally two sun gods who were brothers in Antria. However, the two gods engaged in a thousand-year-long battle, and the loser was subsequently sealed in a carriage of fire. Yuil Shin reflects on the fact that he believed he had successfully slain it, only to discover that he merely undid a seal. The real identity of the fire head was the sun god, the thousand blade that cuts all notes that it is only the remnants of the sun god. Despite being a high-class god in the past, the entity suggests that it might be better to give up now and die. Yuil Shin contemplates the situation, thinking about the considerable expense he incurred on this endeavor. Despite using up all his divine power in the earlier attack, he recalls a saying that even if the sky were to fall, there's a hole to rise through without specifying who said it. Fang Cat confronts Yu Il Shin, questioning his audacity in breaking the carriage of fire bestowed upon him by his master and threatening to burn him down with the world. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin acknowledges the existence of the hole in the sky. Ilho takes advantage of the moment, attacking Fang Cat and offering the beast as a sacrifice. Fang Cat reacts with a scream of pain, insisting that he will not be defeated, calling Ilho a parasite. 
Yuil Shin expresses his joy, praising Ilho for his successful move. A notification then informs Yuil Shin that the sacrifice made by Ilho, the follower of strong and deceitful beast, is worth two S classes. Yuil Shin, confident in his prediction, receives another notification regarding the quest, indicating that he has successfully accomplished the task of sacrificing 10 over 10 S class entities. As a result, he will be promoted to a low class evil god. After a while, Yuil Shin senses an increase in divine power and wonders if this is the divine power of a low-class evil god. Ilho expresses his belief in Lord Yuil Shin, and Auntie pleads in front of him, affirming their faith. Yuil Shin acknowledges that, indeed, he is their god. Fang Cat dismisses their efforts as a pointless struggle and urges them to burn down along with the world. Yuil Shin retorts, telling the Firehead to shut up, and employs God's condemning middle finger. He comments on the intense heat, instructs the Firehead to back off for now, and launches an attack. Fang Cat reacts, calling him with an abusive word and questioning if Yuil Shin thinks this will work on him. Yuil Shin acknowledges the temporary nature of the attack, recognizing the strength of Fang Cat. He ponders whether it's due to the 100 billion sacrifices or because Fang Cat used to be a high-class god before being sealed. He contemplates once more that he has been promoted to a low-class evil god, but he still feels inadequate and frustrated. Yuil Shin acknowledges that he thinks he will lose to this kind of attack. Auntie warns that the castle is melting and urges Yuil Shin to run. Yuil Shin curses, realizing that the heavenly demon rain won't work again, and decides to use the Thousand Blades treasure trove. Fang Cat intervenes, stating that the Thousand Blades treasure trove can't slay fire. Yuil Shin exclaims, asking how he is supposed to deal with it. He looks at the Heavenly Blade. The scene shifts to the Academy, where Sword Demon is training with his sword. He declares the Heavenly Demonic God Sword's second form and notes that he has finally mastered the subtlety of the second form. Sending his powers to Yuil Shin, Sword Demon suggests that it seems like he has done something. Meanwhile, Fang Cat recognizes the Heavenly Demonic God Sword's second form, triggering memories of who he truly is. He perceives an old man claiming to be the Heavenly Demon. Curious, he asks the heavenly demon and receives a notification about activating the blind god's eye's inherent authority, which swiftly scans through the heavenly demon's history. The story delves into a flashback where the heavenly demon, driven by tragic circumstances, killed his very own daughter, who had become an apostle of the god of destruction. In addition, he slaughtered every single one of his daughter's one million believers before taking his own life. The narrative returns to the present, where Yuil Shin reflects on the shocking revelation about the Heavenly Demon. He comments that there's no way the Heavenly Demon could have stayed sane after experiencing such events. The Heavenly Demon attempts to attack Yuil Shin while mentioning his daughter. Yuil Shin receives a notification revealing that the Heavenly Demon has been searching for someone who can take revenge on the God of Destruction on his behalf for thousands of years. Despite being scammed into losing his memories, it was thanks to the Sword Demon that he managed to recover them. He reflects on the term scammed and expresses curiosity about it, wanting more details because he has a suspicion about a particular individual. Yuil Shin receives a message revealing that the all-slashing heavenly sword attempted to use revenge as bait to entice the heavenly demon into becoming his apostle. Another notification informs him, however, that the heavenly demon refused, expressing disdain for the scamming individual. In response, All Slashing Heavenly Blade erased his memories and sealed him into his own sword for thousands of years, leaving him destitute. Yuil Shin recognizes the crooked scamming merchant as Heavenly Sword. Heavenly Demon directs a question to Sword Demon, acknowledging that his enlightenment has restored his lost memories. He commends Sword Demon as a good disciple and inquires whether he will be able to secure revenge for him, addressing him as a young god. He assures that he will definitely cut down the god of destruction in one strike. With a laugh, he acknowledges that using his power is acceptable, stating that the other person is worthy of it and worthy of being his master. Attempting to use the god-condemning middle finger, he receives a notification that the heavenly demon has recognized him as his master god, officially becoming Yuil Shin's believer. Firehead questions what is happening, and Yuil Shin receives another notification indicating that the S-class with the probability to transcend sacrifice is complete. Another notification congratulates him, announcing that he has been promoted to a low-grade god, reflecting on the small yet remarkable miracle that concludes with the enlightenment of Sword Demon. Yuil Shin considers the progression. Firehead expresses skepticism, questioning whether Yuil Shin thinks he can now do something against him just because he received power from some crazy old man. 
he dismissively declares that a bug will always be just a bug and commands them all to die. Evil Shin initiates an attack on Firehead, and Heavenly Blade suggests that to extinguish a fire, one must start a larger one. Agreeing with this sentiment, Evil Shin proceeds with his assault. Heavenly Demon explains that this is his interpretation of the Great Burning Hell, one of the worst among the eight great hells, and announces the activation of the Heavenly Demon Divine Sword's second form. Firehead dismisses Yuil Shin's efforts, asserting that there's no need to struggle in vain. He taunts Yuil Shin as an insignificant human, emphasizing that no matter how hard he tries, his fate of destruction won't change. Despite Firehead's words, Yuil Shin presses on with his attack, managing to cut through the flames. Yuil Shin, affected by the intense heat, expresses frustration, telling Firehead to go away. In response, Firehead reassures that such an injury will heal quickly with his master's power, and questions the nature of the flames, which now burn and elicit cries for help. However, the flames start to cool down rapidly. After a while, Firehead disappears completely, prompting Yuil Shin to declare that he did it, successfully protecting Antria. His followers express joy, with one proclaiming Lord Yuil Shin's victory, while another marvel at the miracle he performed, crediting their great god. Ilho commends their lord, stating that he never doubted victory would be his. Yuil Shin agrees but acknowledges the need for some rest, leaving the remaining tasks to Ilho. Ilho and Anti respond, pledging to follow his command. A notification arrives, announcing that Yuil Shin emerged victorious from the Holy War, and his fame has spread widely across the continents. Another notification reveals that Mr. Yuil Shin can now challenge the Intermediate God promotion quest for both Good God and Evil God. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin sits in his room, and Heavenly Blade observes him. He receives a message indicating that all slashing Heavenly Blade is glaring at him and accusing him of being a thief. Amused, Yuil Shin responds by questioning the accusation, sarcastically mentioning that Mr. Heavenly Sword is the one playing with sticks, attempting to steal from him. Another message arrives, stating that all slashing Heavenly Blade is yelling about having no idea that the Sword Demon Punk would be able to awaken Heavenly Demon's memories. Yuil Shin dismisses the unfair accusations and humorously addresses Mr. Miser Heavenly Sword, requesting him to repair the sword. All slashing Heavenly Blade responds by stating that great damage has been done to it, and to repair the Heavenly Demon. He demands 50 million god coins. Yuil Shin expresses disbelief, deeming it excessively expensive, and turns to his followers, asking for their opinion, suggesting that he is willing to spend up to 10 million coins. Soundless Nightmare subtly suggests knowing a well-known blacksmith. He reflects on his knowledge, considering his dear-valued customers as foolish stalkers. A notification arrives, stating that Truth Seeker of Eternity has been awaiting this day, and is willing to accept 5 million coins. He mocks the situation, referring to his wonderful customer base, highlighting the competitive nature among them, and asks Mr. Heavenly Sword for his opinion. All slashing Heavenly Blade suggests that it will take a year if the sword is given to Truth Seeker of Eternity, proposing a 10 million coin deal. Yuil Shin counters with an offer of 3 million coins, insisting on a deal. All slashing Heavenly Blade protests, deeming it a crazy markdown, but Yuil Shin narrates the hardships he has faced before this and decides to give it to Mr. Eternity. All slashing Heavenly Blade reluctantly agrees to the 3 million coins offer. Yuil Shin receives a call from Choi Kangsen, urging him to come to the Hunter Association urgently. When questioned about the sudden meeting, Choi Kangsen reveals the discovery of about a hundred crocodile Gustav's eggs. Yuil Shin is shocked by the revelation of eggs belonging to the SS class Gustav. The scene transitions to the Hunter Association, where a poster featuring the face Miss beloved by S class Hunter Seong Mina is displayed. Yuil Shin arrives with Sword Demon, noticing the poster and remarking that it's an ad featuring Seong Mina. Sword Demon admires her beauty. Suddenly, Seong Mina appears in front of them, greets Yuil Shin, and informs him that Seong Miri is also present. Yuil Shin returns the greeting, and Choi Kangsen does the same. Choi Kangsen suggests they go inside to look at the crocodile egg, and they all enter the building. As they walk toward the meeting room, Yuil Shin instructs Sword Demon to wait outside since he is not a member of the Hunter Association and Sword Demon agrees. Upon entering the meeting room, Yuil Shin observes other hunters present and thinks that the entire nation's S-class hunters are gathered to see the crocodile egg. Beak Yu Hyun approaches him, asks how it's going, and points to a seat for him to sit, suggesting that Seong Mina can sit next to him. Meanwhile, Seong Mina insists that she's going to stay by Yuil Shin and grabs his arm. CEO Li Ji instructs everyone to take a seat, announcing that Gustav's egg will arrive soon. 
Seong Mina jokingly comments that a crocodile egg must be yummy, and Yu Il Shin suggests they sit down. As they take their seats, Yu Il Shin notices a girl wearing a penguin mask and wonders if that's her theme. When he attempts to evaluate her abilities, he receives a notification stating that he has failed to evaluate. Irritated, he contemplates why he can't evaluate who she is while Seong Mina excitedly exclaims about the egg. All attention turns to the egg as Lee Ji Yi reveals that it is the egg of the SS class monster Gustav, the one that attacked the academy. He explains that they managed to bring this particular egg back from Africa out of the hundred, and it was the only one unhitched. They are currently tracking down the rest of the eggs. Yu Il Shin reflects on Gustav's egg, remembering the perilous encounter that almost took his life. Now, with 99 more of those eggs present, he observes the egg vibrating and wonders if it just moved. Suddenly, there is a collective moment of fear as they announce that Gustav's egg is moving, and it eventually breaks open, revealing a crocodile emerging. One of the hunters finds the crocodile cute, expressing a desire to take it home. The crocodile makes some sounds, prompting a hunter to inquire about what it is saying. The crocodile, however, utters something about finding its mother's archenemy. Yu Il Shin contemplates if he's the only one who can understand the creature's communication. The crocodile swiftly moves toward Yu Il Shin, declaring its intent to kill him and attempting to attack. However, it gets stuck in the air, unable to carry out its assault. He wonders why he is perceiving the situation in slow motion and considers that he might have become stronger. Being a low-class god now, he believes handling a mere crocodile should be easy and employs God's crushing forefinger. The frightened crocodile expresses its fear, anticipating its demise. Gal Junghyuk, an S-class hunter, intervenes by punching the crocodile and demanding to know where it thinks it is. The crocodile panics, insisting on the need to escape. Shin Yu, another S-class hunter, joins the attack, remarking on the crocodile's almost deceptive cute face. In response, the crocodile laments its impending demise. Shin Yu checks if everyone is okay. Yu Il Shin reflects on the situation, finding it awkward that they dealt with the threat before he could even attack. He acknowledges the prowess of S-Class hunters. Seong Mina starts crying and seeks comfort from Seong Miri, expressing fear of crocodiles. Seong Miri reassures her that everything is okay. Choi Kangsun expresses indignation at the audacity of the crocodile attacking him. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin observes the crocodile, which pleads for salvation if there's a god listening. Gal Junhyuk approaches the crocodile, questioning if it's still alive, and instructs it to die now, attempting to put his foot on it while calling for help. Go Sadyuk, the guildmaster of the Immortals Guild and an S-class hunter known as the One Man Army, intervenes, preventing Gal Junhyuk from taking further action. Gal Junhyuk questions why Go Sadyuk is interfering and he responds that they can't allow further damage to the creature. Go Sadyuk declares his intention to kill the crocodile in its current state and take it back to the guild for dissection. He insists on crushing the monster with his own hands immediately for satisfaction, dismissing the need to summon a spirit soldier. He becomes demonic and suggests that perhaps the younger generation will gain manners after a good beating. Choi Kangsun questions if Go Sadyuk is really going to summon a spirit soldier here, causing Seong Mina to become frightened. Choi Kangsun addresses Go Sadyuk as a senile old man, but Go Sadyuk remains firm. The spirit soldier arrives and exchanges hostile words with Go Sadyuk. However, Choi Kangsun intervenes, urging them to stop the conflict as hunters should not be fighting among themselves. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin sits at his place, observing the unfolding situation. He reflects that it feels like being five minutes before a disaster, expressing regret that there's no popcorn. He finds amusement in watching others fight while the crocodile continues to plea for help. Yu Il Shin wonders about this, and the crocodile implores God to save him. Curious, Yu Il Shin checks the details and discovers that it is Apostle Gustav's crocodile spawn, a male crocodile in use for five minutes, currently frightened to death. He contemplates the possibility that saving it might lead to a small miracle. Determined to intervene, he gets up but ponders how to do so while still witnessing the ongoing fight. A notification arrives, presenting the option for the low-grade good god to grant mercy to an insignificant monster seeking salvation, and he realizes he can save it without anyone's knowledge. With certainty, Yu Il Shin presses the yes button and secretly teleports the crocodile. As the crocodile disappears, he wonders if he has been scammed again. In the midst of this situation, his phone rings, prompting him to question what it could be. To his surprise, he realizes that he has teleported the crocodile to Antria. Observing Peng Hai looking at him and Anti becoming scared, he wonders how the crocodile ended up there. Puzzled by the crocodile's sudden cuteness, Yu Il Shin considers that the baby crocodile has vanished, 
and it seems no one has noticed it yet. Though Sadiq expresses his displeasure at the spirit soldier's lack of respect for his elders, threatening to turn him into a corpse, Choi Kangsen tries to intervene, requesting him to stop being so bullheaded. Go Sadiq remains adamant, vowing to kill the crocodile and crush it into fine powder. Yuil Shin contemplates the potential mess once those two individuals notice the situation. Feeling frustrated, he considers finding a nice way to navigate this predicament and attempts to walk away. However, the girl with the penguin mask grabs his arm, making him nervous. He worries that she might have seen something and nervously asks if she did. She looks at the spot where the crocodile is and he hastily suggests holding on and engaging in a conversation. She raises her hand in the air, and he anxiously wonders if she observed what happened. He addresses her as Miss Penguin, and she corrects him, stating her name is Peng Hai before walking away. Yuil Shin reflects on the eccentricities of many S-class individuals, concluding that it seems she did not notice the disappearance of the baby crocodile. Wondering what will happen next, Sword Demon enters with full force, asking if something happened and addressing him as Sword God. Yuil Shin sees an opportunity to use Sword Demon to escape the situation. Meanwhile, Shin Yu questions Sword Demon, asking if he's Kang Jeong. Angered, Sword Demon denies it, insisting there's a mistake. Shin Yu persists, telling him not to lie, and claims he's his one and only friend. Sword Demon maintains that there is a misunderstanding, prompting Yuil Shin to think that they seem to know each other, though it's none of his concern. He believes there's something he needs to address. Yuil Shin calls Sword Demon, seizes him by the hair, and confronts him about causing a commotion in the meeting room. He drags Sword Demon out, insisting on discussing matters outside. Sword Demon becomes sorrowful and tearful, apologizing to Sword God. The ongoing fight halts as everyone observes the scene. Sword Demon expresses a willingness to end his own life for not following Sword God's orders. Yuil Shin reassures him that this is not the case and urges him to remain quiet for a moment, grateful for Sword Demon's actions. After a while, Go Sadiq exclaims God damn it, where the hell is the crocodile spawn? He swears in his life that he will end the creature today, referring to it as a damn crazy. The spirit soldier questions what he is saying and reminds him that he was the one who took it away. Peng Hai raises her hand in response. Yuil Shin decides to leave and quickly reaches the Hunter Academy School Infirmary. He lies down on a bed and looks at his phone, contemplating the comfort of being alone. Auntie expresses her commitment to raising Crocodary, the baby crocodile entrusted to them by Lord Yuil Shin. Yuil Shin learns that Crocodary was the name given to the baby crocodile, and he notices a powerful magic seal around its neck, resembling a dog collar. Reflecting on Auntie's intention to raise it well, he wonders about the potential small miracle that might occur. Examining Crocodary's details on his phone, Shin Yu enters his room and asks if the game he's playing is enjoyable. Yuil Shin quickly gets up and inquires about the reason for Shin Yu's visit. Shin Yu states that there's something he needs to ask and activates his powers. Yuil Shin wonders why S-class hunters seem unfamiliar with the concept of conversation and contemplate what Shin Yu wants to inquire about. Shin Yu states that there's something he needs to ask, urging Yuil Shin to answer his question properly. Yuil Shin thinks about how S-class hunters seem unfamiliar with the concept of talking and wonders what Shin Yu wants to inquire about. He suggests that Shin Yu go ahead and ask his question, assuring him of his open-mindedness and emphasizing his advocacy for peace. Shin Yu proceeds to inquire about Kang Jeong, specifically Sword Demon, and their relationship. Yu Will Shin reflects that revealing the true nature of their relationship as a god and his fanatic believer is not something he can disclose. Instead, he casually mentions that they are just work colleagues and waves his hand. While technically true, he contemplates the necessity of Shin Yu resorting to threats to ask such a question, considering he is a teacher and Sword Demon is his assistant. Shin Yu persists and asks if he is also a member of the Tri-Faction. Meanwhile, Yu Will Shin inquires about the Tri-Factions, wondering what it is. He considers whether it might be some kind of imitation of the Chinese Triad, but ultimately concludes that he doesn't have much information on the matter. Shin Yu, angered by the lack of information, attempts to attack Yu Will Shin. Yuil Shin calmly observes the situation, realizing that the attack might be too slow but could still pose a threat given his current body. Thinking quickly, he employs the skill share, utilizing number one steel body to enhance his defenses. Suddenly, the window breaks and Sword Demon enters the room. He addresses Shin Yu, expressing disapproval for his actions against the Sword God. 
recognizing Sword Demon. Yu Il Shin becomes pleased, glad that Kang Jiom has finally come to see him. Sword Demon, becoming angry, demands that Yu Il Shin stop spouting nonsense. He inquires about how Kang Jiom has been and wonders why he hasn't been answering his calls, all while trying to evade Sword Demon's attacks. Annoyed, Sword Demon tells him to shut up, but Yu Il Shin persists, questioning why Kang Jiom hasn't been responding to him. Kang Jiom, irritated, reveals that he blocked Yu Il Shin's number because he was bothering him like a stalker. Surprised, Yu Il Shin reflects on the mysterious relationship between the two. Sword Demon continues, accusing Yu Il Shin of daring to annoy his master. Shin Yu is taken aback, asking if that guy is his master. Sword Demon asserts that he is indeed his master, the great sword god who has achieved the pinnacle of swordsmanship. He commands Shin Yu to kneel and worship him if he considers himself a swordsman. After a while, Shin Yu questions whether Yu Il Shin is so obsessed with worshipping even though the Tri-Factions was just a cult. He specifically addresses Kang Jiom and expresses his determination to expose the true identity of the culprit behind the transformation of Sword Demon. Yu Il Shin reflects on the mysterious nature of the Tri-Factions, pondering if it's related to a faction centered around three layers of a pork belly. Shin Yu, determined to reveal the truth, calls out to Yu Il Shin and challenges him, questioning if he can withstand his level of attack. He activates his Snake Sword Class Fang. Sword Demon encourages Yu Il Shin to demonstrate his prowess as the Sword God, emphasizing that Shin Yu is the type to listen only after receiving a good beating. Yu Il Shin, intrigued and confident in his newfound power, decides that it's a good opportunity to test his abilities in a real-life situation. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin reflects on how much stronger he has become after saving the Gaomi Kingdom. He acknowledges that being an S-class hunter makes him less susceptible to easy death, making him the perfect subject to test his newfound strength. He activates his skill share, no, one second steel body, tearing his clothes and revealing a muscular physique. Observing Yu Il Shin's transformation, Shin Yu speculates that it might be a skill from the Tri Factions. He questions whether this skill was used to defeat Gustav and believes it to be a mediocre ability from the Tri Factions cult. Shin Yu, confident in his speed as his primary asset, considers bulky bodies like Yu Il Shin's to be slow and initiates an attack, believing the outcome will be swift. Yu Il Shin, however, smiles, deeming it too slow, and contemplates ending the confrontation quickly. Shin Yu is about to attack him when Xiang Mina enters the room, scolding them for the noise. They all look at each other, and Yu Il Shin realizes he has forgotten that Miss Xiang Mina was asleep in the room. Shin Yu questions Xiang Mina's presence, and she walks toward him, calling him an evil person. She activates her skill, Illusory Space, but Yu Il Shin quickly tells her to hold on. Xiang Mina, determined to defend Yu Il Shin, prepares to attack Shin Yu. Xiang Mina's attack causes Shin Yu to fall and bleed. He struggles to breathe, calling for Sword Demon's help. However, Sword Demon, checking on Shin Yu, informs Yu Il Shin that he is still alive but persistent like a leech. Yu Il Shin breathes a sigh of relief, and Sword Demon, carrying Shin Yu over his shoulder, suggests disposing of him somewhere suitable. Yu Il Shin intervenes, proposing to use the healing power of God's Ring Finger on Shin Yu. Despite their history, he decides not to kill Shin Yu, considering Sword Demon's pledge to turn over a new leaf. Meanwhile, Xiang Mina quickly approaches him, holds his face, and asks if he is alright. He replies affirmatively, and she reassures him, saying not to worry, as a sister will protect him. He thinks it would be better if she used Nuna instead of sister. Xiang Miri joins them and asks the teacher if he is okay because she feels a sudden surge of energy. Observing them so close, she questions what is happening. He clarifies that it's not about this, and she notices the blood on the floor, prompting her to inquire about the situation. Xiang Mina holds Xiang Miri's hand and suggests going home. He seizes the opportunity, asking if he can trouble her to take Xiang Miri home. She agrees, and they leave. He begins cleaning the blood from the floor, reflecting on the irony that a nominal low-grade god is mopping the floor and thinking that someone still needs to clean up this mess. After a while, he receives a message from Endlessly Granting Abundance, who sends a heart emoticon and expresses that it's a good deed. He thinks, as expected, it's none other than Abundance Noon Nim. Go Myung Jai enters his room, notices the blood on the floor, and calls him. She questions the situation and asks what's with all the blood. He assures her it's nothing serious, he just fell. Curious about her sudden visit, he inquires if something happened. She hesitates before mentioning her grandfather and suggests that he really wants to meet the teacher. She adds that she thinks he should run. Shocked, he asks why her grandfather would want to see him and, more importantly, why he's advising him to run. 
Meanwhile, she replies well, she sees Night Paladin Hades greeting him through her necklace. He asks how Hades is doing, and she says her grandfather saw the evolved Hades, so he insisted on meeting him no matter what, along with her older sister. Then she exclaims, oh no, that sounds like a car, don't tell her they're already here. She says teacher, please hang in there, and then she's off, bowing down in front of him before running away. He asks her to hang in there while she thinks she's so sorry, teacher. He looks out from the window and wonders what's with her, and he sees a car, and someone comes out. He thinks, what if isn't that the old man he saw at the Hunter Association? He thinks that Go Myung Jai, Go Surname, then the Fire Temple Guild Captain, Go Sadyuk, is Miss Go Myung Jai's grandfather. He sees a girl resembling a ghost with him and thinks again, then wonders who the woman is, resembling a virgin ghost next to him. Choi Kangsun asks the zombie what business he has at the Sacred Academy, and where he thinks he is, expressing anger. Go Sadyuk asks if that is any concern of him, the muscled old man. He replies that if he experiments on the students again, as he did last time, he will end him. He laughs and says not to worry, as he just came to take a look at his granddaughter's school, and to meet someone. He asks who he's meeting, and the man replies that there's a guy called Yu Il Shin here. He asks Yu Il Shin, and he replies that's correct and urgently needs to have a word with that young man. Yu Il Shin thinks to himself, don't tell him. Did Go Sadyuk find out that he took that baby crocodile just how he know about that? The scene shifts to the principal's office, where they all sit, having tea. Yu Il Shin considers what excuse he should give and whether he should pretend it wasn't him, while Go Sadyuk sees him and acknowledges that they have already met before. He asks Yu Il Shin how old he is. Yu Il Shin replies that he's 23 years old and thinks about acting as casually as possible. He responds that he is 23 years old. Without checking martial compatibility, a three-year age gap is just perfect, he adds. Go Myung Hui laughs and says he's making her feel embarrassed, grandfather. Yu Il Shin wonders about martial compatibility, what Go Sadyuk is talking about, and thinks, moreover, it's more like a four-year difference rather than three, isn't it? Go Sadyuk declares him his future grandson-in-law, expressing pleasure at meeting him. Yu Il Shin thinks about his grandson-in-law and spits out his tea. Yu Il Shin thinks about what Go Sadyuk just said and wonders if he's suggesting that he marry that woman. Go Sadyuk refers to him as his son-in-law, and Yu Il Shin promptly declines, stating that he prefers to remain single, and has no intention of getting married. He apologizes. He reflects on when he started opposing marriage and then angrily places his cup on the plate, mentioning that he heard Go Sadyuk evolve the B-class zombie soldier Hades to S-class. Yu Il Shin now understands why Go Myung Jai was acting that way. In response, he mentions that he has never seen a skill like that before and implies that he would let someone like him go. Go Sadyuk adds that he doesn't want much, just for Yu Il Shin to give birth to three sons. That's all he needs. Yu Il Shin thinks to himself that Go Sadyuk wants to use him and scoffs at the idea of becoming a son-in-law in the old man's dreams. Meanwhile, Go Sadyuk places a check on the table and moves towards Yu Il Shin. Yu Il Shin asks what it is, and Go Sadyuk replies that it's a check for one trillion one. He states that he'll give it to him if he becomes his son-in-law. Choi Kangsun exclaims what? One trillion while Yu Il Shin becomes irritated. He questions whether he should go along with it if a trillion is at stake and if it feels like he's being sold away. Go Sadyuk repeats the amount, one trillion one, and Yu Il Shin thinks it's very tempting. He reflects that he would never have to worry about deadlines again. However, he looks at Go Myung Hui and thinks her face seems like she has already died four times and is waiting for him to come to the grave, too. He concludes that he can't marry a woman like that. He asks if Go Sadyuk is disappointed because he's trying to buy love with money, stating that he can't accept a marriage like this. He considers the idea of running away as he rises from his seat and walks out. Go Myung Hui calls for him to wait, and he stops, responding with a yes. He checks her details, finding that her name is Go Myung Hui, a mix between a human and a witch, aged 20, possessing the potential to transcend. She has charming eyes that can seduce any man. Choi Kangsun shouts no, don't look into her eyes as she activates her skill, captivating eye and approaches him. She asks him what he thinks about her eyes, and he replies wow, they're very pretty. She then pleads with him to become hers. Choi Kangsun interjects, telling her not to play with Yu Il Shin using that evil skill, and that it's not what love is. However, Go Sadyuk arrives and stops him from moving forward. Go Sadyuk warns that he'll face consequences if he tries anything with his granddaughter. Yu Il Shin responds, stating that both of them are crazy and he knows how many men have lost their minds to that skill. Calmly, Yu Il Shin refuses her. Shocked, she asks what, and he questions whether she wants him to repeat himself, asserting that he doesn't want to be hers and she's not his type. 
He walks out. As he leaves, he remarks that telling him to be hers is treating people like objects, and he's leaving now. The onlookers are shocked by this, and she wonders why her captivating eye didn't work on him. Outside the principal's office, Yuil Shin puts his hand to his mouth, contemplating the situation. He thinks about the one trillion one, considering it a shame but preferable to facing harm from that woman. Reflecting on her captivating eye, he acknowledges that she has a unique skill, even though it doesn't work for him. Meanwhile, the roof breaks from behind, and he thinks, anyway, a mix between a human and a witch, then her mother is the witch. Demonic hands emerge from the broken part of the roof and seize him. Go sad you can go Mew Huey sit in their car while she does some touch up. He asks her what he thinks about the husband's candidate. She replies that she likes him very much. He questions why she came with that makeup, mentioning her face being very horrible, recalling her ghost-like appearance. She asks grandpa if he thinks a man who marries her for her looks would be a good man. He concedes, saying well, that's true but he didn't expect her captivating eye to not work. She explains that's what made her want him even more and adds that only S-class hunters and other very advanced hunters can withstand her captivating eye. Shin looks around and thinks, is this go Sadyuk's pocket? He didn't think he'd go to these lengths, but these things are. He sees so many monsters and wonders why they're all salivating like that. He checks their details and realizes they are Gosadyuk's Yaksha soldiers, the necromancer's lifelong collection of Yaksha soldiers. They were ordered to kidnap Yuil Shin, but they are considering disobeying the orders and eating him instead. He thinks what, they want to eat him and laughs, saying that's really funny. One of the soldiers tries to attack him, and he thinks the soldier dares to try to eat him. He uses Skillshare number 1 steel body and transforms, with the soldier attacking him but unable to hurt him. He declares that these guys are no match for him, adding that maybe if there are a trillion of them, though, he might be a match. He asserts that he's a low-class god now, addressing them abusively. Yuil Shin attacks the soldier and throws it away, catching the attention of the other soldiers. He remarks that they're large, but it's all just flesh, and instructs them to come at him instead of lazing around. He proceeds to attack and defeat them, stating that they are nothing compared to a legion of a thousand ants. He uses God's condemning middle finger and burns them. The female general wonders about the nature of his skill, considering that their Yaksha soldiers, who have never lost before, have just been defeated by him alone. She speculates if he perhaps has the gaze of a god. Yuil Shin looks at both of them and wonders if they are the leaders. Upon checking the details, he finds that the male general was once a follower of a strong and deceitful beast, according to Gosadyuk's Yaksha general's history. Checking the female general's details, he discovers that Gosadyuk's Yaksha general was once a follower of the seducing knight of sexual desires. He contemplates the presence of two malevolent god followers and comprehends why Gosadyuk is so formidable. However, the sight of five color eyes reminds him of Gomyunghui's gaze while the male general charges toward Yuil Shin. He perceives the general is quite formidable, utilizing God's crushing forefinger to defeat him. Meanwhile, a female general believes her enchanting gaze has no effect on him and speculates that he must be the rumored young god known for immense power. Approaching him, she wonders if he is volunteering to be defeated, but she ultimately bows down and implores young god, please have mercy on them. He ponders the possibility of a Yaksha employing psychic skills and seeks to identify her. Activating Blind God's Eye, an inherent authority, he skims through the history of the Yaksha Great General. He delves into her flashback, revealing that before she became a Yaksha, her name was Lilith. She was the daughter and follower of Seducing Knight of Sexual Desires, a formidable evil goddess. However, Seducing Knight of Sexual Desires lost to the God of Destruction and barely managed to escape. He explains that her world was already dying, and to regain her powers, she needed the soul of a strong and innocent S-class. Hence, she sent Lilith of Captivating Eye to Earth, where Lilith encountered Gosadyuk. She explains to him that, with her captivating eye, someone like him is easy to handle. Irritated, he emphasizes that he doesn't have time for her. However, Captivating Eye did not affect Gosadyuk. Instead of manipulating him, she fell in love with him, eventually marrying him and giving birth to a child. Unfortunately, her identity was discovered by the god of destruction's nether dragon, bringing her to the brink of death. As she lies in his arms, on the verge of death, both of them in tears, he suggests forming a contract. 
He proposes that she can grant his wish and take his soul, to which she agrees. Yuil Shin returns to the present and reflects that she is Go Myung Hui's grandmother, and granting a soul a wish is an unwritten law that has been passed down since ancient times. He informs her that Go Sadyuk's wish is to revive her, but she rejects it, leading to him turning her into a yaksha. Yuil Shin speculates that Go Sadyuk wanted to be with her forever, even in this transformed state. As he receives a message, Bountiful Abundance wipes a tear and implores him to have mercy on her. However, he remarks that she tried to eat him, expressing uncertainty about showing mercy. Another message from Bountiful Abundance leaves him taken aback. Yuil Shin, however, doesn't consider it a bad idea. He checks her details, finding out that her name is Lilith, she is married, and she is an S-class with transcendence potential. He contemplates the possibility that she may become his follower as he assesses her raised will. Meanwhile, he contemplates that, of course, he'll show mercy, considering she could become his next S-class follower. Moreover, he sees the potential for a plus-one deal, possibly even gaining Go Sadyuk as his granddaughter, a three birds with one stone scenario. He receives a message from the Thousand Blade, commending him for being as calculating as they are, and Bountiful Abundance also expresses gratitude for his mercy. He believes that the most important thing is to become stronger, especially before the God of Destruction or any similar threat invades. He harbors a strong dislike for that particular adversary. She advises him to equip himself with the Good God title, and he reflects on obtaining such privileges now that he's a low-class god. He has a positive premonition that something good is going to happen regardless of his actions. Placing his god's healing ring finger on her forehead, he proceeds to heal her. After a while, he senses a ring circle forming on his head. She becomes emotional, wondering why the young god is experiencing this. Simultaneously, he contemplates why they are all melting and realizes that it's a good god skill. He confirms that it is indeed a healing skill, and a notification informs him that the Yaksha soldiers are being purified. However, he anticipates that some pain will accompany the exchange of evil and good. As a result, they all transform into angels. She expresses her realization to the young god, stating that she was mistaken, and the feeling is incredibly good. It makes her feel like she has been reborn. A notification arrives, informing him that the Yaksha soldiers have been resurrected as angel soldiers, all thanks to Yuil Shin's mercy. He reflects on this unexpected outcome, thinking angel soldiers, that's not what he expected at all. But more importantly, why did they get so much smaller? The evil god declares Lilith a traitor, expressing her return. Yuil Shin receives a notification stating that thanks to his mercy, the spirit soldiers have successfully evolved into angel soldiers. He reflects that the result of evolution and rebirth appears to be random, as the appearance is different from what he had anticipated. A message from Endlessly Granting Abundance advises him to accept it, given that this is the limit of a lower-grade god. He contemplates the idea of rebirth, realizing that he should go see Go Sadyuk soon before he dies. The scene shifts to the headquarters of an immortal guild, where Go Sadyuk stands near a window and reminisces about Lilith. He expresses his disdain for Yuil Shin, calling him a punk and questioning how he dares to refuse to become his son-in-law. Go Sadyuk believes that Yuil Shin must have come to his senses by now. He reflects on his subspace, known as Miniature Hell, noting that even S-class individuals who enter this place all come out crawling. He commands the spirit soldiers to release Yuil Shin, and as the portal opens, Yuil Shin enters the room accompanied by angel soldiers. Confused, Yuil Shin asks about the meaning of this and questions if he called for him. Looking at him with surprise, he inquires how Yuil Shin is unharmed. Yuil Shin casually remarks on the nice office. Growing angry, he demands to know what's with these flies and where his spirit soldiers have gone. Yuil Shin responds that it's a long story and suggests letting him heal his chest first. Annoyed, he questions how Yuil Shin knew and begins to feel that something is amiss. He realizes there is no energy coming from the spirit soldiers, not a single one, and Lilith's energy is also gone. In a fit of anger, he grabs Yuil Shin by the neck, demanding to know what he did to Lilith, all the while thinking that he needs to hurry and heal him. Go Sadyuk once again demands to know what he did to Lilith, but he laughs and cryptically states that things just turned out this way for some reason. He insists on healing him first. Go Sadyuk, frustrated, declares that he will ensure he never opens his mouth again for the rest of his life while applying more pressure to his neck. The perpetrator acknowledges it can't be helped, planning to let him sleep for a bit, and then quickly heal him. Using a muted crushing index finger of God, he inflicts pain on Go Sadyuk, who cries out in agony and falls down, screaming due to the pain in his chest. The perpetrator reflects that he hasn't done anything yet and wonders if it has already started. 
Checking Gosaduk's details, he notes that Gosaduk is a male who has been in use for 61 years and is connected through the law of causality with seductive and lustful night. Lilith, witnessing Gosaduk's pain, flies towards him, exclaiming a denial while he expresses surprise at the psychic skill in use. Meanwhile, Lilith confirms that it's indeed her, revealing that she has been reborn, all thanks to Yu Shin. She mentions that she can now see him outside of his subspace, though she will still have to use her psychic skills. Both become emotional, and he begins to vomit blood. Looking at Yu Shin, she urgently requests him to hurry. He receives a notification indicating that the rest of Lilith's history will be shown again. The story transitions into a flashback where the evil god observes them. In this scene, Lilith is about to die in Gosaduk's hands, and she accuses Lilith of daring to betray her just for an insignificant person. Lilith questions whether she thinks she will simply let the two of them be. Using magic, the evil god takes Lilith's soul and declares that the day Lilith is reborn will be the day Gosaduk's wish comes true. The evil god makes a mark on Gosaduk's chest, vowing that his soul will be devoured by her. She promises to bring him all the pain and despair in the world before tearing him into pieces. This, she declares, will be her prophecy as a great evil god. Yuil Shin returns to the present, thinking that he can't allow what just happened. He is determined to protect his precious S-classes. Approaching Gosaduk, he politely requests to excuse him for a bit, and utilizes the crushing index finger of the god on the evil god's mark, successfully removing it. Reflecting on the power of the crushing index finger of the god, he notes its own, off feature for a specific target, allowing him to switch off the mark. The evil god shouts in anger, questioning how he dares to interfere, and moves closer. Yuil Shin comments that she has finally descended for a visit. In response, she screams that a lower grade god like him dares to lay his hands on her sacrifices. He receives a notification about seductive and lustful night, revealing that it is a female entity that has been in use for 69,000 years. It was once a god but is now a declining existence. He contemplates the evil god as a declining existence, drawing parallels to the fake firehead sun god he had previously defeated. Recalling firehead, he sarcastically greets her as Miss Lustful. He acknowledges the absence of the divine sword of the heavenly demon and the lack of a skillshare with the sword demon, stating that there is no need for those when facing a knockoff. He walks out from the window, ready to attack her, declaring that the insignificant one is none other than her. He employs the heavenly demon divine sword in his attack. Following the attack, he jumps onto the road, causing people to be scared upon seeing him. An individual questions the unusual sight, wondering what is happening while another person notes that a rift has been torn open and advises others to run. After a while, he instructs everyone to step aside, stating that he will take care of this situation. People promptly run away as she questions his audacity in attacking her. He casually responds, asking what's so daring about it. She retorts that she was once in existence that a lower grade god like him wouldn't even dare to look at and invites him to behold her true form. Remaining calm, he looks at her and nonchalantly asks to see her declining existence. Endlessly, Granting says something to him, but he struggles to understand and asks her to clarify her message. Endlessly Granting Abundance expresses concern about him. She mentions that seductive and lustful night was on the same level as the terrifying great evil god, the god of destruction. Yuil Shin questions if it's the same level as the god of destruction an evil god transforms into a demonic monster. Observing her, he thinks that, given that appearance, it is indeed terrifying. He receives a message from Soundless Nightmare, who offers to take care of it for him in exchange for an offering of roughly 10 million humans. He thinks, please stop spouting ridiculous nonsense and just go away, while all slashing Heavenly Blade clicks his tongue and asks what he is doing when he just needs to kill Gosaduk. Meanwhile, he inquires about Gosaduk and observes him with Lilith at the broken window. He checks the details and finds that he is connected through the law of causality with seductive and lustful night, serving as the medium enabling her to descend on Earth. He thinks that the method mentioned by that unscrupulous evil merchant, Heavenly Sword, is typical of him. He believes that once Gosaduk is gone, there is no way for that leftover to emerge. He asserts that he refuses and only writes happy endings, just so he knows, and insists on having no thanks for even one sad ending. He questions the claim that seductive and lustful night is on the same level as the god of destruction, stating that it was a long time ago, and now she's just a leftover. She counters, saying she has destroyed many worlds due to such audacity, even though she has declined. And as he mentioned, what she is now will suffice in destroying a newly born grade god like himself. After a while, Yu Il Shin utilizes the skill share of number one in Xiang Mina's powers. Meanwhile, Go Sadyuk advises his grandson-in-law to run, 
emphasizing that she's not someone he can fight until the S-Class hunters arrive to back them up. Yuil Shin activates the steel body and psychokinesis combo to attack her, and they both attempt to stop each other's attacks. He successfully throws her away. Shocked, Go Sadyuk remarks, no way to think our grandson-in-law is this powerful. He reflects on how Go Sadyuk keeps calling him his grandson-in-law, and suddenly, he feels the urge to write a sad ending, becoming irritated. Despite his thoughts, he acknowledges that she was able to survive that one, finding it a pain. He employs the crushing index finger of the god, Off Fisher, to close the portal tightly. She shouts, and he screams, stop trying so hard and go back to his world. Meanwhile, the evil god attempts to stop the portal door and asks if he, a lower grade god, is trying to pit himself against her. He decides to show him their difference while employing the crushing index finger of god to close it. An explosion occurs, and Go Sadyuk becomes shocked, exclaiming as he falls down on the floor in a worse condition. He remarks on her strength, stating, so damn strong. She questions how someone like him dares to try to prevent her descent. He believes she's definitely stronger than Firehead and equips the evil god title. Getting up, he thinks about how he's different now. He flies towards her to attack, shouting the good god and evil god title combo. She exclaims, how is that possible for a newly born lower grade god? He tells her to stop resisting and just go away, calling her a pathetic evil god leftover. Her feathers fly in the air as the portal closes slowly. Then, he employs the crushing index finger of god to close the portal door, receiving a notification that seductive and lustful night is a formidable existence worth 6s classes. He smiles, thinking he knows that the fake firehead sun god is worth 4 people. Another notification arrives, indicating the progress of the Intermediate God Promotion Quest, with an S-Class and a probability of transcending sacrifices at 20 divided by 100. He contemplates that at this rate, he might get promoted as an Evil God first with 100 S-Class sacrifices, anticipating filling this one up soon. Meanwhile, he observes Angel Soldiers bringing Go Sadyuk down from his room near him. He asks what's going on, noting that the evil god is already gone as he sees Go Sadyuk unconscious. Meanwhile, Lilith expresses concern, stating that her husband is going to die if this continues. Although the mark might have disappeared, the curse still remains, and she pleads for mercy. Go Sadyuk starts vomiting blood again. Seeing this, Yu Il Shin thinks it looks like the curse will remain even if the foolish evil god dies. He considers that as an S-class, he can't die, so he sits near him, activates the healing ring finger of God to heal him, and places his finger on his forehead. After some time, he wakes up and exclaims, impossible. Just how on earth is even an S-class healer capable of doing this? Lilith comes closer, hugs him, and becomes emotional. She expresses gratitude, stating that he's alive, and credits Yu Il Shin for it. He looks at them and thinks that this is the kind of happy ending he wants. Even if he dies, he will always be a writer of happy endings. After a while, he receives a notification congratulating Archangel Lilith and Go Sadyuk for becoming believers of Yu Il Shin, and the S-Class with the probability of transcending believers reaches 12 one hundredth. He thinks about Lilith Nunim becoming an Archangel by default since she was reborn from being a spirit soldier general, and believes that she definitely deserves it. The scene shifts a few days later, within the vicinity of the S-Class Amazon dungeon in Brazil. Arachna sits in front of a large crocodile monster, Alpha, and he asks her to tell him again about the bug that came out of a dungeon. He mentions that he can help her avenge his mother, Gustav. Arachna contemplates that an army of 100 billion and three apostles ended up being decimated. She fears the Emperor will kill her if she simply returns like this and decides she has to make use of the lizard. And this way, she can take Yu Il Shin's head with her when she goes back. The crocodile monster asks her to tell him again about the bug that came out of a dungeon. She responds affirmatively, stating that she can help him avenge his mother, Gustav. She claims to have the skills and a plan to assist him, Lord Alpha, in killing the evil god, Yu Il Shin. He agrees, saying he'll listen to it now. The scene shifts to Yu Il Shin, who opens his eyes and asks where he is. Upon seeing a muscular man, he wonders how many fights and how much training it would take to get a body like that. He gets up and asks the man who he is. The man introduces himself as eternal seeker of truth and mentions that he has something urgent to say. He made some causality adjustments, revealing that the apostle, who is also a clone of the god of destruction, has awakened. He emphasizes that in order to overcome the trials he will soon face, prevent his fate of destruction, obtain the divine title of an intermediate god, and be eligible to join the Festival of Gods, he needs to take action. 
Yu Il-shin goes to his office, sits on a chair, and reflects on the situation. He thinks about the dream involving the eternal seeker of truth and finds it bothering because the man gives off the same vibes as the truth seeker of eternity. He wonders if he's a new stalker. Meanwhile, he contemplates that, of course, he will become an intermediate god. However, the idea of an apostle who is also a clone of the god of destruction, and the festival of gods leaves him puzzled. Lilith arrives and informs him that he's awake. She mentions that she'll go get her husband since he's currently in a meeting with the principal, and expressed a desire to ask something once he has woken up. Irritated, he says there is no need for that and believes it will likely be about the grandson-in-law nonsense again, finding it bothersome. He receives a notification regarding the report results after dispatching angel soldiers. The angel soldiers have been performing miracles in Antria, causing the number of his believers to exponentially increase. He also gets a notification about a quest, intermediate good god promotion and progress. The count for common believers is 130,233,321 divided by 10 billion. He appreciates that thanks to Lilith, he gained a new auto skill, and the angel soldiers managed to increase his believers by as much as 30 million. He contemplates that he doesn't know what they're doing in Antria, but it's a miracle how the number of his believers just keeps on going up even if he doesn't do anything. He thinks about his earlier wonderment regarding when he'd be able to collect 10 billion believers, realizing it's a totally different matter if it can be done automatically. He asks Miss Lilith why she doesn't stay at Gosaduk's house now that he's fine. She responds that as an archangel who has been reborn through his mercy, she has a duty to stay by Lord Yu Il-shin's side and be of assistance to him. He asks if that's so, just as he hears some voices from outside, and there's a fight happening, a battle between an S-class and an A-class. Hunter Shin Yu and Teacher Sword Demon are at it. He quickly gets up from his chair, looks down from the window, and asks, who's fighting whom? Shin Yu expresses his dismay, questioning how he could do that to him. A student remarks that it's S-Class Hunter Shin Yu, and another student comments on his unkempt look, wondering if he is filming a survival entertainment show somewhere. They capture the ongoing fight. Shin Yu questions how he could leave someone on a deserted island and whether he has any idea how difficult it was to get out of there. Sword Demon responds that he should have just killed him himself, criticizing those damn traitors for not doing their disposal job properly. Shin Yu asserts that even if he's his precious friend, he won't forgive him and will beat him up. Kang Jeom rushes to attack him. Meanwhile, Sword Demon beckons, inviting him to witness the might of the Heavenly Demon Divine Sword. Simultaneously, he prepares to launch an attack. One of the students exclaims it's truly amazing, and another expresses disbelief, commenting on the incredibility of watching an S-Class battle, all while they enjoy the spectacle with popcorn in hand. Yu Il Shin announces that he is facing Sword Demon, who has been honing his skills with the Heavenly Demon Divine Sword. Additionally, he mentions Shin Yu, recognizing his considerable skill. Glancing behind him in the room, Yu Il Shin remarks that it's already lunchtime. Indeed, the stomach clock is quite accurate. Furthermore, he notes that today's menu features none other than the expensive hotel-style ginseng chicken soup, emphasizing that he cannot afford to miss it. Turning to Lilith, he suggests going to get some food and they proceed to the mess, walking towards it to enjoy their lunch. After a while, he finishes his lunch and thinks he's glad he agreed to be a teacher. He can't believe he gets to eat the expensive ginseng chicken soup for free. Suddenly, Sword Demon crashes into their food through a window, breaking the table. He sits on the floor and verbally abuses Shin Yu, and both of them become angry. Shin Yu enters and shouts at him to surrender now, stating that he's not an opponent he can take. Yu Il Shin mentions his ginseng chicken while Shin Yu looks at him and declares himself the self-proclaimed sword god of the tri-faction. He remarks that it's good timing for their meeting, although he is still upset about his interrupted lunch. Shin Yu continues, saying he still has a debt to repay to Yu Il Shin, who brainwashed Kang Jeom and the wicked leader of the tri-factions. Yu Il Shin thinks that this enemy of ginseng chicken soup keeps spouting nonsense about the tri-factions, wondering what that even means. Shin Yu declares that even if he has to beat the daylights out of him today, pointing towards Yu Il Shin, he will definitely extract a confession from him. While contemplating whether it's tri-factions or tri-layered meat, he dismisses it as none of his concern. He shouts about how Yu Il Shin did this to his expensive ginseng chicken soup, stating that he will never forgive him, as he couldn't even eat one spoonful. Yu Il Shin asks what he's preparing for, to which Shin Yu replies that he should brace himself. Shin Yu then activates the all slashing Heavenly Blade's extreme sword, waving a spoon towards him. Sword Demon comments that Shin Yu is a fool for daring to be the sword god's opponent, 
and feels the gap between their classes. Shin Yu retorts, questioning how he plans to fight with just a spoon while also noting the many openings he's leaving. He reflects on Kang Jiom's transformation, blaming it on him. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin asserts that a spoon is more than enough for an enemy of Jinseng Chicken Soup, vowing to beat him until he's an inch from death. He wonders how on earth Sword Demon was able to trick Kang Jiom but resolves that no matter how much of an idiot he is, he won't let him off lightly. Simultaneously, Shin Yu activates his Snake Sword class Fang, and Yu Il Shin also prepares to launch an attack. Shin Yu declares that he will reveal his identity as he runs to attack Yu Il Shin. He strikes Yu Il Shin's forehead with his spoon and quickly moves away. Yu Il Shin, now bleeding, wonders about the sudden attack. Observing his soup bowl, he vows not to let Shin Yu off easily and promises to make him cry as much as the chicken soup spilt. Shin Yu dismisses Yu Il Shin's emphasis on chicken soup, growing angrier. He questions if Yu Il Shin really wants to die, to which Yu Il Shin responds that he just let his guard down earlier and won't go easy on him this time. Shin Yu challenges him to see it, approaching him. Yu Il Shin thinks Shin Yu is fast but foolishly coming within his reach. Nevertheless, Shin Yu hits him on the head again with the spoon, stating that it's for the chicken wing. Seated, he thinks about the chicken soup and exclaims, Chicken soup. He shouts, challenging Shin Yu to see how long he can talk about that stupid chicken soup. He beats him while mentioning different chicken items and asks if that's all he's got. Concerned that Shin Yu might pass out, he comments that he only beat him up enough for one bowl, but he spilt two. Shin Yu replies that he has underestimated him. He wasn't going to use this skill because it might hurt others in the area. He activates his skill, Teiji Double Blade Skill Unlock. Other people standing nearby comment on the wind, mentioning that they can't see. Sword Demon tells Shin Yu that he's out of his mind and asks if he intends to hurt innocent bystanders. Shin Yu thinks it's all for him and Sword Demon. He activates his Serpent Sword class special technique, Dragon Fang. Yu Il Shin announces the Mount Hua Sect special technique, Plum Blossom Rampage. A student observes petals inside the building, and many petals fly in the air. Xiang Miri comments on how nice it smells. Shin Yu says he's too late, while Yu Il Shin turns his spoon and says, disappear, activating his skill. Shockingly, he thinks about the realm of imagination that can completely nullify the opponent's skill. It's a skill that can defeat even an SS class in just one go, or at least an SS class. No, he realizes, it's more than that. Sword Demon explains that it is the realm of the Sword God. Shin Yu reflects on how foolish he was to try to win against someone like him and attack him, throwing him away. Sword Demon runs towards him, addressing him as Sword God, bowing in front of him, pleading for mercy and asking to spare Shin Yu's life. Shin Yu thinks that even though he knew him, he still thought of him as a friend. Yu Il Shin reassures him not to worry, stating that he will take care of it. Sword Demon replies that if that's what he will do, then he will follow him, pointing his sword towards him. Shin Yu comments on the drama, activates his skill telekinesis, snatches his sword, and clarifies that he means he's going to heal Shin Yu, telling him there's no need to be so dramatic. After a while, his god's healing ring finger is activated. Shin Yu and he both get up, and he asks, how can this happen? Sword Demon inquires if he sees that and if he is the sword god he serves. He replies, yes, he's right, and he also bows down, saying he is the real sword god, and he's sorry that he didn't realize sooner. He adds that he doesn't like where this is going while Sword Demon laughs. One of the students asks if teacher Yu Il Shin just won against Shin Yu. Another student exclaims that's super cool. They all go out. A huge Yu looks at him from outside and thinks he has found him, and it is him. He believes he needs to report to the Three Heroes Society right away. Shin Yu requests to be taken in as his disciple, and Yu Il Shin receives a notification indicating that he has successfully instilled obsessive faith through overwhelming power and fear. Shin Yu has now become zealous, and Yu Il Shin also receives a notification regarding a quest. The quest involves an S-class individual with transcendence potential, and the count of sacrifices has reached 13 divided by 100. Reflecting on this, Yu Il Shin acknowledges that he was also once an S-class individual. He welcomes S-class followers but mentions that there is still an unresolved matter. When asked about the meaning, Yu Il Shin explains the saying that one shouldn't disturb even a dog while it's eating. He expresses the need to apologize to both Shin Yu and the chicken. Looking at the chicken, he apologizes for interrupting its meal and asks for a moment. He then communicates on his phone, inquiring about the amount of cash that can be prepared immediately. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin contemplates the matter of cash and ponders its total amount. He recalls hearing that Shin Yu is the youngest son of a wealthy family. After some time, a person arrives with two bags of cash and identifies himself as the general manager of the Oseong group. 
he requests Yu Il Shin to take care of the young master. Shin Yu, in turn, acknowledges the offering, stating that it may not be much but is intended as compensation for the chicken soup. He reflects on this as the compensation he received for a mishap involving spilt chicken soup. He responds that if he becomes his master, he will give it his all, so please accept it. Meanwhile, Sword Demon questions who he thinks he is and attempts to convey that he won't become his disciple. Yuil Shin instructs Sword Demon to engage in special training by running around the field a hundred times immediately. Sword Demon agrees and leaps out of the window. He contemplates who would accept someone who attempted to kill him as a disciple. He states that someone like him can't be his disciple and becomes visibly saddened. Yuil Shin places a hand on his shoulder and acknowledges that he fully understands the depth of his regret for his actions. Yuil Shin adds that incidents like spilt food can happen in life. In response, he expresses gratitude for his mercy, noting that it's no wonder Sword Demon serves him. Then, he inquires if Yuil Shin would take him in as his disciple as well. Yuil Shin internally considers the potential annoyance of accepting someone who is already in S-Class, seeing no clear benefit in doing so. He receives a message from the Thousand Blades that cuts all, stating that this is how the world of cold, hard business works, and applauds the situation. He thinks he doesn't need such praise and contemplates finding a way to motivate him while also taking his money. After some time, he asks if he would like to become his disciple. Excitedly, he agrees. He then enthusiastically states, let's do this and hands him a book. Upon opening it, he looks surprised and exclaims, this is wise Teiji sword and asks if he is really giving him this. He confirms, stating that he bought it before realizing it was part of the thousand blades that cut all scam. But now it's proving to be useful. A notification about the book details appears, indicating that it's wise Teiji sword, a book left behind by Zhang Sinfeng, with a price of 20 million god coins. He instructs him to go and learn wise Teiji sword before returning emphasizing that he will accept him as his disciple afterwards. He asks if he cannot do it quietly. He quickly assures him that they can and will learn it to become his disciple. He thinks he has fallen for it and says he will look forward to it. He also instructs him not to come to him unless they have completed it. He agrees, expressing understanding, and bows down in front of him. They state that they will now take their leave to learn it. He waves his hand in reply as a gesture for them to leave, saying okay, and adds that they should hurry. As he goes out, he thinks everything is going his way, and touches the money bags. He contemplates what he should do with all this money. On the other side, behind the academy building, Hu Ju engages in a conversation on a call. He reports as a secret agent of the Three Heroes Society's academy branch, referring to himself as a dark ghost. He states that the one who stole the Mount Hua sword is Yu Il Shin and suggests that to regain it, they'll need to assassinate him. The scene shifts to China, where Xiao Ming, the country's strongest hunter, attacks a giant monster, attempting to kill it. She remarks that the monster was super weak for an S-Class and questions if there are any that are stronger. She expresses dissatisfaction with the current level of weakness, and a masked man, who is a descendant of swordsman named Xiao Ming, arrives. He informs her that orders have come from the Three Heroes Society, instructing her to kill a Korean Academy teacher, Yu Il Shin who appears to be an SS class and retrieved the stolen Mount Hua sword. She becomes happy and declares that an SS class opponent should satisfy her sword. She vows to cut off his head and states that he should wait a bit for her Asura soul-stealing sword, promising to offer plenty of delicious blood to her sword. The scene shifts to inside the academy cafeteria, where Yu Il Shin takes the money bags and walks out. While reflecting on the prophet, he acknowledges that even though he has been promoted to a god, money remains the best. He appreciates the financial gain but notes that he'll have to learn more about the Three Heroes Society, sensing something fishy. He recalls Eternal Seeker of Truth and thinks about the God of Destruction's follower, and the waking copy, feeling that they are related. Suddenly, Sword Demon appears in front of him, breathing heavily. Yuil Shin asks if he is already done. Sword Demon replies that a hundred laps are nothing. Yuil Shin commends him for doing well and suggests going to get chicken and beer, with him treating Sword Demon. Sword Demon becomes happy and agrees. They both reach home, and Sword Demon becomes drunk. Yuil Shin observes that Sword Demon's appetite has increased after becoming a low-class god and notes that he ate almost all of the ten chickens on his own. Looking at the numerous bones, he thinks once again, well, he guesses that's how much he needs to eat to regain his divine power, and he can afford to order ten chickens. He thinks it's all thanks to the money from Shin Yu. Looking at a building, he contemplates that this building is now his, as he's a landlord, and being a low-class god allows him to treat himself this way. 
He reflects that he has saved many lives and believes eating 10 chickens is fine, but cleaning up afterwards is a hassle. He wishes the bones would jump into the trash on their own. He considers hiring a maid or using telekinesis when the bones start to move. He wonders why they were suddenly moving on their own when he didn't even use telekinesis. He receives a notification that follower Gosadyuk's Yaksha connection has been added to skill sharing. Another notification informs him about Yaksha Connection Class S Gosadyuk's exclusive technique, stating that the stronger the resentment, the easier it is to put to work. He thinks about the Yaksha Connection and ponders the meaning of the stronger the resentment, the easier it is to put to work. Regardless, he decides to try it out. He uses skill sharing on Gosadyuk's Yaksha Connection on the bones, and they transform into chicken monsters. He wonders what just happened. Il Shin gazes at the chicken monster and inquires if this is what is supposed to happen, who claims revenge on the humans who killed and fried them and the monster attacks him while he shouts and contemplates what kind of skill this revenge on humans is. He states that he understands how they feel, but revenge is a bit difficult. Despite this, they continue to express their desire for revenge and call upon the great and merciful God who has awakened them, asking for offerings to kill. He thinks they might actually try to kill him and wonders what he should do. Simultaneously, he receives a notification asking if he will dispatch the new Yaksha Chicken Legion to the Hive, a region of the Empire. He remarks that it's nice but questions if the Hive is a beehive and ponders if those individuals in the Empire are planning something again. He receives another notification explaining that a hive refers to a factory where red insect soldiers are mass-produced, serving as the main force of the Empire's army and one of the sources of the Emperor's power. He asks if that's so, feeling somewhat looked down upon for not properly retaining this information. He decides it's his turn now to accept the hive. The hive guards sense movement, and one of them questions if it's thundering and why it's so loud. Upon seeing the chicken monster, the guard exclaims, run, it's a monster and cries for help. Yuil Shin receives a notification about the quest, stating that the intermediate class evil god promotion is in progress at 122,234 out of 10 billion. He thinks of it as a miracle where sacrifices increase without him doing anything, appreciating the benefits of automatic hunting. Meanwhile, a notification is received due to automatic hunting and increased followers. The automatic administration menu will be activated, and once activated, facility expansion and species evolution will be automatically carried out even when he is not present. The price for this is 20 million god coins, and he is asked if he will progress with this. He thinks, of course, yes, he would never say no to this. This is what people call unearned income, like a landlord. He sees the chicken monster on his phone, lies down on his bed, and his phone vibrates again. He thinks Sword Demon left as he ordered, and there are still a lot of unanswered questions. However, he did get some information about the Three Heroes Society, and Sword Demon said that it's an unorthodox faction. The story shifts to a flashback where Yu Il Shin sits with Sword Demon. They are both eating chicken while Yu Il Shin asks Sword Demon about the society of the three heroes. Sword Demon responds that the Three Heroes Society is an unorthodox faction organization with a highly effective information network. He explains that, on the surface, they operate as a hunter guild, but in reality, they have numerous spies strategically placed worldwide. These spies gather information on hunters who might pose a threat to the organization and eliminate them. Sword Demon mentions that they both left that organization, and now they are both wanted by them. Yuil Shin inquires if there are any other spies in the academy. Sword Demon replies that the spies are prohibited from knowing each other's identities, making it impossible for them to be aware of others. Yuil Shin expresses his disdain for such an organization and he apologizes for not having extensive information but emphasizes one crucial point. Sword Demon states that the sword technique from the Mount Hua sect originally belongs to the Three Heroes Society. Since they have noticed that he possesses it, they will undoubtedly take some action. He acknowledges that, of course, they are no match for him. He wonders what was stolen and speculates that the Thousand Blades, the fraud, sold him something he had stolen. The narrative returns to the present, and he receives a message from the Thousand Blades that cuts through everything. He expresses excitement, thinking it's just like what he anticipated. He also realizes that he cannot let those individuals be, especially since they dared to harm his students. Sensing someone at his door, he assumes it must be the spy student. Upon opening the door, he finds Hu Ju, who proceeds to tell him what happened to her. The scene shifts to an earlier moment in Hu Ju's room, where she sits in front of a masked man. He hands her a piece of paper, stating that it is a charm enabling teleportation. He instructs her to use it to bring Yuil Shin to their location, 
assuring her that the expert martial artists of the Three Heroes Society will handle the rest. She agrees, contemplating what to do, torn between following the order from the executives and her recognition that his teacher is genuinely a good person. Returning to the present, Yu Il Shin reflects on his surprise upon discovering that she is a spy. He acknowledges that it's fortunate he learned about it early on, thanks to the blind god's eye. Checking her details, he finds that she is Hu Ju, a 19-year-old female human who is described as both dumb but kind. She identifies as a spy of the Three Heroes Society, and a girl who independently takes care of her sick mother. He informs her that Sword Demon took her mother to a safe place. She acknowledges this, having called him and expressed gratitude. Meanwhile, he contemplates the audacity of using her sick mother as a hostage for espionage, expressing anger and vowing to eliminate them all. She informs him that Sword Demon even covered the expensive hospital fees, and she thanks him profusely. He reassures her, stating that he has ample financial resources, and suggests they proceed to the location where they are waiting. She agrees and shows him the charm, explaining that she will use it for teleportation. Convinced of his abilities, especially having defeated the SS-class Gustav, and monsters single-handedly, she teleports them. She believes he can rescue her from the clutches of the Three Heroes Society, and places her trust in him as they reach their destination. Yuil Shin looks around and inquires if this is the mountain behind the academy. Digak arrives and commends him, stating that they will take it from there. Yuil Shin examines Digak and checks his details, revealing that his name is Digak, a 50-year-old male human and martial artist from Shaolin. He has successfully taken out at least half a truck's worth of S-Class hunters. Spotting another man with him, Yuil Shin checks his details, identifying him as Peng Mu Lin. He is a male human who is 40 years old and a successor, having eliminated at least a whole truck's worth of S-Class hunters. Yuil Shin contemplates not wanting to introduce himself to them, as they appear to be straight out of a Murim Manhua. Digak accuses him of daring to steal the Mount Hua sword technique and impersonating the Three Heroes Society. He vows to ensure that Yuil Shin never opens his mouth again in anger. He rushes to attack Yuil Shin, utilizing the demon subduing Arat Fist. Hu Ju observes the Shaolin secret technique known for its ability to destroy even buildings, marveling at the use of such a powerful skill from the start. Yuil Shin promptly employs the skill Share Ilho Steel Body, transforming into a muscular form. As Digak punches him, breaking his own arm bones, he cries out in pain, contemplating whether this is the legendary indestructible gold. He screams about his broken arm. Yuil Shin retorts to shut up, asserting that he was the one who attacked first. Meanwhile, Peng Mu Lin approaches from behind, attempting to attack him, accusing him of being a hypocrite. Hu Ju observes and realizes that it's the Habuk Peng clan's secret technique, considering the situation to be problematic. Yuil Shin comments on the opponent's prickly lightning skill, claiming knowledge of lightning skills as well. He then uses the skill Share Xiong Miri Lightning Strike. Peng Mu Lin thinks about what this is while he attacks him with that lightning strike. Yuil Shin ties Digak and Peng Mu Lin to a tree, and Hu Ju observes, becoming surprised. He acknowledges that even though they are not officially registered as hunters, their strengths exceed S class, thinking highly of their teacher. Yuil Shin reflects on how he nearly ended up killing them due to his inability to control his strength. He asks them to reveal the location of the Tri Faction's base. Digek reacts defiantly, calling him a thieving and cautioning him not to let his guard down just because he managed to win against them both. He warns that it won't be long before the best hunters of the Tri Faction come to kill him. Xiao Ming arrives and apologizes, saying sorry for arriving a bit late. They notice her and exclaim Miss Xiao Ming has come. She confirms her arrival and introduces Yuil Shin as the person who stole Mount Huasek's sword method. He retorts with a polite pardon, but she attacks them, stating that they have become useless now. Hu Ju observes her speed, noting that she moves so fast that she blinks, and they've already missed her move. The other S-Class hunters seem to be moving in slow motion in comparison. Xiao Ming approaches from behind and declares that the next one to be dealt with is the rat. However, Yu Il Shin quickly intervenes, urging her to run. Xiao Ming contemplates that he intends to block her attack using only his bare body, finding him as interesting as she thought. He attempts to attack her, but he can't catch up, and she remarks that he's too slow. He, in turn, thinks he lost her again, referring to her as that slippery punk, and looks around to see where she went this time. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin wonders if she managed to cut him, realizing it's not him. At that moment, Xiao Ming attacks Hu Ju, killing her, and he looks at her with sorrow. Hastily, he approaches, holds her, and checks her, realizing she's not breathing. 
He uses the healing ring finger of the god, prompting Xiao Ming to express surprise that he can also use healing skills. Attempting to heal her, he discovers that it doesn't work. She informs him that the rat is already dead. He receives a notification that absolute healing has failed, and the authority of a lower grade god can't save someone who is already dead. Such a feat would only be possible with the authority of a greater god. She explains that she was already dead from the moment she cut her. He reassures her that, for now, he's going to send her to Lilith, asking Hio Jio to wait a little longer as he promises to become a greater god and save her. She insists that he should leave Hio Jio alone and come play with her, asserting that weaklings like them deserve to die. He angrily shouts at her to shut up, and she notices him, commenting that he looks so scary and is just her type. He checks her details, identifying Lin Xiaoming as a 26-year-old female human blessed with the divine protection of the King of Hell, and completely psychopathic. He remarks that for crazy individuals who don't know how to communicate, he has learned that giving them a beating is the best answer. He activates Skillshare No. 1 Second Ultra Steel Body, challenging her to see how many hits she can take. She comments on finding him sexy and feeling tingly. As he walks towards her, he grabs her from the mouth. She questions whether they will get to the fight right away. He punches her away, and she thinks about his speed and power, realizing that if she hadn't blocked that with her sword, it would have been dangerous. She expresses relief that he decided to come to Korea. In anger, he questions how she dares to still giggle after killing his students, vowing not to let her die peacefully. Using lightning strike, he attacks her, but she manages to escape, noting that it's beyond her expectations but not enough to chase. Seeing blood coming out from her neck, she wonders if she got hit just now and finds it electrifying. She acknowledges that he's the first person to land a hit on her. He asserts that she is truly deranged and demands she stop with the nonsense, insisting that she tell him where the tri-faction's base is. She asks if he will let her go if she does while sitting on a branch of a tree. He dismisses her idea, stating that he'll send her off peacefully instead. She laughs and questions his belief that someone like him could send her off. She wonders if he thinks she was serious all along, clarifying that she was only playing with him because he looked like a lot of fun. But she's now tired of it. He runs again to attack her, but she disappears, leaving him frustrated. He reflects on how all the apostles he has faced so far were nothing like her. Suddenly, she reappears from behind, asking where he is looking. She initiates the Thousand Caddy Hammer attack and the Eight Diagrams Trap formation, activating her skill. However, he manages to thwart her trap, leaving her surprised at his strength. Examining the trap above his head, he questions what it is while she explains it's the Eight Diagrams Trap formation claiming that not even an SS class can escape it. Defying her, he activates the Good God, Evil God title combo. Perplexed, she questions what title combo he is referring to and quickly uses the condemning middle finger of the God, breaking her trap. She lands on the ground, expressing anger about her trap formation, while he thinks she's the only one hiding her true power and realizes she's in serious trouble now. Yuil Shin activates his condemning middle finger, creating holes in the floor as she attempts to escape. He questions why she doesn't stop running away like a little rat, asserting that she can't win against him. Xiao Ming responds that she likes a man like him and declares him the first. She suggests having more fun and activates the Asura Heaven Shattering Dance, preparing to attack him. He insists that the school shouldn't be affected this much and halts her attack as she tries to target the academy. He proudly declares himself the best. One of the students asks if the sun is up while she sits down in front of him. Placing his finger on her head, he instructs her to call him her Three Heroes Society boss. She replies that she's in love with him, addressing him as master. He expresses surprise and wonders why she's calling him that could it be. He then receives a notification congratulating him for demonstrating the overwhelming power and terror of a god, creating obsessive faith, and turning Xiao Ming into a fanatic follower. He contemplates that another strange person has become his fanatic follower. She, on the other hand, admires how strong he is, even without any weapon, wondering about his strength if he were to wield a sword. Another notification arrives, stating that Lin Xiao Ming is a follower of 5S classes and is completely in love with him. He considers ignoring the remark and reflects that if she's as strong as Gustav, it makes him feel a bit uneasy. He instructs her to take him to her boss, and she responds that she would love to. But as he can see, she's in no shape to get up. Utilizing God's healing ring finger, he heals her. Impressed, she expresses admiration for his amazing healing power, gets up, and declares that he's great, worthy of being her master. He directs her to take the lead, and the scene shifts to the Three Heroes Society headquarters at the Three Purities Temple. 
a man of religion conveys that Xiao Ming has betrayed them and is now on Yuil Xin's side, and he's coming after them. Meanwhile, the man of the sword mentions that Yuil Xin has divine powers. The man of the fist counters, stating that he's still just a low-class god and they can easily kill him along with Xiao Ming. A notification reveals that they are the three purities and the three supremes who have led the three heroes society for 500 years. Xiao Ming arrives and questions if they are looking for her, mentioning that there is someone looking for him too, so she brings him here herself. Yuil Xin also enters and asks if they are the heads of the three heroes society, or whatever it is called. He wonders what this is while receiving a notification that he can't read the targets because they are using detection hindering techniques. He thinks that this has never happened before, but it doesn't matter and he decides to beat them up to a pulp as he gets ready for the fight. After a while, the man of the sword senses that Yuil Shin is strong, expressing excitement about encountering someone so powerful on this planet. He finds Yuil Shin's power tempting and asks the man of religion if it's okay for him to eat Yuil Shin's heart. The man of religion permits it but emphasizes that the head belongs to him. The man of the fist rises from his place, approaches Yuil Shin, and announces that he will test him first. He runs to attack, using White Step's divine fist to punch Yuil Shin away. Observing this, Xiao Ming remarks that he went flying and addresses him as master, suggesting that he seems to hold a significant grudge against her. She comments on how today has been fun and expresses anticipation for her sword's happiness, noticing some soldiers approaching to attack her. Yuil Shin sits on the floor in bad condition while the man of the fist states that he went flying with just that, questioning if he overestimated him. He declares his intention to eat him up and moves closer to him. Meanwhile, Yuil Shin reflects on the recent encounter, wondering what that was just now. There was quite a distance between them, and he realizes that these guys are strong. Heavenly Demon informs him that it was the White Step's divine fist. Confused, he questions why it's so bright, noticing a bright light on his face. Heavenly Demon approaches, and he recognizes it, asking if it's a kitchen knife or, rather, Heavenly Demon. A message arrives from the Thousand Blade that cuts all, stating that the repair is complete, and Yuil Shin replies that the delivery fee is on the house. He holds Heavenly Demon, expressing appreciation for the nice timing but comments on it being just a kitchen knife. Another message arrives from the Thousand Blade that cuts all, cautioning him not to underestimate it just because it looks like a kitchen knife. Yuil Shin thinks that the repair services are always weird but decides to let it go for now since he's busy. He greets Heavenly Demon, saying it's nice to see him again. Heavenly Demon states that they'll deal with greetings later. Yuil Shin needs to stay alert as those guys are gods. Yuil Shin wonders if these guys are gods, and the Man of the Fist inquires if this evil energy is Heavenly Demon. Heavenly Demon confirms, calling them damn traitors and accusing them of being insects running away as soon as the God of Destruction appeared. The Man of the Fist laughs and justifies it as planning for the future in case of disasters, not running away. Yuil Shin realizes that these guys are scared of the God of Destruction and end up running to Earth. Heavenly Demon agrees, labeling them as the worst garbage to exist, as they killed all the people they ruled over. The Man of the Fist takes offense at being insulted while inside a kitchen knife. Heavenly Sword retorts that the God of Destruction will soon be there and questions if Yuil Shin will run away again when he shows up. He responds, stating that, of course, they have been teaching these useless insects and their martial arts for 500 years to increase their divine power. He mentions offering up millions of humans as sacrifices to them and asks how great that is. Yuil Shin is angered by the mention of humans being used as sacrifices, asserting that they are just cowards. He expresses his forgiveness, especially for Hyo Jio's death. The Man of the Fist questions how Yuil Shin dares to insult them as low-class gods. In response, he activates Skillshare Sword Demon and prepares to attack, activating the second form, Heavenly Demonic God. Heavenly Demon intervenes, advising against using that form. Yuil Shin asks why, and Heavenly Demon explains that he can't win against the Man of the Fist's White Steps Divine Fist with that form. He warns that if Yuil Shin is unlucky, the attack might come back at him instead. He suggests using his fist and thinking of what he wrote. Yuil Shin contemplates whether Heavenly Demon is referring to the quote, to tell the truth, his fists are stronger than his blade. He initially thought it was just some nonsense but decides to try it out to see how a fist stronger than a sword performs. He activates Skillshare Ilho Super Strong Body. The man of the fist questions who this guy is. He calls the unbreakable Vajra body and asserts that he will show him what the real thing is. He activates the Hundred Steps Divine Fist, rushing to attack Yuil Shin. However, Yuil Shin stands calmly, prompting the man of the fist to ask how a juvenile god like him dares to do so. 
Yuil Shin quickly counters by activating the Heavenly Demon Divine Sword, third form, and also initiates the Heavenly Demon Sky Shattering Fist. He punches the Man of the Fist, sending him flying. Yuil Shin identifies him as that Heavenly Demon. The Man of the Fist falls near the Man of the Sword and the Man of Religion, both of whom rise from their places. The Man of Religion commends Yuil Shin's impressive feat, while the Man of the Sword expresses disbelief that he managed to bring down the Man of the Fist. The man of religion laughs and anticipates that his dragon slayer spear will finally taste the blood of a god after a long time. Meanwhile, the man of the sword remarks that he never thought he would have to take out his divine justice celestial sword. Yuil Shin considers that with two more gods remaining, he believes he can win. However, he wonders what's going on, as there is no kill confirmed chat window popping up, and he is pretty sure that the man of the fist was not defeated yet. The man of the sword questions how long the man of the fist plans to play dead. Yuil Shin looks at him in surprise as the Man of the Fist starts laughing. He explains that he's just ashamed that a young god sent him flying with a single hit, and that the young god has perfectly inherited Heavenly Demon's martial arts. The Man of Religion suggests that all three of them should attack at once, and in return, he'll be the one to take that punk's head. He adds that it has been a while since he has eaten divine energy and proposes slaughtering him quickly. Yuil Shin considers facing three opponents at once a bit scary, but he has Heavenly Demon with him and he believes he'll be able to handle them somehow. However, Heavenly Demon advises him to run. Yuil Shin questions why he says this, and Heavenly Demon responds that he doesn't stand a chance against all three of them simultaneously, and they have absorbed a lot of sacrifices. He urges Yuil Shin to hurry and run. Yuil Shin insists that he can't do that and won't run like they did before. Heavenly Demon asks what he means, and Yuil Shin replies that he still has a few skills left, so please don't worry. The Man of the Fist addresses Yuil Shin as a young god while the three of them run towards him to attack. The Man of Religion questions Yuil Shin's mention of skills, asserting that he'll die anyway. He commands his dragon to slay, declaring to command the world. Yuil Shin thinks, here it comes and attacks him, saying to just slash for now. The Man of the Fist points out that Yuil Shin's side is wide open. He attacks Yuil Shin while using the devil-defeating palm of Buddha, throwing him away. Man of Sword also employs the Azure Sky Flying Swallow Sword for an attack, and Man of Religion declares that the head is Man of Fist. They all together launch an attack on him. In response, Yuil Shin activates his condemning middle finger of the god, creating a fiery sky for a counter-attack. They all witness the unexpected outcome of the attack. After countering them, he descends to the ground and thinks that he believes he has become quite powerful but it seems otherwise. Man of Religion also lands on the ground and acknowledges that he now understands why Man of Fist was defeated. He mentions that this is the first time someone has managed to unveil all three of their masks since they killed the intermediate god in their previous world. Yuil Shin asks what they are talking about. After a while, they all appear in front of him without their masks, and he receives a notification that they are the Fallen Fist God, Fallen Sword God, and Fallen Spear God. They used to be greater gods in a world called Nirvana, which was destroyed by the God of Destruction. And now they have regained their status as lower grade gods. He wonders if it's because their masks were broken and notes that the appraisal window is working now. Despite being lower grade gods like him, they used to be greater gods. Heavenly Demon reiterates that's why he told him to run. Man of Religion questions why he's spacing out, and Man of Fist attacks Yuil Shin, declaring him to die as a fledgling. Man of Religion again claims the head is his, and they all attack him. Yuil Shin falls unconscious to the floor, and they comment that it seems he's dead. Man of Fist suggests cutting him up. At this moment, he gets a notification that he has fulfilled the conditions to activate the authority he received from Soundless Nightmare, the Night Blooming Rose. They all witness a monstrous flower attacking them and express confusion about what it is. Man of Fist remains standing as the flower monster attacks him. Man of Sword warns him to move, and the flower monster also attacks him. He questions what the flower monster is, and Man of Sword remarks that Man of Fist let his guard down. Man of Sword expresses surprise, stating that this is more than he imagined. Man of Fist replies that he thought the summoner had only a few tricks, but they can summon monsters. Man of Sword explains that the power of the flower monster is at a divine level. He walks towards the flower monster and Man of Fist but notes that it will die as soon as they kill the summoner. Seeing that the flower monster is protecting Yuil Shin, Man of Sword tells Man of Fist and Man of Religion that he will kill Yuil Shin while they distract the monster. They all run to attack the flower monster. After some time, Yuil Shin opens his eyes as he sits on a chair. He wonders where he is and notices Ilho is badly injured. He receives a notification stating that Ilho has offered one 
who rolls in filthy sewage as a sacrifice, and this sacrifice is worth 11 S classes. Yu Il Shin is surprised that Ilho offered such a low class god. Another notification appears, providing information about the quest progress. Normal sacrifices reaching 231,289,003 divided by 10 billion. And S class possessing transcendence potential sacrifices reaching 34 divided by 100. He commends Ilho for overcoming another trial and offering another sacrifice. Yu Il Shin decides to heal Ilho using God's healing ring finger. The fairy queen becomes emotional and pleads for Yu Il Shin to save Papa Papa quickly. Perplexed, Yu Il Shin asks who Papa Papa is. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin checks her details and finds that she is the Fairy Queen, an incarnation of the Good God, a winged guardian of the world possessing transcendental power. Ilho saved her from the brink of death. Observing Ilho's deteriorating condition, Yu Il Shin realizes that something serious has happened and decides to hurry. He uses God's healing ring finger promptly to heal Ilho, who becomes elated, attributing it to Yu Il Shin's miracle. Yu Il Shin entrusts Ilho to the Fairy Queen and receives a notification emphasizing that naming her might result in a miracle. Realizing that he almost forgot about this crucial aspect, Yu Il Shin is determined not to lose the opportunity for a miracle. He asks the Fairy Queen if it's acceptable to give her a name. She responds positively, and Yu Il Shin decides to name her Anna, opting for a character he created in his novel long ago since he can't think of anything else at the moment. She becomes overjoyed and exclaims Anna, as Yu Il Shin receives a notification congratulating him on naming the Fairy Queen, establishing her faith. The Fairy Queen is now a follower worth 10 S classes. Yu Il Shin contemplates whether this is a miracle, feeling an incredible surge of energy. Realizing that he was fighting the three purities until now, the individuals responsible for killing Hyo Jio and consuming millions of sacrifices, he knows he needs to hurry back. Waking up in a flower monster, Yu Il Shin asks if he is back. He notices Man of Sword rushing towards him, ready to attack, but the flower monster intervenes and halts the attack. Yu Il Shin reflects on the significance of the monstrous plant. The monster flower grows larger, puzzling everyone present. Yu Il Shin receives a message from Soundless Nightmare, conveying regret that he shouldn't wake up just yet. He reassures them, stating that he's now stronger thanks to the time he spent sleeping, and expresses gratitude for their protection. Shyly, she blushes in response. Man of Sword comments on the disappearance of the annoying evil god's incarnation, while Man of Fist criticizes Yu Il Shin for thinking he can defeat them alone. Suddenly, Man of Religion attacks him from behind, claiming his head. To everyone's surprise, Yu Il Shin effortlessly stops the attack using Heavenly Demon prompting questions about his sudden increase in strength. Acknowledging the change, Man of Sword notes that Yu Il Shin has become stronger all of a sudden. Man of Fist speculates that he must have consumed more sacrifices while in hiding. Yu Il Shin activates the skill the Multiplying Thumb of God, and his inner self appears, accompanied by a notification stating that the skill's duration is 6666 seconds. Yu Il Shin greets inner self, saying it's been a long time. In response, Inner Self insults him, calling him a weak ass and expressing frustration at being called there again. Yu Il Shin thinks about the situation and decides to be the bigger person, asking if he could take on just one of them. Inner Self dismissively remarks that Yu Il Shin is stupid and weak, adding that he's also ugly. Frustrated, Yu Il Shin can't hold it in any longer, but Inner Self acknowledges that he's a bit better than before, though still just a low-class god. Confused, Yu Il Shin wonders if Inner Self is playing hard to get. As Inner Self moves his hand forward, Yu Il Shin thinks it might be a handshake of apology. He puts his hand to Inner Self's hand, suggesting they fight. Inner Self asks if he wants to die, and Yu Il Shin reveals Heavenly Demon, explaining that he meant for Inner Self to fight. Inner Self takes Heavenly Demon and expresses that he can see the guy he should take on, with Yu Il Shin mentioning that he's the weakest one. Yu Il Shin activates Ilho, the super strong body, and Inner Self activates the title Cruel Slaughter. Man of the Fist expresses annoyance at first summoning and is now a clone of Yu Il Shin. Man of Sword notes that there are two of them against three of the purities and suggests they eat him up. Man of Religion mentions that nothing has made him feel this way since the Great Sage, Heaven's Equal. Yu Il Shin and Inner Self prepare to fight as the three purities run to attack. Inner Self comments on the parasites, stating they don't even know their place. Yu Il Shin adds that they are cowardly who ran away from their own world. Man of Fist reacts with disbelief, asking how he dare do that, while Man of Sword calls him arrogant. Man of Religion, angered, calls Yu Il Shin an arrogant little god, claiming he'll cut off his head and instructs him to cry out, slay the dragon, 
and command the world as he attempts to attack, intending to rip him to pieces. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin entrusts the task to the inner self, and he charges to attack the man of religion. Man of religion responds by claiming that a clone won't be a match for him. He retorts that he should stop ordering him around, prompting the question from man of religion of when the inner self arrived. Without warning, he attacks and cuts man of religion into two pieces. Man of religion laughs as fire erupts from his body, asserting that he is the incarnation of the red flames and that a sword cannot slay fire. Remaining composed, Yu Il Shin remarks that he'll eliminate him first while observing the inner self. To his surprise, Yu Il Shin becomes shocked. Yu Il Shin comments that, as expected of his clone, inner self executes a water attack on man of religion with the heavenly demon. Man of Religion exclaims in disbelief, questioning how this is possible, and expressing doubt about his ability to heal. He wonders if the sword is responsible, to which the Heavenly Demon clarifies that it is no ordinary sword but the sword of the Heavenly Demon. Inner Self wields the Heavenly Demon God Sword in its second form, executing the Heavenly Demon Great Inferno, and he effortlessly vanquishes a flame larger than he has ever encountered. Acknowledging that his demise was brought about by the Heavenly Demon's sword, Man of Religion remarks on the intriguing nature of his final moments. Yu Il Shin receives a congratulatory message, celebrating the fact that Man of Religion is a potent offering worth 20 S classes. Additionally, a notification regarding the quest for the Intermediate Evil God promotion in progress informs him that the S class possessing Transcendence potential sacrifices now total 58 out of 100. As Man of Sword comments on Man of Religion acting independently again, Xiao Ming hurls a soldier aside and arrives at the scene. Excitedly recognizing the two incarnations of her gods, she expresses her enthusiasm, deeming them too hot. She pledges to exert her utmost effort to earn their admiration and eagerly resumes fighting alongside the soldiers. Inner Self observes the situation, remarking on the presence of two incarnations of themselves. Yu Il Shin, acknowledging the worth of 20 S classes resulting from Man of Religion's demise, expresses satisfaction. Man of Sword conveys that they have underestimated him, emphasizing that a god is still a god. He suggests to Man of the Fist that they utilize a particular technique despite acknowledging its potential harm to themselves. Standing in line, they perform a magical ritual, with Man of Sword leveraging the power of Man of the Fist to rend Yu Il Shin apart in mourning for Man of Religion. Witnessing this powerful display, Xiao Ming reflects on the strength exhibited, pondering whether even her god might struggle against it. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin employs a magical maneuver, summoning petals and instructing them to retreat. As Man of Sword observes the technique, he questions if it could be the Plum Blossom Sword technique while the petals assail them. Man of Fist reacts strongly, accusing Yu Il Shin of thievery for employing a technique he supposedly stole. Undeterred, Man of Sword attempts to counter the petals, dismissing their significance. In the midst of the battle, Yu Il Shin and Inner Self both charge towards Man of Sword. With swift movements, Inner Self dismembers him, employing the heavenly demonic god Sword's second form. Simultaneously, Yu Il Shin activates the Skillshare Xiong Miri Lightning Strike, inflicting further damage. Man of Sword, bewildered by the unfamiliar skill, begins to bleed. Witnessing Man of Sword's plight, Man of Fist calls out for help. Yu Il Shin, approaching him, expresses regret but cites Heavenly Demon's directive to not spare their opponent. He activates the Heavenly Demonic God Sword third form, coupling it with the Heavenly Demon Heaven Shattering Fist. Striking Man of Fist, he propels him into the air. A notification arrives, congratulating Yu Il Shin for the successful defeat of the Fallen Man of the Fist and the Man of the Sword, acknowledging them as potent offerings worth 21 S classes each. Another notification outlines the progress of a quest, revealing that the S class possessing Transcendence potential sacrifices have reached 100 out of 100. After some time, he is notified of completing the Intermediate Evil God quest prompting him to acknowledge the positive aspect of growing stronger. A message from Bountiful Abundance expresses concern about him leaning too heavily into the evil god's side, while the thousand blade that cuts all encourages him to persist on this path. Inner Self, having returned, efficiently eliminates all the remaining soldiers. Xiao Ming observes his actions, impressed by how he effortlessly dispatched the two strongest members of the Three Heroes Society with a single stroke of the sword, just as expected from her god. Inner Self instructs her to dispose of the remaining minions and persuade the S-Class hunters to join their cause. He emphasizes dealing with those who resist, and once this is accomplished, it will be for the best. Xiao Ming complies, assuring him that she will make it happen as he departs. Yu Il Shin questions what transpired between them, to which Inner Self dismisses it as nothing significant. He shares that Heavenly Demon advised him not to die, 
emphasizing that if he were to perish, his inner self would meet the same fate. The directive is clear, becomes stronger. Yuil Shin asserts that he was planning to do so even without being told. A notification informs him that the clone's duration time of 6666 seconds is over, and the summon is being cancelled, causing the clone to disappear. Yuil Shin approaches Xiao Ming and informs her that there is somewhere they need to go. The scene shifts to the Chinese General Hospital, where Hu Ju's mother is admitted. She expresses disbelief that her daughter's homeroom teacher would come all the way to visit. She gets up and thanks him for paying her hospital bills. Yuil Shin responds, Don't mention it, just focus on getting better. Meanwhile, he reflects on the surprising fact that he's able to speak Chinese now after becoming an intermediate evil god. He acknowledges that despite being an evil god, he is still an intermediate one, so it's probably something natural. Hu Ju's mother questions the presence of another person and wonders why that person is there. Observing Xiao Ming sitting on her knees, she asks if that position is comfortable for her. Xiao Ming confirms, stating that it is very comfy for her. Yuil Shin reflects that he ordered her to do that and believes that a psycho who isn't able to feel guilt should at least apologize in that manner. Meanwhile, Hu Ju's mother asks to inquire about something, to which he responds affirmatively. She then inquires about her daughter, expressing hope that Hu Ju is doing well in school. She mentions that Hu Ju is an exceptionally good child and notes that he hasn't been in touch lately, assuming he is busy with his studies. He agrees with her observations, inwardly acknowledging that he had no choice but to answer in that manner. However, he reflects that the truth is he should be apologizing to Hu Ju's mother. He considers the fact that he was the one who couldn't protect Hu Ju, the one who killed him, and questions what kind of good god can't even protect one person. Reflecting on his own nature, he thinks that being a good god doesn't suit him, and he wonders what kind of good god he is. In contrast, he believes that being an evil god really does fit him. He receives a message from Endlessly Granting Abundance, quickly suggesting a resurrection elixir quest and advising him not to abandon the title of a good god. Reflecting on the idea of a resurrection elixir, he hesitates but refrains from expressing his thoughts. Although aware that pursuing this quest would significantly impact his own causality, she reassures him that she's willing to assist in keeping him on the path of being a good god. He then receives another notification about a quest stating that the entire universe will become beautiful once he accumulates 10 million good karma. The reward for completing this quest is a resurrection elixir. The quest emphasizes the effect that it can resurrect the dead. Currently, his karma value stands at 0 out of 10 million, with a caution to prioritize saving lives. Contemplating the potential of resurrecting the dead and saving Hu Ju with this quest, he is overwhelmed by the daunting task of accumulating 10 million karma. However, he realizes that he is in a hospital, a suitable place to begin saving lives for the purpose of accumulating good karma. Looking at the patients around him, he resolves to start with this hospital and utilizes the healing ring finger of God to heal people repeatedly. The scene shifts to Jinan City, Shandong Province, China, where news broadcasts announce the appearance of a class monsters, urging hunters to arrive soon and advising all citizens to evacuate to a safe place. Panic ensues as people run for their lives, crying for help. Yuil Shin arrives and confronts one of the monsters, delivering a powerful punch that results in its demise. He announces that there are two more left and proceeds to eliminate them as well. Onlookers notice his actions, with one individual questioning the identity of the mysterious hunter. Simultaneously, another observer recognizes Xiao Ming, expressing surprise at the presence of the SS-class hunter. Yuil Shin receives a notification indicating a karma value of 2,501 out of 10 million, acknowledging that there is still a long way to go. Witnessing his actions, a person bows down in front of him and addresses him as Lord Yuil Shin. In response, he inquires about the person's purpose, and she explains that she is leaving to handle the remnants of the tri-factions, as instructed by the other lord, Yuil Shin. He reflects on the fact that the clone punk gave such an order, expressing approval, and instructs her to proceed. She agrees and requests him to take care of himself before departing. The scene shifts a few days later to Yuil Shin's apartment building in Korea. He sits in his room, reflecting that it has been a while since he had a break. Even after returning to Korea, he had been busy visiting hospitals. Seong Miri, who is folding clothes, comments that the top floor is much more spacious and congratulates him on becoming a landlord. Yuil Shin chuckles, thinking that the landlord sounds much better than Mr. Shin. He asks her, by the way, what is that when he sees tracksuits in her hand? 
she says it's a present for the teacher. While she and her sister were shopping, they thought it was pretty, so they bought it. She mentions that teachers need a lot of tracksuits, and Seong Mina agrees, saying that's right, so they bought 10 pairs of them. She tells him to hurry up and try them out, thinking they're going to fit him well. He says, well, they do say real men wear pink. Meanwhile, Seong Miri is requesting an emergency call from the association while glancing at her phone. She rises, prepares to leave, and informs the teacher that she will be heading out first. She adds, please look after her older sister for now. The teacher agrees and wishes her good luck. Seong Mina advises him to wear a particular outfit going forward, and as he tries on the tracksuit, he inquires if he can ask her something. She responds by asking what it is, and he questions why she is still pretending not to have regained her memories. Shocked, she asks how he found out. While he checks her details, he discovers that she has indeed recovered her memories, but is pretending otherwise to maintain her current relationship with her sister. She then asks when he knew. He responds that it's been a while and wonders if it's because she wants to remain close to Miss Seong Miri. She confirms, stating that's the reason, and warns him that she'll kill him if he ever tells Seong Miri. Given the situation, she suggests he might as well hear it from her directly. He marvels at the speed with which she can change her personality. She explains that she needs him to guard someone. He inquires if she wants him to guard someone. And she responds that recently, creation hunters have been disappearing worldwide for unknown reasons. She emphasizes that this matter is being kept a secret. He expresses concern, stating that the disappearance of creation hunters is a serious problem. She explains that Kang Wu, a creation hunter, has requested him to be his bodyguard through the association. He reflects that it makes sense for a creation hunter like Kang Wu, whose basic ability allows him to open a hunter shop to obtain good equipment, but it comes at the cost of having lower combat power. He comments that since creation hunters originally possess low combat powers, he must have already been guarded by an S-class hunter. She explains that two S-class level bodyguards of an American creation hunter were killed, and the creation hunter has disappeared. Additionally, three bodyguards of an Italian creation hunter were torn in half, and that creation hunter has also gone missing. He expresses concern, wondering who the association is looking for as another bodyguard. She reveals that the association is actively seeking an S-class or higher bodyguard, and Go Sadyuk, the principal, Shin Yu, Seong Miri, and herself have recommended him. He acknowledges that if a valuable creation hunter, handled at a national level, might go missing, he will take on the task. He thinks it's also an opportunity to accumulate karma points and believes it might be somewhat related to the story. He recalls Eternal Seeker of Truth's words about overcoming trials, preventing his fate of destruction, obtaining the divine of an intermediate god, and being eligible to join the Festival of Gods. He wonders what the Festival of Gods is and acknowledges that he has to become an intermediate good god before finding out. He receives a message from Endlessly Granting Abundance, stating that's how it is, and she encourages him to gather good karma daily. He inquires about Hunter Kang Wu's whereabouts and suggests going to him immediately. The scene shifts to Hunter Kang Wu's penthouse, and Yu Il Shin and Sword Demon arrive. Yu Il Shin checks Kang Wu's details, noting his name is Kang Wu, a male human in use for 52 years and under the protection of the Guardian of Fire and Blacksmithing. He thinks Kang Wu is quite old for someone in his 50 seconds and wonders about the question marks. Kang Wu asks his guard why Yu Il Shin isn't coming alone. Yu Il Shin explains that since he's unable to guard him 24 7, he brings someone who can relieve him. Introducing Sword Demon, Kang Wu takes a sip of his drink, agrees, and acknowledges that even bodyguards need to sleep. He expresses that he'll be in their care. Meanwhile, he affirms and states that they will do their best to keep him safe. He reflects on how easygoing it is to be drinking in the middle of the day, and wonders if he is aware that creation hunters are disappearing worldwide. Kang Wu places his glass on the table and leaves, mentioning that he needs to use the bathroom first before they continue talking. Sword Demon comments on how daring it is to go to the bathroom right in the middle of a conversation with the Sword God, suggesting that he should handle it. Yu Il Shin tells him to shut his mouth. Kang Wu goes to the bathroom, looks in the mirror, and thinks about the variable finally appearing. He realizes he has no memory of this person from the past. As he sees someone behind him, he wonders what it is. A crocodile monster appears and declares, there he is, creation hunter. Kang Wu activates the summoning of his shield of Aegis as the crocodile monster attempts to attack him, remarking that a shield like that is no problem for him. Yu Il Shin observes the crocodile monster, and Kang Wu pushes him away. Yu Il Shin questions why there is a crocodile in the bathroom and tosses it aside. He then asks Kang Wu if he is hurt anywhere. 
Kang Wu responds that he's okay but mentions that the equipment can only be bought in the hunter shop. He wonders how a monster could have such equipment and notices Kang Wu's sword. The crocodile monster addresses Yu Il Shin, claiming that he is his mother's murderer. Yu Il Shin asks if he is perhaps Crocky's sibling, recalling a baby crocodile who once threatened to kill him. The crocodile monster asserts that he will kill and devour him to his very bones. Yu Il Shin calmly responds, saying it's really scary, while the crocodile runs towards him, declaring that he will avenge his mother and demanding he die. He responds that he can take on the crocodile monster, while Sword Demon intervenes between them, stating to leave it to him, the Sword God. He asserts that he will show the crocodile how much stronger he has become since the last encounter. He acknowledges the statement and wonders about Sword Demon's growth. In anger, the crocodile monster declares that he'll kill Sword Demon, too, and launches an attack. Sword Demon counterattacks and the crocodile monster remarks on Sword Demon's speed, calling him a little rat who is fast at running away, but still nothing more than a mere human. The crocodile monster continues the assault, but Sword Demon manages to evade the attacks. The monster comments that he wants to see how long Sword Demon can run from him. Kang Wu and Yu Il Shin hide behind the shield, and Kang Wu whispers to Yu Il Shin, questioning if he is sure he can handle it on his own. Yu Il Shin confirms and admits he might be a bit weak but believes he can manage. He reflects on his improvement and expresses frustration that he can't land a hit on the crocodile. After a while, Sword Demon approaches from behind and attempts to attack the crocodile's face, but he is unable to do so. Sword Demon expresses disappointment, mentioning that he could have chopped the crocodile's face in two if it weren't for his helmet. Yuil Shin, feeling bored, urges Sword Demon to hurry up while yawning. Kang Wu, observing the situation, wonders how Yuil Shin can yawn in such a critical moment. Moreover, he finds it surprising that Yuil Shin is instructing Sword Demon to finish off a monster that appears to be of SS class. Sword Demon agrees, and the crocodile monster, feeling cornered, decides to run and launch another attack. Kang Wu questions the sudden change in the crocodile's behavior, while Yuil Shin asks if he has a thorn in his throat. He notices a bottle in the crocodile monster's hand. The crocodile monster declares that they should all die together. Kang Wu reacts with shock, realizing it's a magic bomb. He shouts for everyone to run, warning that the entire hotel is going to be blown away. The crocodile monster declares that it's too late and presses the button of the bomb, stating it's revenge for his mother. However, Yuil Shin quickly cuts his hand and retrieves the magic bomb. The crocodile monster expresses confusion, questioning what just happened, as Yuil Shin seemingly kills him in one hit. Kang Wu remarks on how Yuil Shin defeated an SS class with a single attack. Sword Demon acknowledges Yu Il Shin as the Sword God, bowing down in front of him and congratulating him on defeating the monster in just one attack. Yu Il Shin downplays his achievement, stating that he only beat a mere lizard. He recalls a moment when Li Ji mentioned bringing this particular crocodile back from Africa. Out of a hundred, this was the only unhitched one, and they are currently tracking down the rest of them. Yu Il Shin realizes there are about a hundred of these creatures, and it will be dangerous if he doesn't do anything about them. Kang Wu asks Yu Il Shin what he is, and as Yu Il Shin walks towards him, Kang Wu appears scared. Yu Il Shin wonders if Kang Wu's fear is due to him killing the crocodile and realizes he can now understand the earlier question marks. Meanwhile, Yu Il Shin responds, stating that he would like to ask Kang Wu what he is. Annoyed, Kang Wu asks what he is talking about. Yu Il Shin clarifies that he is a regressor from the future. Shocked, Kang Wu inquires about how he knows this. Yu Il Shin then checks his details again noting that he is blessed by the Guardian of Fire and Blacksmiths and has regressed. He activates the exclusive authority of Blind God's Eye, scanning through creation hunter Kang Wu's history. The scene transitions deep inside the Amazon jungle, where a cave houses numerous crocodile monsters alongside Iraq. She contemplates that mentioning the word revenge easily summons them, possibly because they are Gustav's offspring. Iraq orders her slaves to open the hunter shop, and one complies, revealing various items. As she peruses the selection, she comes across a Celtic myth hero spear of Ku Chulain priced at 5 million gold. She inquires about the weapon's suitability, addressing someone as Sir Alpha. However, there is no immediate response, prompting her to call again. Eventually, he discloses that his brother has died, expressing deep resentment towards Yu Il Shin for killing his mother and now his brother. Vowing never to forgive him, he tells Arak that they will need more weapons to exact revenge. She assures him she will provide as many weapons as needed and hints at having an excellent plan. When questioned about the plan, she reveals that she knows Yu Il Shin's Achilles heel. 
the scene transitions to Yuil Shin and Kang Wu, where Yuil Shin inquires about Kang Wu's identity, specifically questioning if he is a regressor from the future. Kang Wu is surprised and asks how Yuil Shin knew that. Yuil Shin activates the exclusive authority of Blind God's Eye, scanning through creator Hunter Kang Wu's history. The story delves into a flashback, revealing Kang Wu crafting a sword. In his first life, he receives the grace of the Guardian of Fire and Blacksmithing, who informs him that his world is on the brink of destruction due to the impending arrival of the God of Destruction. The Guardian lends him his power, urging Kang Wu to go and try to stop it despite the daunting challenge. Aware of the difficulty, Kang Wu is bestowed with the ability to open the Hunter Shop and the power of changing fate regression. He teams up with S-Class Hunters to defend Earth, beginning with facing Johan and Gustav. He explains that initially, it appeared they were successful in safeguarding the world. However, they eventually faced grim deaths at the hands of the Tri-Factions. In the second and third cycles of his regression, he managed to overcome various challenges, but he still couldn't prevent Earth's destruction caused by the second coming of the Abyssal Dragon. Upon opening his eyes in his fourth regression cycle, the changing fate was successful, with zero turns remaining. Seated, he takes a sip and somberly admits that he couldn't prevent the catastrophe, regardless of his efforts. He contemplates accepting the world's impending destruction. The narrative returns to the present, where Yu Il Shin reflects on the fact that Kang Wu has already experienced everything even before awakening. He realizes that Kang Wu has undergone multiple regressions in an attempt to save the world, only to eventually surrender to the inevitable. He inquires about how Kang Wu knew that, and Kang Wu responds that he possesses an appraisal skill. Recognizing Kang Wu as the individual who hadn't appeared in any of his previous regressions, he acknowledges Kang Wu's significant role in thwarting Johan's evil god, defeating Gustav, and bringing about the collapse of the Tri-Factions. The divine aura Kang Wu emanates feels reminiscent of the encounter with the Guardian of Fire and Blacksmithing, leaving him convinced that Kang Wu can accomplish what he couldn't. He directly questions Kang Wu if he is a god, to which Kang Wu expresses surprise. Simultaneously, a notification appears regarding a believer's quest, instructing him to fulfill Kang Wu's wish and showcase the grandeur of God's omnipotence. The quest's reward is Kang Wu's faith, and he readily accepts it, acknowledging the value of the faith of an S-Class creation hunter. Curious, he asks Kang Wu if there is anything specific he wishes for or desires. He inquires about how Kang Wu fulfilled that wish, becoming emotional and expressing expressing his sole desire to prevent the destruction of the world. Kang Wu asks if he will heed this wish. Yuil Shin considers it something he must do regardless, even without the wish, thinking it could potentially serve two purposes. He agrees to give it a try, though uncertain of the outcome. Kang Wu, increasingly emotional, declares him a true god. A notification appears, indicating that Kang Wu has become his temporary believer, valued at 10S class believers. Yuil Shin contemplates the significance of having 10S class believers and ponders the meaning behind temporary believers. He receives another notification, stating that once he fulfills Kang Wu's wish to prevent the destruction of the world, he will gain Kang Wu's true faith, and as a temporary believer, his value is halved. A quest notification appears, indicating that the intermediate god promotion is in progress, with S-class believers with the potential for transcendence reaching 43 divided by 100. He considers it a pity but acknowledges that he can't force the situation. For now, he must address the current circumstances. He mentions having already dealt with the evil god Johan, Gustav, and the Tri-Factions. The next threat to Earth is Gustav's children, Alpha and his horde. Suddenly, a warning message arrives, alerting him that a great evil god is gearing up for revenge. If he doesn't stop it, the world will face destruction. He considers the possibility that the great evil god mentioned could be the Imperial Emperor rather than the crocodile spawns based on Kang Wu's history. Yuil Shin requests Kang Wu to locate the crocodile spawns, as he has another matter to attend to. Kang Wu agrees and salutes him, and Yu Il Shin suggests he should treat him comfortably since he's older. Kang Wu rejects the idea, emphasizing that he's Yu Il Shin's last hope. Yu Il Shin exhales, grateful he didn't become a fanatic and focuses on increasing the number of his S-Class believers. As he walks away, he compliments Sword Demon on his improved skills. Sword Demon expresses gratitude as Yu Il Shin hands him Heavenly Demon, acknowledging it as a precious sword. 
Sword Demon feels honored and kneels, expressing gratitude for the opportunity to wield such a valuable weapon. Yuil Shin thinks he's watched too many historical shows. Addressing Heavenly Demon, he mentions leaving him to it. Yuil Shin then states that it's about time someone arrives as he looks towards the door. Sword Demon asks for clarification, questioning who Yuil Shin is talking about. Shin Yu enters the room, and Yuil Shin acknowledges his arrival. Yu Shin Yu announces his arrival, addressing Sword God. Cheerfully, he acknowledges Sword Demon's presence and asks why he's there. Yuil Shin explains that he called Shin Yu over, stating that the two of them will serve as Kang Wu's bodyguards. Shin Yu extends his hand to Sword Demon, suggesting they work together. However, Sword Demon declines the handshake, expressing that he prefers handling the job alone and sees no need for Sword Yu's presence. Yuil Shin urges Sword Demon to reconsider, noting that a young master like Shin Yu could be helpful. This dismissal angers Shin Yu, and he retorts by mentioning how Sword God once abandoned him and emphasizes that he might have died without Sword God's assistance. He responds alright, let's settle it now. The outcome will be different from before, and the two of them almost come to blows. Yu Il Shin questions if they are implying they won't listen to him, suggesting a two versus one fight immediately. Both of them seem frightened, bow down in front of him, and apologize. Yu Il Shin declares that henceforth, fighting among comrades is prohibited in his presence. He warns that if they fight again, he will revoke the items he granted them. They both respond with a clear and loud understanding. The scene shifts to the 41st level of the Tower of Warriors. Ilho encounters a giant monster and effortlessly defeats it with a single strike. Pleased with his victory, he claps and decides to offer the monster as a sacrifice to Lord Yu Il Shin. A notification appears, congratulating him on successfully clearing the trial of the 41st level. As a reward, he is granted a dumbbell sword previously owned by the Truth Seeker of Eternity. Confused by the term dumbbell sword, a sword materializes in front of him, and he takes hold of it. Another message informs him that the trial of the 42nd level will soon begin. Perplexed, he looks around and receives a notification detailing the clearing condition for the Tower of Warriors 42nd level trial of time and space to save the Goddess of Water, who has declined due to the sun. The scene shifts to Yu Il Shin's apartment building in Korea. He lies in his bed, closing his eyes, preparing to train with the stalkers inside his dreams. He urges himself to sleep, anticipating the upcoming training session. Suddenly, his phone rings, disrupting his plans. Frustrated, he gets up and wonders who could be disturbing him during his crucial training time. As he checks his phone, he is shocked to find an urgent request for help from Number One. Surprised by Number One's sudden plea, he reflects on the situation and notices a girl beside him. He checks her details, discovering that her name is Water Dancer, a female who has been in use for an unspecified number of years and serves as an apostle of the declined goddess of water. Meanwhile, he contemplates the presence of an apostle of the goddess of water and questions why he has a child with him. He directs his inquiry to Number One, seeking an explanation for the current situation. Number One points towards the sun, expressing his uncertainty about how to defeat it, as his attacks have proven ineffective. The young girl pleads for help, addressing him as a great god and urging him to vanquish the evil sun to save their world, now transformed into a desert. Perplexed by their request, he gazes at the sun, realizing he needs more information. He examines the sun's details, learning that it belongs to Antria, has no assigned gender, and has been in use for four billion years. However, he is unable to retrieve further details and receives a notification stating his current power is insufficient for appraisal. Frustrated, he exclaims that he cannot appraise it and begins to ponder if this might be the warning mentioned in the earlier message, suggesting the sun's strength surpasses his own and possibly reaches the level of an intermediate god. Contemplating the mention of a sun, he recalls a certain individual. As Water Dancer alerts him to an approaching threat, Ilho instructs her to position herself behind him. Yu Il Shin also notices the impending danger and examines the details of the phoenixes, realizing they are divine beasts of the flame shining in the highest sky, classified as SS class. Reflecting on a previous encounter with a fireball that hinted at having a brother, he recognizes this as their reunion. A new notification provides additional information, revealing the intention to sacrifice number one. Disturbed by the prospect of Number One becoming a sacrifice, he acknowledges that Number One is currently not formidable enough to contend with the Phoenixes. Despite recognizing the rule against interference within the Tower of Warriors, he grapples with the imminent danger Number One faces. He attempts to utilize God's crushing index finger while receiving warning notifications. If he ignores the principle of causality, an equivalent penalty will be imposed on him. 
he shouts that he doesn't give a damn about causality and such, emphasizing that if he doesn't do this, number one is going to die. He then employs the crushing index finger of God and incinerates the phoenixes while Ilho prepares to engage in combat with them and witnesses their demise. He states that this is Lord Yuil Shin's divine power. A message informs him about the flame shining in the highest sky, and he realizes he is now connected through the principle of causality. Although he thinks it's still too early, he acknowledges that it can't be helped. Subsequently, he receives another notification stating that he will now be forcibly transported to the flame shining in the highest sky. The scene shifts to the Temple of Fire, where Yu Il Shin observes someone and contemplates a bird head. He inquires if the person is the flame shining in the highest sky. The individual responds affirmatively, identifying himself as the fearless young god who dared to kill his brother, apostles, and even his divine beasts. However, he expresses gratitude, stating that thanks to Yu Il Shin, he's unable to exact revenge. Yu Il Shin reflects that this event didn't occur when he examined Kang Wu's history. It seems something got distorted because of him, but since it's already here, he acknowledges the necessity to fight and eliminate it. The flame shining in the highest sky declares that he will be generous. Yu Il Shin queries what he would be generous for, to which he responds by proposing an offer. He suggests sacrificing number one to him and giving half of his divine power. In return, the flame shining in the highest sky promises forgiveness and offers to take him under his wing, transforming him into a greater god. Annoyed, Yu Il Shin asks for clarification on what he just said. 